Three Fates by Nora Roberts To Dan and Stacy, may the tapestry of your lives be woven with rosy threads of love, the deep reds of passion, the quiet blues of understanding and contentment, and the bright, bright silver of humor. Part 1. Spinning Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Sir Walter Scott 1. May 7, 1915 Happily unaware he'd be dead in 23 minutes, Henry W. Wiley imagined pinching the nicely rounded rump of the young blonde who was directly in his line of sight. It was a perfectly harmless fantasy that did nothing to distress the blonde or Henry's wife and put Henry himself in the best of moods. With a lap robe tucked around his pudgy knees and a plump belly well satisfied by a late and luxurious lunch, he sat in the bracing sea air with his wife, sea air with his wife Edith, whose bomb, bless her, was flat as a pancake, enjoying the blonde's derriere along with a fine cup of Earl Grey. Henry, a portly man with a robust laugh and an eye for the ladies, didn't bother to stir himself to join other passengers at the rail for a glimpse of Ireland's shimmering coast. He'd seen it before and assumed he'd have plenty of opportunities to see opportunities to see it again if he cared to, though what fascinated people about cliffs and grass eluded him. Henry was an avowed urbanite who preferred the solidity of steel and concrete, and at this particular moment he was much more interested in the dainty chocolate cookies served with the tea than with the vista, particularly when the blonde moved on. Though Edith fussed at him not to make a pig of himself, he gobbled up three cookies with cheerful relish. Edith, being Edith, refrained. It was a pity she denied herself that small pleasure in the last moments of her life, but she would die as she'd lived, worrying about her husband's extra tonnage and brushing at the crumbs that scattered carelessly on his shirt front. Henry, however, was a man who believed in indulgence. What, after all, was the point of being rich if you didn't treat yourself to the finer things? He'd been poor, and he'd been hungry. Rich and well-fed was better. He'd never been handsome, but when a man had money, he was called substantial rather than fat, interesting rather than homely. Henry appreciated the absurdity of the distinction. At just before three in the afternoon on that sparkling May day, the wind blew at his odd little coal-colored toupee, whipped high, happy color into his pudgy cheeks. He had a gold watch in his pocket, a ruby pin in his tie. His Edith, scrawny as a chicken, was decked out in the best of Parisian couture. He was worth nearly three million. Not as much as Alfred Vanderbilt, who was crossing the Atlantic as well, but enough to content Henry. Enough, he thought with pride as he considered a fourth cookie to pay for first-class accommodations on this floating palace. Enough to see that his children had received first-class educations and that his grandchildren would as well. He imagined first class was more important to him than it was to Vanderbilt. After all, Alfred had never had to make do with second. He listened with half an ear as his wife chattered on about plans once they reached England. Yes, they would pay calls and receive them. He would not spend all of his time with associates or hunting up stock for his business. He assured her of all this with his usual amiability, and because after nearly forty years of marriage he was deeply fond of his wife, he would see that she was well entertained during their stay abroad. But he had plans of his own, and that driving force had been the single purpose of this spring crossing. If his information was correct, he would soon acquire the second fate. The small silver statue was a personal quest, one he'd pursued since he'd chanced to purchase the first of the reputed three. He had a line on the third as well, and would tug on it as soon as the second statue was in his possession. When he had the complete set, well, that would be first class indeed. Wily antiques would be second to none. Personal and professional satisfaction, he mused, all because of three small silver ladies, worth a pretty penny separately, worth beyond imagining together. Perhaps he'd loan them to the Met for a time. Yes, he liked the idea. The Three Fates, on loan from the private collection of Henry W. Wiley. Edith would have her new hats, he thought, 
her dinner parties, and her afternoon promenades. And he would have the prize of a lifetime. Sighing with satisfaction, Henry sat back to enjoy his last cup of Earl Grey. Felix Greenfield was a thief. He was neither ashamed nor prideful of it. It was simply what he was and had always been. And as Henry Wiley assumed he'd have other opportunities to gaze upon the Irish coast, Felix assumed he'd remain a thief for many years to come. He was good at his work, not brilliant at it, he'd be the first to admit, but good enough to make ends meet. Good enough, he thought, as he moved quickly down the corridors of first class in his stolen steward's uniform, to have gathered the means for third-class passage back to England. Things were just a bit hot professionally back in New York, with cops breathing down his neck due to that bungled burglary. Not that it had been his fault, not entirely. His only failing had been to break his own first rule and take on an associate for the job. Bad choice, as his temporary partner had broken another primary rule. Never steal what isn't easily, discreetly fenced. Greed had blinded old two-pint monk, Felix thought with a sigh, as he let himself into the wily stateroom. What had the man been thinking, laying sticky fingers on a diamond and sapphire necklace? then behaving like a bloody amateur by getting drunk as a sailor on his usual two pints of lager and bragging over it. Well, two pint would do his bragging in jail now, though there'd be no lager to loosen his idiot tongue. But the bastard had chirped like the stool pigeon he was and given Felix's name to the coppers. It had seemed best to take a nice ocean voyage, and what better place to get lost than on a ship as big as a damn city? He'd been a bit concerned about the war in Europe, and the murmurs about the Germans stalking the seas had given him some pause, but they were such vague, distant threats. The New York police and the idea of a long stretch behind bars were much more personal and immediate problems. In any case, he couldn't believe a grand ship like the Lusitania would cross if there was any real danger. Not with all those wealthy people on board. It was a civilian vessel, after all, and he was sure the Germans had better things to do than threaten a luxury liner, especially when there was a large complement of American citizens on board. He'd been lucky indeed to have snagged a ticket, to have lost himself among all the passengers with the cops two steps behind him in closing. But he'd had to leave quickly, and had spent nearly all his wherewithal for the ticket. Certainly there were opportunities galore to pluck a bit of this, a bit of that, on such a fine, luxurious vessel filled with such fine, luxurious people. Cash would be best, of course, for cash was never the wrong size or the wrong color. Inside the stateroom, he let out a low whistle. Imagine it, he thought, taking a moment to dream. Just imagine traveling in such style. He knew less about the architecture and design of where he was standing than a flea knew about the breed of dog it bit but he knew it was choice. The sitting room was larger than the hall of his third-class accommodations and the bedroom beyond a wonder. Those who slept here knew nothing about the cramped space, the dark corners, and the smells of third class. He didn't begrudge them their advantages. After all, if there weren't people who lived high, he'd have no one to steal from, would he? Still, he couldn't waste time gawking and dreaming. It was already a few minutes before three, and if the Wileys were true to form... The woman would wander back before four for her afternoon nap. He had delicate hands and was careful to disturb little as he searched for spare cash. Big bucks, he figured, they'd leave in the purser's keeping. But fine ladies and gentlemen enjoyed having a roll of bills close at hand for flashing. He found an envelope already marked steward and, grinning, ripped it open to find crisp dollar bills and a generous tip. He tucked it in the trouser pocket of his borrowed uniform. Within ten minutes, he'd found and claimed nearly a hundred fifty dollars and a pair of nice garnet ear bobs left carelessly in a silk evening purse. He didn't touch the jewelry cases, the man's or the woman's. That was asking for trouble. But as he sifted neatly through socks and drawers, his fingers brushed over a solid lump wrapped in velvet cloth. Lips pursed, Felix gave in to curiosity and spread open the cloth. He didn't know anything about art, but he recognized pure silver when he had his hands on it. The lady, for it was a woman, was small enough to fit in his palm. She held some sort of spindle, he supposed it was, 
and was garbed in a kind of robe. She had a lovely face and form. Fetching, he would have said, though she looked a bit too cool and calculating for his personal taste in females. He preferred them a bit slow of wit and cheerful of disposition. Tucked in with her was a paper with a name and address and the scrawled notation, Contact for Second Fate. Felix pondered over it, committed the note to memory out of habit. It could be another chicken for plucking once he was in London. He started to wrap her again, replace her where he'd found her, but he just stood there, turning her over and over in his hands. Throughout his long career as a thief, he'd never once allowed himself to envy, to crave, to want an object for himself. What was taken was always a means to an end, and nothing more. But Felix Greenfield, lately of Hell's Kitchen and bound for the alleyways and tenements of London, stood in the plush cavern on the grand ship with the Irish coast even now in view out the windows, and wanted the small silver woman for his own. She was so pretty, and fit so well in his hand with the metal already warming against his palm. Such a little thing, who would miss her? Don't be stupid, he muttered, wrapped her in velvet again. Take the money, mate, and move along. Before he could replace her, he heard what he thought was a peal of thunder. The floor beneath his feet seemed to shudder. Nearly losing his balance, as the ship shook side to side, he stumbled toward the door, the velvet cloak statue still in his hand. Without thinking, he jammed it into his trouser pocket, spilled out into the corridor as the floor rose under him. There was a sound now, not like thunder, but like a great hammer flung down from heaven to strike the ship. Felix ran for his life, and running, he raced into madness. The forward part of the ship dipped sharply and had him tumbling down the corridor like dice in a cup. He could hear shouting and the pounding of feet, and he tasted blood in his mouth seconds before it went dark. His first wild thought was iceberg, as he remembered what had befallen the great Titanic. But surely in the broad light of a spring afternoon so close to the Irish coast, such a thing was impossible. He never thought of the Germans, he never thought of war. He scrambled up, slamming into walls in the pitch black of the corridor, stumbling over his own feet and the stairs and spilled out on deck with a flood of others. Already lifeboats were being launched and there were cries of terror, along with shouted orders for women and children to board them. How bad was it? he wondered frantically. How bad could it be when he could see the shimmering green of the coastline? Even as he tried to calm himself, the ship pitched again and one of the lowering lifeboats upended. Its screaming passengers were hurled into the sea. He saw a mass of faces, some torn, some scalded, all horrified. There were piles of debris on deck, and passengers bleeding, screaming, trapped under it. Some, he saw, with dull shock, were already beyond screams. And there, on the listing deck of the great ship, Felix smelled what he'd often smelled in Hell's Kitchen. He smelled death. Women clutched children, babies, and wept or prayed. Men ran in panic or fought madly to drag the injured clear of debris. Through the chaos, stewards and stewardesses hurried, passing out life jackets with a kind of steady calm. They might have been handing out teacups, he thought, until one rushed by him. Go on, man, do your job, see to the passengers. It took Felix one blank moment before he remembered he was still wearing the stolen steward's uniform, and another before he understood, truly understood, they were sinking. Fuck me, he thought, standing in the middle of the screams and prayers, were dying. There were shouts from the water, desperate cries for help. Felix fought his way to the rail and, looking down, saw bodies floating, people floundering in debris-strewn water, people drowning in it. He saw another lifeboat being launched, wondered if he could somehow make the leap into it and save himself. He struggled to pull himself to a higher point. To gain ground was all he could think, to stay on his feet until he could hurl himself into a lifeboat and survive. He saw a well-dressed man take off his own life jacket and put it around a weeping woman. So the rich could be heroes, he thought. They could afford to be. 
He'd sooner be alive. The deck tilted again, sent him sliding along with countless others toward the mouth of the sea. He shot out a hand, managed to grab the rail with his clever thief's fingers and cling, and his free hand closed, as if by magic, over a life jacket as it went tumbling by. Muttering wild prayers of thanks, he started to strap it on. It was a sign, he thought, with his heart and eyes wheeling wild, a sign from God that he was meant to survive this. As his shaking fingers fumbled with the jacket, he saw the woman wedged between upturned deck chairs, and the child, the small, angelic face of the child, she clutched against her. She wasn't weeping. She wasn't screaming. She simply held and rocked the little boy as if lulling him into his afternoon nap. Mary, mother of God. And cursing himself for a fool, Felix crawled across the pitched deck. He dragged and heaved at the chairs that pinned her down. I've hurt my leg. She continued to stroke her child's hair, and the rings on her fingers sparkled in the strong spring sunlight. Though her voice was calm, her eyes were huge, glazed with shock and pain, and the terror Felix felt galloped inside his own chest. I don't think I can walk. Will you take my baby? Please take my little boy to a lifeboat. See him safe. He had one moment, one heartbeat to choose. And while the world went to hell around them, the child smiled. Put this on yourself, Mrs., and hold tight to the boy. We'll put it on my son. It's too big for him. It won't help him. I've lost my husband. She spoke in those clear, cultured tones, and though her eyes were glassy, they stayed level on his as Felix pushed her arms through the life jacket. He fell over the rail. I fear he's dead. You're not, are you? Neither is the boy. He could smell the child. Powder, youth, innocence, through the stench of panic and death. What's his name? Name? He's Stephen. Stephen Edward Cunningham the Third. Let's get you and Stephen Edward Cunningham the Third to a lifeboat. We're sinking. That's the God's truth. He dragged her trying once more to reach the high side of the ship. He crawled, clawed his way over the wet and rising deck. Hold on tight to Mama, Stephen, he heard her say. Then she crawled and clawed with him while terror raged around them. Don't be frightened. She crooned it, though her breath was coming fast with the effort. Her heavy skirt sloshed in the water, and blood smeared over the glinting stones on her fingers. You have to be brave. Don't let go of Mama, no matter what. He could see the boy, no more than three, cling like a monkey to his mother's neck. Watching her face, Felix thought as he strained for another inch of height, as if all the answers in all the world were printed on it. Deck chairs, tables, God knew what, rained down from the deck above. He dragged her another inch, another a foot. Just a little farther. He gasped it out, without any idea if it were true. Something struck him hard in the back, and his hold on her slipped. Mrs. he shouted, grabbed blindly, but caught only the pretty silk sleeve of her dress. As it ripped, he stared at her helplessly. God bless you, she managed, and, wrapping both arms tight around her son, slid over the edge of the world into the water. He barely had time to curse before the deck heaved and he pitched in after her. The cold, the sheer brutality of it, stole his breath. Blind, already going numb with shock, he kicked wildly, clawing for the surface as he'd clawed for the deck. When he broke through, gasped in that first gulp of air, he found he'd plunged into a hell worse than any he'd imagined. Dead were all around him. He was jammed into an island of bobbing, staring white faces, of screams from the drowning. The water was strewn with planks and chairs, wrecked lifeboats and crates. His limbs were already stiff with cold when he struggled to heave as much of his body as possible onto a crate and out of the freezing water. And what he saw was worse. There were hundreds of bodies floating in the still sparkling sunlight. 
While his stomach heaved out the sea he'd swallowed, he floundered in the direction of a waterlogged lifeboat. The swell, somehow gentle, tore at the island and spread death over the sea and dragged him with merciless hands away from the lifeboat. The great ship, the floating palace, was sinking in front of his eyes. Dangling from it were lifeboats, useless as toys. Somehow it astonished him to see there were still people on the decks. Some were kneeling, others still rushing in panic from a fate that was hurtling toward them. In shock, he watched more tumble like dolls into the sea, and the huge black funnels tipped down toward the water, down to where he clung to a broken crate. When those funnels touched the sea, water gushed into them, sucking in people with it. Not like this, he thought as he kicked weakly. A man wasn't meant to die like this. But the sea dragged him under, pulled him in. Water seemed to boil around him as he struggled. He choked on it, tasted salt and oil and smoke, and realized as his body bashed into a solid wall that he was trapped in one of the funnels, would die there like a rat in a blocked chimney. As his lungs began to scream, he thought of the woman and the boy. Since he deemed it useless to pray for himself, he offered what he thought was his last plea to God that they'd survive. Later he would think it had been as if hands had taken hold of him and yanked him free. As the funnel sank, he was expelled, flying out on a filthy gush of soot. With pain radiating through him, he snagged a floating plank and pulled his upper body onto it. He laid his cheek on the wood, breathed deeply, wept quietly and saw the Lusitania was gone. The plate of water where she'd been was raging, thrashing, and belching smoke. Belching bodies he saw with a dull horror. He'd been one of them only moments before, but fate had spared him. While he watched, while he struggled to block out the screams and stay sane, the water went calm as glass. With the last of his strength, he pulled himself onto the plank, he heard the shrill song of seagulls, the weeping prayers or weeping cries of those who floundered or floated in the water with him. Probably freeze to death, he thought as he drifted in and out of consciousness. But it was better than drowning. It was the cold that brought him out of the faint. His body was racked with it, and every trickling breeze was a new agony. Hardly daring to move, he tugged at his sopping and ruined steward's jacket. Bright pain had nausea rolling greasily in his belly. He ran an unsteady hand over his face and saw the wet wasn't water but blood. His laugh was wild and shaky. So what would it be, freezing or bleeding to death? Drowning might have been better after all. It would be over that way. He slowly shed the jacket. Something wrong with his shoulder, he thought absently, and used the ruined jacket to wipe the blood from his face. He didn't hear so much shouting now. There were still some thin screams, some moans and prayers, but most of the passengers who'd made it as far as he had were dead and silent. He watched a body float by. It took him a moment to recognize the face as it was bone white and covered with bloodless gashes. Wily! Good Christ! For the first time since the nightmare had begun, he felt for the weight in his pocket— he felt the lump of what he'd stolen from the man currently staring up at the sky with blank blue eyes. "'You won't need it,' Felix said between chattering teeth. "'But I swear before God, if I had it to do over, I wouldn't have stolen from you in the last moments of your life. Seems like robbing a grave.' His long-lapsed religious training had him folding his hands in prayer. "'If I end up dying here today,' I'll apologize in person if we end up on the same side of the gate. And if I live, I'll take a vow to try to reform. No point in saying I'll do it, but I'll give doing an honest day's work a try. He passed out again and woke to the sound of an engine. Dazed, numb, he managed to lift his head. Through his wavering vision, he saw a boat and through the roaring in his ears heard the shouts and voices of men. He tried to call out, but managed only a hacking cough. I'm alive! His voice was only a croak, whisked away by the breeze. I'm still alive! 
He didn't feel the hands pull him onto the fishing trawler called Dan O'Connell. Was delirious with chills and pain when he was wrapped in a blanket, when hot tea was poured down his throat. He would remember nothing about his actual rescue, nor learn the names of the men whose arms had hauled him to safety. Nothing came clear to him until he woke, nearly twenty-four hours after the torpedo had struck the liner, in a narrow bed in a small room with sunlight streaming through a window. He would never forget the first sight that greeted him when his vision cleared. She was young and pretty, with eyes of misty blue and a scatter of gold freckles over her small nose and round cheeks. Her hair was fair and piled on top of her head in some sort of knot that seemed to be slipping. Her mouth bowed up when she glanced over at him, and she rose quickly from the chair where she'd been darning socks. There you are. I wonder if you'll stay with us this time around. He heard Ireland in her voice, felt the strong hand lift his head, and he smelled a drift of lavender. What? The old croaking sound of his voice appalled him. His throat felt scorched, his head stuffed with rags of dirty cotton. Just take this first. It's medicine the doctor left for you. You've pneumonia, he says, and a fair gash on your head that's been stitched. Seems you tore something in your shoulder as well. But you've come through the worst, sir, and you rest easy, for we'll see you through. What happened? The ship? The pretty mouth went flat and hard. The bloody Germans. T'was a U-boat torpedoed you, and they'll writhe in hell for it, for the people they murdered, the babies they slaughtered. Though a tear trickled down her cheek. She managed to slide the medicine into him competently. You have to rest. Your life's a miracle, for there are more than a thousand dead. Oh! He managed to grip her wrist as the horror stabbed through him. A thousand! More then! You're in Queenstown now, and as well as you can be. She tilted her head. An American, are you? Close enough, he decided. As he hadn't seen the shores of his native England in more than twelve years. Yes, I, I need tea. She interrupted, and broth. She moved to the door to shout, "Ma, he's waked and seems to want to stay that way." She glanced back. "I'll be back with something warm in a minute." Please, who are you? Me. She smiled again, wonderfully sunny. I'd be Meg. Meg O'Reilly, and you're in the home of my parents, Pat and Mary O'Reilly, where you're welcome until you're mended. And your name, sir? Greenfield, Felix Greenfield. God bless you, Mister Greenfield. Wait, there was a woman and a little boy, Cunningham. Pity moved over her face. They're listing names. I'll check on them for you when I'm able. Now you rest, and we'll get you some tea. When she went out, he turned his face toward the window, toward the sun, and saw sitting on the table under it the money that had been in his pocket, the garnet earbobs, and the bright silver glint of the little statue. Felix laughed until he cried. He learned the O'Reillys made their living from the sea. Pat and his two sons had been part of the rescue effort. He met them all, and her younger sister as well. For the first day, he was unable to keep any of them straight in his mind, but for Meg herself, he clung to her company as he'd clung to the plank to keep from sliding into the dark again. Tell me what you know, he begged her. It'll be hard for you to hear it. It's hard to speak it. She moved to his window, looked out at the village where she'd lived all of her eighteen years. Survivors such as Felix were being tended to in hotel rooms, in the homes of neighbors, and the dead, God rest them, were laid in temporary morgues. Some would be buried, some would be sent home, others would be forever in the grave of the sea. When I heard of it, she began, I almost didn't believe it. How could such a thing be? There were trawlers out, and they went directly to try to rescue survivors. More boats set out from here. Most were too late to do more than bring back the dead. Oh, sweet God! I saw myself some of the people as they made land. 
women and babies, men barely able to walk and half naked. Some cried and others just stared, like you do when you're lost. They say the liner went down in less than twenty minutes. Can that be? Oh, I don't know. Felix murmured and shut his eyes. She glanced back at him and hoped he was strong enough for the rest. More have died since coming here. Exposure and injuries too grievous to heal. Some spent hours in the water. The lists change so quick. I can't think what terror of heart families are living with, waiting to know, or what grief those who know their loved ones are lost in this horrible way are feeling. You said there was no one waiting for word of you. Now, now on. She went to him. She tended his hurts, suffered with him during the horrors of his delirium. It had been only three days since he'd been brought into her care, but for both of them, it was a lifetime. There's no shame in staying here," she said quietly. "No shame in not going to the funeral today. You're far from well yet. I need to go." He looked down at his borrowed clothes. In them, he felt scrawny and fragile, and alive. The quiet was almost unearthly. Every shop and store in Queenstown was closed for the day. No children raced along the streets. No neighbors stopped to chat or gossip. Over the silence came the hollow sound of church bells from St. Colman's on the hill, and the mournful notes of the funeral dirge. Felix knew if he lived another hundred years, he'd never forget the sounds of that grieving music, the soft and steady beat of drums. He watched the sun strike the brass of the instruments, and remembered how that same sun had struck the brass of the propellers. As the stern of the Lusitania had reared up in her final plunge into the sea, he was alive. He thought again. Instead of relief and gratitude, he felt only guilt and despair. He kept his head down as he trudged along behind the priests, the mourners, the dead, through the reverently silent streets. It took more than an hour to reach the graveyard, and left him lightheaded. By the time he saw the three mass graves beneath tall elms where choir boys stood with incense burners, he was forced to lean heavily on Meg. Tears stung the backs of his eyes as he looked at the tiny coffins that held dead children. He listened to the quiet weeping, to the words of both the Catholic and the Church of Ireland services. None of it reached him. He could still hear. Thought he would forever hear the way people had called to God as they drowned, but God hadn't listened and had let them die horribly. Then he lifted his head and, across those obscene holes, saw the face of the woman and young boy from the ship. The tears came now, fell down his cheeks like rain as he lurched through the crowd. He reached her as the first notes of "Abide with Me" lifted into the air. Then he fell to his knees in front of her wheelchair. I feared you were dead. She reached up, touched his face with one hand, the other peeked out of a cast. I never got your name, so couldn't check the lists. You're alive. Her face had been cut. He could see that now, and her color was too bright, as if she were feverish. Her leg had been cast as well as her arm, and the boy. The child slept in the arms of another woman, like an angel. Felix thought again, peaceful and unmarked. The fist of despair that gripped him loosened. One prayer, at least one prayer, had been answered. He never let go. She began to weep then, soundlessly. He's such a good boy. He never let go. I broke my arm in the fall. If you hadn't given me your life jacket, we would have drowned.、M、my husband. Her voice frayed as she looked over at the graves. They never found him. I'm sorry. He would have thanked you. She reached up to touch a hand to her boy's leg. He loved his son very much. She took a deep breath. In his stead, I thank you for my son's life and my own. Please tell me your name. 
Felix Greenfield, ma'am. Mr. Greenfield. She leaned over, brushed a kiss on Felix's cheek. I'll never forget you, nor will my son. When they wheeled her chair away, she kept her shoulders straight with a quiet dignity that brought a wash of shame over Felix's face. You're a hero, Meg told him. Shaking his head, he moved as quickly as he could away from the crowds, away from the graves. Now, she is. I'm nothing. How can you say that? I heard what she said. You saved her life and the little boys. Concerned, she hurried up to him, took his arm to steady him. He'd have shaken her off if he'd had the strength. Instead, he simply sat in the high, wild grass of the graveyard and buried his face in his hands. Ah, there now. Pity for him had her sitting beside him, taking him into her arms. There now, Felix. He could think of nothing but the strength in the young widow's face, in the innocence of her son's. She was hurt, so she asked me to take the boy, to save the boy. You saved them both. I don't know why I did it. I was only thinking about saving myself. I'm a thief. Those things you took out of my pocket, I stole them. I was stealing them when the ship was hit. All I could think about when it was happening was getting out alive. Meg shifted beside him, folded her hands. Did you give her your life jacket? It wasn't mine. I found it. I don't know why I gave it to her. She was trapped between deck chairs, holding on to the boy, holding on to her sanity in the middle of all that hell. You could have turned away from her. Saved yourself. He mopped at his eyes. I wanted to. But you didn't. I'll never know why. He only knew that seeing them alive had changed something inside him. But the point is, I'm a second-rate thief who was on that ship because I was run from the cops. I stole a man's things minutes before he died. A thousand people are dead. I saw some of them die. I'm alive. What kind of world is it that saves a thief and takes children? Who can answer? But there's a child who's alive today because you were there. Would you have been, do you think, just where you were, when you were, if you hadn't been stealing? He let out a derisive sound. The likes of me wouldn't have been anywhere near the first-class deck unless I'd been stealing. There you are. She took a handkerchief from her pocket and dried his tears, as she would a child's. Stealing's wrong. It's a sin, and there's no question about it. But if you'd been minding your own, that woman and her son would be dead. If a sin saves innocent lives, I'm thinking it's not so great a sin. And I have to say, you didn't steal so very much if all you had for it were a pair of ear bobs, a little statue and some American dollars. For some reason, that made him smile. Well, I was just getting started. The smile she sent him was lovely and sure. Yes, I'd say you're just getting started. Two. Helsinki, 2002. She wasn't what he'd expected. He'd studied the picture of her on the back of her book and on the program for the lecture, Would It Never End? But there was a difference in flesh and blood. She was smaller than he'd imagined, for one thing, nearly delicate in her quiet gray suit that should, in his opinion, be a good inch shorter at the hem. From what he could see of her legs, they weren't half bad. In person, she didn't look nearly as competent and intimidating a woman as she did on the dust jacket. Though the little wire glasses she wore on stage added a sort of trendy intellectual tone. She had a good voice, maybe too good, he thought, as it was damn near putting him to sleep. Still, that was primarily the fault of the subject matter. He was interested in Greek myths, in one particular Greek myth. But Christ Jesus, it was tedious to have to sit through an hour's lecture on the entire breed of them. He straightened in his chair and did his best to concentrate. Not on the words so much. He didn't give a rat's ass about Artemis turning some poor slob into a stag because he'd seen her naked. That only proved that women, goddesses or not, were peculiar creatures. To his mind, Dr. Tia Marsh was damn peculiar. The woman came from money, great gobs and hordes of money, 
Yet instead of sitting back and enjoying it, she spent her time steeped in long-dead Greek gods, writing about them, lecturing about them, interminably. She had generations of breeding behind her, blood as blue as the Kerry Lakes, but here she was, giving her endless talk in Finland, days after she'd given what he assumed was the same song and dance in Sweden, in Norway, hyping her book all over Europe and Scandinavia. Certainly it wasn't for the money, he mused. Maybe she just liked to hear the sound of her own voice. Countless did. She was, according to his information, twenty-nine, single, the only child of the New York Marshes, and most important, the great-great-granddaughter of Henry W. Wiley. Wiley Antiques was, as it had been for nearly a hundred years, one of the most prestigious antique and auction houses in New York. It was no coincidence that Wiley's offshoot had developed such a keen interest in the Greek gods. It was his assignment to find out, by whatever means worked best, what she knew about the three fates. If she'd been, well, softer, he supposed, he might have tried and enjoyed a seduction angle. It was fascinating what people would tell each other when sex was tangled into the mix. She was attractive enough in a scholarly sort of way, but he wasn't entirely sure what button to push, romantically speaking, with the intellectual type. Frowning a bit, he turned the book over on his lap and gave the photo another look. In it, she had her sunny, blonde hair tucked back in some sort of bun. She was smiling rather dutifully, he thought now as if someone had said, say cheese. It wasn't a smile that reached the eyes, very sober and serious blue eyes that suited the somewhat sober and serious curve of her lips. Her face tapered down to a bit of a point. He might have called it elfin, but for that primly styled hair and the somber stare. He thought she looked like a woman in need of a good laugh or a good lay. Both his mother and his sister would have belted him for that opinion but a man's thoughts were his own business. Best, he decided, to approach the prim Dr. Marsh on very civilized, very businesslike terms. When the applause, a great deal more enthusiastic than he'd expected, broke out, he nearly cheered himself, but even as he started to rise, hands shot up. Annoyed, he checked his watch, then settled himself for the question-and-answer session. As she was working with an interpreter, he decided the session might take the rest of his life. He noted she took the glasses off for this portion, blinked like an owl in sunlight, and seemed to take a very long breath, the way a diver might, he mused, before plunging off a high board into a dark pool. When inspiration struck, he lifted his hand. It was always best, he thought, to knock politely on a door to see if it opened before you just kicked it in. When she gestured to him, he got to his feet and sent her one of his best smiles. Dr. Marsh, I'd like to thank you first for a fascinating talk. Oh. She blinked, and he saw she'd been surprised by the Irish in his voice. Good, something else to use. Yang's, for reasons that eluded him, were so often charmed silly by an accent. You're welcome, she said. I've always been interested in the fates, and I wonder, in your opinion, if their power held individually or only because of their union. The Miri, or the fates, were a triad, she began, each with a specific task. Clotho, who spins the thread of life, Lachesis, who measures it, and Atropus, who cuts that thread and ends it. None could function alone. A thread might be spun, but endlessly and without purpose or its natural course. Or without the spinning, there's nothing to measure, nothing to cut. Three parts, she added, sliding her fingers into an interlocking steeple. One purpose, and close them into a joined fist. Alone, they would be nothing but ordinary if interesting women. Together, the most powerful and honored of gods. Exactly so, he thought, as he resumed his seat. Exactly. She was so tired. When the Q&A session was finished, Tia wondered how she didn't simply stumble her way to the signing area. Despite the precautions of melatonin, diet, aromatherapy, and cautious exercise, her internal time clock was running ragged. 
but she was tired, she reminded herself in Helsinki, and that counted for something. Everyone was so kind, so interested here, just as they had been at every stop since she'd left New York. How long ago was that? she wondered, as she took her seat, picked up her pen, plastered on her author smile. Twenty-two days. It was important to remember the days, and that she was more than three-quarters of the way through her self-imposed torture. How do you conquer phobia? Dr. Lowenstein had asked. By facing the phobia. You've got chronic shyness with whiffs of paranoia? Get out there and interact with the public. She wondered when a patient came to Lowenstein with a fear of heights if his solution was a fast leap off the Brooklyn Bridge. Had he listened when she'd assured him she was positive she had social anxiety disorder? Perhaps agoraphobia combined with claustrophobia? No, he had not. He'd insisted she was merely shy and had suggested she leave the psychiatric evaluations and diagnoses to him. As her stomach churned when the first members of the audience walked up for a word and a signature, she wished she could face Dr. Lowenstein right this minute so she could punch him. Still, it was better, she was forced to admit. She was better. She'd gotten through the lecture, and this time without a Xanax or a quick guilty shot of whiskey. The trouble was the lecturing wasn't nearly as hard as this one-on-one -on -one business. With lecturing, there was a nice cushion of distance and dispassion. She had notes when she lectured, a clear-cut plan that moved from Anenke to Zeus. But when people came up to a signing table, they'd expected spontaneity and chat and, God, charm. Her hand didn't shake as she signed her name. Her voice didn't quaver as she spoke. That was progress. At her first stop in London, she'd been nearly catatonic by the end of the program. By the time she'd gotten back to her hotel, she'd been a quivering, quaking mess and had solved that little problem by taking a couple of pills and sliding into the safe cocoon of drug-induced sleep. God, she'd wanted to go home. She had wanted to run like a rabbit back to her bolt hole in New York, lock herself in her lovely apartment. But she had made commitments, given her word. A marsh never broke her word. Now she could be glad, even proud, she had held on, had white-knuckled her way through the first week, quivered through the second, and gritted her way through the third. At this point, she was nearly too exhausted from the rigors of travel to be nervous at the prospect of speaking to strangers. Her face was numb from smiling by the time the end of the line tailed around. She lifted her gaze, met the grass-green eyes of the Irishman who'd asked her about the fates. A fascinating lecture, Dr. Marsh, he said in that lovely lilt. Thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. She was already reaching for his book when she realized he'd held out a hand. She fumbled a bit, then switched her pen to her left and shook his. Why was it people always wanted to shake hands, she wondered. Didn't they know how many germs were transferred that way? His hand was warm, firm, and lingered on hers just long enough to have embarrassed heat creeping up her neck. Speaking of fate, he said, and gave her an easy, dazzling smile. I was pleased with mine when I saw you'd be here while I was in Helsinki on business. I've admired your work for some time. He lied without a flicker. Thank you. Oh, God, she thought. Conversation. First rule. Have them do the talking. You're from Ireland? I am, yes, County Cork, but travelling just now as you are. Yes, as I am. Travelling's an exciting part of life, isn't it? Exciting, she thought. Yes, very. It was her turn to lie. I seem to be holding you up. He handed her the book. I'm Malachy, Malachy Sullivan. It's nice to meet you. She signed his book in a careful and lovely hand, struggling to calculate how best to end the conversation and, at last, the event. Thank you so much for coming, Mr. Sullivan. She got to her feet. I hope your business in Finland is successful. So do I, Dr. Marsh. No, she wasn't what he'd expected, and that had Malachy reevaluating his approach. He might have taken her for aloof, cool, and a bit of a snob but he'd seen the flush warm her cheeks and the occasional glint of panic in her eyes. What she was, he decided as he loitered on the corner, watching the hotel entrance, was shy. 
What a woman floating in money, status, and privilege had to be shy about, he couldn't say. But it took all kinds to make the world, he supposed. The question could be asked, he admitted, why a perfectly sane man with a reasonably content life, a reasonably decent income, should travel to Helsinki on the chance that a woman he'd never met might lead him to a treasure that may or may not exist. The question, he thought, had too many layers for a single easy answer. But if he had to choose one, it would be family honor. No, that wasn't quite enough. The second part was that he'd held fate in his hand and wouldn't rest until he had a hold on it again. Tia Marsh was connected to his past and to his way of thinking, to his future. He checked his watch. He hoped, in very short order, they'd take the first step ahead. It pleased him when his guess proved out. She'd come straight back to the hotel from the university, he noted, as he watched her climb out of the cab, and she'd come alone. He sauntered down the sidewalk, gauging his timing. He glanced toward her just as she turned. Once again, they were face to face. Dr. Marsh! The tone of his voice, the spread of his smile were calculated for surprise and flattery. You're staying here as well, then? Uh, yes, Mr. Sullivan. She remembered his name. In fact, she'd been thinking how attractive he was while she'd rubbed antibacterial lotion on her hands in the taxi. It's a lovely hotel, fine service. He turned as if to walk to the door and open it for her, then stopped. Dr. Marsh, I hope you won't think this out of line, but I wonder if I might buy you a drink. I... Part of her brain fizzled. She'd actually woven a complex little fantasy on the taxi ride as well, one where she'd been witty and sophisticated during their conversation, and they'd ended up finishing the evening with a mad, reckless affair. I don't really drink, she managed. Don't you? Amusement touched his face. Well, that knocks down the first approach a man might use to spend some time with an interesting and attractive woman. Would you fancy a walk? Excuse me? She couldn't keep up. He couldn't be hitting on her. She wasn't the type men hit on, particularly wildly attractive strangers with fabulous accents. One of the charms of Helsinki in the summer is the sun. Taking advantage of her confusion, he took her arm gently and steered her away from the hotel entrance. Here it is, past half nine already and bright as day. It's a shame to waste such a light, isn't it? Have you been down to the harbour? No, I... Baffled by the turn of events, she looked back at the hotel. Solitude. Safety. I really should... Have you an early flight in the morning? He knew she didn't, but wondered if she'd have the guile to lie. No, no, actually I'm here to, until Wednesday. Well then, let me take that case for you. He slid her briefcase off her shoulder and onto his own. Though the weight surprised him, it was a smooth move. It must be a challenge giving talks and seminars in such in a country where you don't have the primary language. I had an interpreter. Yes, she was very good. Still, it's a bit of work, isn't it? Do you wonder at such interest here in the Greeks? There are correlations between the Greek gods and myths and the Norse. Deities with human failings and virtues, the adventures, the sex, the betrayals. And if he didn't steer the conversation as he was steering her, Malachi thought, they'd be right back in lecture mode. You're right, of course. I'm from a country that prizes its myths. Have you ever been to Ireland? Once, when I was a child, I don't remember it. That's a shame. You'll have to go back. Are you warm enough? Yes, I'm fine. The minute she said it, she realized she should have complained of a chill and gotten away. The next problem was she'd been so flustered she'd paid no attention to the direction. Now she hadn't a clue how to get back to the hotel, but surely it couldn't be difficult. The streets were straight and neat, she noted as she worked to calm herself. And though it was moving toward ten at night, crowded with people, it was the light, of course, that lovely, luminous summer light that drenched the city in warm charm. She hadn't even looked around until now, she admitted, hadn't taken a stroll, done any foolish shopping, had a coffee at one of the sidewalk tables. She'd done here what she did all too often in New York, stayed in her nest until she had to fulfill an obligation. 
He thought she looked a bit like a sleepwalker coming out of a trance as she studied the surroundings. Her arm was still rigid in his, but he thought it less likely she'd bolt now. There were enough people around to make her feel safe with him, he assumed. Crowds and couples and tourists, all taking advantage of the endless day. There was music coming from the square, and the crowd was thicker there. He skirted the bulk of it, nudging her closer to the harbor, where the breeze danced. It was there, by the edge of that deep blue water, where boats red and white bobbed, that he saw her smile easily for the first time. It's beautiful. She had to lift her voice over the music. So streamlined and perfect. I wish I'd taken the ferry from Stockholm, but I was afraid I'd get seasick. Still, I'd have been sick on the Baltic Sea. That has to count for something. When he laughed, she glanced up, flustered. She'd nearly forgotten she'd been talking to a stranger. That sounds stupid. No, it sounds charming. It surprised him that he meant it. Let's do what the Finns do at such a time. Take a sauna. He laughed again, let his hand slide down her arm until it linked with hers. Have some coffee. It shouldn't have been possible. She shouldn't have been sitting at a crowded sidewalk cafe under pearly sunlight at eleven at night in a city thousands of miles from home. Certainly, she shouldn't have been sitting across from a man so ridiculously handsome. She had to fight the urge to glance around to be sure he wasn't talking to someone else. His wonderful head of chestnut brown hair fluttered around his face in the steady breeze. It waved a bit, that hair, and caught glints of the sun. His face was smooth and narrow, with just a hint of hollows in the cheeks. His mouth, mobile and firm, could light into a smile designed to make a woman's pulse flutter. It certainly worked on hers. His eyes were framed by thick, dark lashes, arched over by expressive brows. But it was the eyes themselves that captivated her. They were the deep green of summer grass, with a halo of pale gold ringing the pupil. And they stayed fixed on hers when she spoke, not in a probing, uncomfortable way, but an interested one. She'd had men look at her with interest before. She wasn't a gorgon after all. She reminded herself, but somehow she had managed to reach the age of twenty-nine and never have a man look at her in quite the way Malachi Sullivan looked at her. She should be nervous, but she wasn't. Not really. She told herself it was because he was so obviously a gentleman in both manner and dress. He spoke well, seemed so at ease with himself. The stone gray business suit fit his tall, lanky form perfectly. Her father, whose fashion sense was laser keen, would have approved. She sipped her second cup of decaf coffee and wondered what generous gift of fate had put him in her path. They were talking of the three fates again, but she didn't mind. It was easier to talk of the gods than of personal things. I've never decided if it's comforting or frightening to consider your life being determined all before you've taken your first breath by three women. Not just the length of a life, Tia put in, and had to bite back the urge to warn him of the perils of refined white sugar when he added a generous teaspoon to his coffee. The tone of it, the good and the evil in you. The fates distribute that good and that evil justly. It's still up to a man what he does with what's inside him. Not preordained, then. Every act is an act of will or lack of it. She moved her shoulders, and every act has consequences. Zeus, king of the gods and quite the ladies' man, wanted Thetis. The Miri prophesied that her son would be more famous, perhaps more powerful in some way than Zeus himself. And Zeus, recalling just how he dealt with his own father. Feared siring this child, so he gave Thetis up, thinking of his own welfare. It's a foolish man who gives up a woman because of what may happen down the road. It didn't do him any good anyway, did it? Since Thetis went on to mother Achilles, perhaps if he'd followed his heart instead of his ambition, married her and loved the child, showed pride in his son's accomplishments, Zeus would have had a different fate. What the hell had happened to Zeus? Malachi wondered. But thought it wiser not to ask. So he chose his own destiny by looking into the dark inside himself and projecting that on a child yet unconceived. Her face lit at his response. You could say that. You could also say the past sends out ripples. 
If you follow mythology, you know every finger dipped into the pool sends those ripples out, and they touch on those who come after, generation after generation. She had lovely eyes, he mused, when you got close enough to really look into them. The irises were a clear and perfect blue. It's the same with people, isn't it? I think so. That's one of the core themes of the book. We can't escape fate, but we can do a great deal to carve、uh, our own mark in it, to turn it、uh, to our advantage or disadvantage. It seems mine's turned to advantage by scheduling this particular trip at this particular time. She knew the heat was rising to her cheeks again, and lifted her cup in hopes of hiding it. You haven't said what business you're in. Shipping. It was close to the truth. It's a family business, several generations now. A fateful choice. He said it casually, but watched her like a hawk watches a rabbit. When you consider my great great grandfather was one of the survivors of the Lusitania. Her eyes widened as she lowered her cup. Really, that's so strange. Mine died on the Lusitania. Is that the truth? His astonishment was exactly the right tone. That's a strong coincidence. I wonder if they knew each other. Tia. He touched a hand to hers, and when she didn't jolt, let it linger. I'm becoming a champion believer in fate. As he walked with her back to the hotel, Malachi debated how much more to say and how to say it. In the end, he decided to temper his impatience with discretion. If he brought up the statues too soon, she might see through the layers of coincidence to cold calculation. Do you have any plans for tomorrow? Tomorrow? She could barely get over that she'd ended up having plans tonight. No, not really. Why don't I pick you up about one? We'll have lunch. He smiled as he led her into the lobby. See where it takes us. She'd intended to pack, call home, work a bit on her new book, and spend at least an hour doing her relaxation exercises. She couldn't think why. That would be nice. Perfect, he thought. He'd give her a little romance, a little adventure, a drive to the sea, and drop in the first mention of the little silver statues. At the desk, he asked for her key and his own. Before she could reach for her key, he had it in his hand, and with the other pressed lightly to the small of her back. Walked with her to the elevator. It wasn't until the doors whisked shut and she was alone with him in the elevator that she tasted the first bubble of panic. What was she doing? What was he doing? He'd only pressed the button for her floor. She'd broken every rule in the businesswoman's travel handbook. Had obviously wasted 1495 and all the hours she'd spent studying every page. He knew her room number and that she was traveling alone. He would force himself into her room, rape and murder her, or, or with the imprint of the key he could be making even now, he'd sneak in later and rape and murder her, and all because she'd paid no attention to Chapter Two. She cleared her throat. Are you on four as well? Hm? No, I'm on six. I walk you to your door, Tia, as my mother would expect. I need to find a present for her, some glass. I'm thinking. Maybe you'll help me choose the right thing. The mention of his mother, as he'd expected, relaxed her again. You'll have to tell me what she likes. She likes anything her children buy her, he said as the elevator doors opened again. Children? I- I've a brother and a sister, Gideon and Rebecca. She went biblical on the names. Who knows why? He stopped at her door, slid her key into the lock. After he'd turned the knob, eased it open a crack, he stepped back. He heard and nearly chuckled at her quiet sigh of relief, and because he'd heard it, been amused by it, he took her hand. I have to thank you and the gods for a memorable evening. I had a lovely time. Until tomorrow, then. He kept his eyes on hers as he lifted her hand, brushed his lips over the knuckles. The little quiver of response did a great deal for his ego. Shy, delicate, and sweet. And as far from his type as the moon from the sun, still there was no reason a man shouldn't experiment with a new taste now and again. He might just have a sip of her tomorrow. Good night, Tia. Good night. A little, a little flustered, she backed into the door, her gaze locked with his, until she stepped over the threshold.
Then she turned, and she screamed. He was in the room ahead of her like a bullet. Under other circumstances, she'd have noted and admired the speed and grace with which he moved, but at the moment all she saw was the wreck of her hotel room. Her clothes were strewn everywhere. Her suitcases had been slit to pieces, the bed overturned, and all the drawers dumped. Her jewelry case had its contents spilled out and its lining ripped free. The desk in the sitting area had been ransacked as well, and the laptop that had sat on it was gone. Bloody hell, Malachy stated. All he could think was the bitch had beaten him to it. Fury dark on his face, he whirled around, and one look at Tia had him biting back the rest of the oaths. She was white as a sheet, her eyes already going glassy with shock. She doesn't deserve this, he thought, and had no doubt it was his hunting her down that had brought this on her. You need to sit down. What? Sit. Brisk now, he took her by the arm and pulled her to a chair, dumped her in it. We'll call security. Can you tell if anything's missing? My computer. She tried to catch her breath, found it blocked. Fearing an asthma attack, she dug in her briefcase for her inhaler. My laptop's gone. He frowned at her while she sucked on the inhaler. What was on it? She waved a hand as she drew in medication. My work, she managed between gulps. New book, email, accounts, banking. She rooted through her bag again for pills. I've got a disc copy of the book in here. But it was a prescription bottle she pulled out. Malachy nipped it out of her hand. What's this? He read the label, and his frown deepened. But just hold off on this for now. You're not going to be hysterical. I'm not. You're not. She felt the telltale tickle at the back of her throat that presaged a panic attack. I think you're wrong. Stop that. You'll hyperventilate or some such thing. Straining for patience, he crouched in front of her. Look at me now. Breathe slowly. Just breathe slowly. Can't. Yes, you can. You're not hurt, are you? Got a mess on your hands is all. Someone broke into my room. That's right, but that's done. You gobbling down tranquilizers isn't going to change it. What about your passport? Any valuables? Important papers? Because he made her think instead of react, the constriction on her chest loosened. She shook her head. I have my passport with me all the time. I don't travel with anything really valuable, but my laptop. You'll buy another, won't you? Put that way, she could only nod. Yes. He got up to close the door. Do you want to call security? Yes, of course, the police. Take a minute to be sure. You're in a foreign country. A, a police report will generate a lot of red tape, take a lot of time and trouble. And there'd be publicity, I'd imagine. But someone broke into my room. Maybe you should go through your things. He kept his voice calm and practical as he thought it the best way to handle her. It was the way his own mother handled temper fits, and what was hysteria but a kind of temper. Make sure exactly what was taken. He glanced around, then towed a little white machine with his foot. What's this? Air purifier. When he picked it up, set it on the desk, she got shakily to her feet. I can't understand why anyone would do all this for a laptop computer. Maybe they were hoping for more. He wandered to the door of the bathroom, glanced in. He'd already decided the Finns deserved some sort of grand prize for the luxury of their baths. Hers, being her roomless plusher, was more spacious than his, but his didn't lack for details. The heated floor tiles, the jet tub, the glory of the six-headed shower and towels thick and big as blankets. On her long-tiled counter, he saw a half-dozen pill bottles— most of which proved to be some sort of vitamin or herbal remedy. There was an electric toothbrush, a travel candle, a tube of antibacterial cream, packets of something called energy, and more packets of something called de-stress. He counted eight bottles of mineral water. You're a bit of a case, aren't you, darling? She ran a hand over her face. Traveling stressful, it's hard in the system. I have allergies. Do you know? Why don't I help you set this place back to rights? 
Then you can take one of your pills and get some sleep. I couldn't possibly sleep. I need to call hotel security. All right. There was no skin off his nose, really, and would put more of a hitch in her stride than his. Obliging, he went to the phone and called the front desk to relay the situation. He even stayed with her when management and security came. He patted her hand while she spoke to them, cooperatively gave his own version of the evening and his name and address, his passport number. He had, essentially, nothing to hide. It was nearly 2 a.m. before he made it back to his own room. He had a long, neat whiskey, brooded over another. When Tia woke the next morning, muzzy-brained, he was gone. All that was left to assure her he'd existed in the first place was a note slipped under her door. Tia, I hope you're feeling steadier this morning. I'm sorry, but I've had to change my plans, and will have already left Helsinki when you read this. The best of luck with the rest of your travelling. I'll be in touch when I can. Malachi. She sighed, sat on the edge of the bed, and decided she'd never see him again. Three. Malachi called for a meeting the minute he arrived back in Cove. Due to the import, schedules were hastily rearranged and concerned parties made themselves available. He stood at the head of the table as he relayed to his partners the events that took place during his stay in Finland. When the tale was told, he sat, picked up his cup of tea. Well, you dimwit, why didn't you stay and give her another push? Since this came from the youngest partner, who also happened to be his sister, Malachi didn't take particular offense. The meeting table, in the Sullivan tradition, was the kitchen table. Before he answered, he got to his feet again, took the biscuit tin off the counter, and helped himself. First, because pushing would have done more harm than good. The woman has more brains than a cabbage becker. If I'd nudged her about the statues right after she'd had her room tossed, she might very well have thought I'd had something to do with the matter. Which, he added with a scowl, I suppose I did indirectly. We can't blame ourselves for that. We aren't hooligans, after all, or thieves. Gideon was the middle child, nearly dead center at not quite two years younger than Malachi, not quite two older than Rebecca. This accident at birth had more often than not put him in the position of playing peacemaker between them. He was his brother's match in height and build, but had inherited his mother's coloring. The lean, hollow-cheeked features of the Sullivans were stamped on his face, but his were set off with jet-black hair and viking blue eyes. He was, in his way, the most fastidious of the lot. He preferred having everything lined up in tidy columns, and because of it, though Malachi had more of a talent with figures, did duty as family bookkeeper. The trip wasn't wasted, he went on. Neither the time nor the expense of it. You made contact with her, and now we've reason to believe we're not alone in our belief that she might be a likely contact to the fates. We don't know if she is or isn't, Rebecca disagreed. Because it's plain as rain, it was Malachi who led them to her. Better if you'd gone hunting for the one who'd broken into her room instead of running back home. And how, Marty Hari, would you suggest I do that? Malachi queried. Look for clues, she said with a sweep of arms. Interrogate hotel staff. Do something. If only I'd remembered to pack my magnifying glass and deerstalker hat. Exasperated, she sighed. She could see the sense of what he'd done. But when it came to a choice between sense and action, Rebecca would always toss sense. All I see is we're out the price of the travel and no better off than we were before you had your little fling with the yank. We didn't have a fling, Malachi said with the edge of temper in his voice. Well, whose fault is that? She shot back. Seems to me you'd have gotten more out of her if you'd soften her up in bed. Rebecca. The quiet censure came from the balance of power. Eileen Sullivan might have birthed three strong-willed children, but she had been and always would be the power. Ma, the man's thirty-one years old, Rebecca stated sweetly. Surely you're aware he's had sex before. Eileen was a pretty, tidy woman who took great pride in her family and her home, and when necessary, ruled both with an iron fist. This is not a discussion about your brother's private behavior, but a discussion of business. We agreed Ma would go and see what he would see, and so he has. Rebecca subsided, though it wasn't easy. 
She adored her brothers, but there were times she could have bashed their heads together just to shake up their brains a bit. She had the long, lean Sullivan build as well, and could be mistaken for willowy if attention wasn't paid to the strong shoulders and tough muscles under the skin she liked to pamper. Her hair was shades lighter than Malachy's, more a gilded red than chestnut, and her eyes were a softer, mistier green. They were long-lidded and balanced a wide and stubborn mouth and a face more given to angles than curves. Behind the eyes was a sharp, clever, and often impatient brain. She'd campaigned hard to be the one to go to Helsinki and make initial contact with Tia Marsh. She was still fuming at being outvoted in Malachy's favor. You'd have done no better with her, Malachy commented, reading her mind easily. And sex wouldn't have been an option, would it? In any case, we are better off. She liked me, and she's not, I'd say, a woman easily comfortable with people. She's not like you, Becca. He moved around the table as he spoke, tugged on his sister's long, curly hair. She's not adventurous and bold. Don't try to soften me up. He only grinned and tugged her hair again. At your slowest pace, you'd have moved too fast for her. You'd have intimidated her. She's a shy one and a bit of a hypochondriac, I think. You wouldn't have believed the stuff she had. Bottles of pills, little machines, air purifiers, white noisemakers. It was a wonder when we went through it all for the cops. She travels with her own pillow, some allergic matter. Sounds a dead bore to me, Rebecca replied. No, not a bore. Malachy remembered that slow, sober smile. Just a bit nervy is all. Still, when the police got there, she pulled herself together. Went through the report, steady as you please, every step of it. From the time she left the hotel to go to her lecture until she walked back in again. And hadn't, he remembered now, missed a single detail. She's got a brain in there, he mused. Like a camera taking pictures and filing them in a proper slot. And a spine under all the worry. He liked her, Rebecca said. I did. And I'm sorry to have caused her the trouble, but, well... She'll get over it. He sat again, and dumb sugar and the cup of tea he'd let go nearly cold. We'll let that end simmer a bit, at least until she's back in the States and settled. Then I might take a trip to New York. New York! Rebecca sprang to her feet. Why do you get to go everywhere? Because I'm the oldest. And because, for better or worse, Tia Marsh is mine. We'll be more careful with step two, since it appears our movements are being watched. One of us ought to go deal with that bitch directly, Rebecca said. She stole from us, stole what had been in our family for more than three quarters of a century, and now she's trying to use us to find the other two pieces. She needs to be told, in no uncertain terms, that the Sullivans won't stand for it. What she'll do is pay, Malachy leaned back. And dearly, when we have the other two fates and she only the one. The one she stole from us. It'd be hard explaining to the proper authorities that she stole what had already been stolen. Gideon held up a hand before Rebecca could snap at him. Eighty-odd years in the past or not, Felix Greenfield stole the first fate. I think we could come around that legally, as there's no one to know it save us. But on the same point, we've no real proof that the statue was in our possession, and that someone with Anita Gay's reputation would steal it from under our noses. Rebecca gave a little sigh. It's mortifying she did, as if we were little woolly lambs led dancing to the slaughter. Separate, that statue's worth no more than a few hundred thousand pounds. Because it still grated, Malachy put aside how easily he'd been duped out of the little fate. But all three together, that's priceless to the right collector. Anita Gay's the right one, and in the end it's her wool that'll be fleeced. Sitting in the cheerful butter-yellow kitchen with his granny's chintz curtains at the window and the smell of summer grass dancing through them, he thought of just what he'd like to do to the woman who'd stolen the family symbol out of his foolish hands. I don't think we should wait to take step two, he decided. Tia won't be back in New York for a couple of weeks yet, and I don't want to show up on her doorstep too soon. What we need to do now is work on unraveling that thread to the second statue. Rebecca shook back her hair. Some of us haven't been spending their time kicking up their heels in foreign parts. I've done quite a bit of unravelling in the last few days. Why the hell didn't you say so?
whilst you've been blathering on about your new Yang sweetheart. Oh, for Christ's sake, Becca. Don't take the Lord's name at my table, Eileen said mildly. Rebecca, stop deviling your brother and preening. I wasn't preening, yet. I've been searching on the internet doing the genealogy and so on. Day and night, by the way, and a great personal sacrifice. That was preening, she said with a grin to her mother. Still, it's a big leap, as all we have to go on is Felix's memory of what he read on the paper with the statue. The dip in the ocean washed the ink away, and we're counting on him being clear about what he read before what had to be the most traumatic experience of his life. More were counting on his veracity, she decided. And the man was, after all, a thief. Reformed, Eileen put in, by the grace of God and the love of a good woman, or so the story goes. So it goes, Rebecca agreed. With the statue was a piece of paper, with a name and address in London. His claim that he committed it to memory as he thought he might stop by one night and ply his trade seems reasonable enough. More reasonable when I roll up my sleeves at the keyboard and find there was indeed a Simon White Smith living in Mansfield Park in 1915. You found him, Malachy beamed at her. You're a wonder, Rebecca. I am, as I found more than that. He had a son, name of James, who had two daughters, both married, but the one lost her husband in the Second Great War and died childless. The other moved to the States, as her husband was a well-to-do lawyer in Washington, D.C. They had three children, two sons and a daughter. They lost one son when he was just a lad in Vietnam. The other hightailed it to Canada, and I haven't been able to get a line on him. But the daughter married three times. Can you beat it? She's living in Los Angeles. She had one child with husband number one, a daughter. I tracked her down, too, on the information highway. She's living at the moment in Prague. With employment at some club there. Well, Prague's closer than Los Angeles, Malachy replied. Couldn't have just stayed in London, could they? We're taking a leap of faith here that the man White Smith had the statue to begin with, or knew how to get it. That if he had it, it's been kept in the family, or there's a record where it went. And that all being the case, we can finagle it out of their hands. It was a leap of faith when your great great grandfather gave his life jacket to a stranger and her child. Eileen put in. To my mind, there's a reason he was spared when so many were lost. A reason why that little statue was in his pocket when he was saved. Because of that, it belongs to this family. She continued with her cool, unshakable logic. And as it's part of a piece, the others should come to us as well. It's not the money, it's the principle. We can afford a ticket to Prague to see if there's an answer there. She smiled serenely at her daughter. What's the name of the club, darling? The name of the club was Down Under, and it escaped the sloppy slide down to dive due to the vigilance of its proprietor, Marcella Lubriski. Whenever the joint would start to waver, Marcella would kick it back up to level by the toe of her stiletto heel. She was a product of her country and her time, part Czech, part Slavic, with a drop of Russian and a whiff of German in the blood. When the communists had taken over, She'd gathered up her two young children, told her husband to go or stay, and fled to Australia, as it seemed just far enough away. She'd had no English, no contacts, the equivalent of two hundred dollars tucked in her bra, and, as her husband had opted to remain in Prague, no father for her babies. What she'd had was spine, a shrewd mind, and the body fashioned for wet dreams. She'd put all of them to use in a strip joint in Sydney, taking it off for the drunk and the lonely and ruthlessly banking her meager pay as well as her substantial tips. She'd learned to love the Aussies for their generosity, their humor, and their easy acceptance of the outcast. She saw that her children were well fed, and if she occasionally took a private job to see that they also had good shoes, it was only sex. Within five years, she had enough socked away to invest in a small club with partners. She still stripped. She still sold her body when it suited her. Within ten years, she bought out her partners and retired from the stage. By the time the wall came down, Marcella owned the club in Sydney, one in Melbourne, 
a percentage of an office complex and a good chunk of a residential apartment building. She had been pleased to see the communists ousted from the land of her birth, but had given the matter little thought at first. But she'd begun to wonder and, to her surprise, to yearn to hear her own language spoken in the streets, to see the domes and bridges of her own city. Leaving her son and daughter in charge of her Australian holdings, Marcella flew back to Prague for what she assumed would be a sentimental journey. But the businesswoman in her smelled opportunity, and opportunities were not to be wasted. Prague would once more be a city that mixed old world and new, would once again become the Paris of Eastern Europe. That meant commerce, tourist dollars, and getting in on the ground floor. She bought property, a small atmospheric hotel, a quaint traditional restaurant, and out of that sentiment for both her homelands, she opened down under. She ran a clean place with healthy girls. She didn't mind if they took private jobs. She knew very well that sex often paid for the extras that made life bearable. But if there was a hint of drug use, employee or customer, the offender was shown the door. There were no second chances at Down Under. She developed a cordial relationship with the local police, regularly attended the opera, and became a patron of the arts. She watched her city come to life again with color, with music, and with money. Though she claimed she intended to return to Sydney, years passed, and she stayed. At sixty, she maintained the body that had made her fortune. Dressed in the latest Paris fashions, and could spot a troublemaker at ten yards in the dark. When Gideon Sullivan walked in, she gave him one long stare, too handsome for his own good, she decided. And his gaze scanned the room rather than the stage, looking for something other than pretty bouncing breasts, or someone. The club was slicker than he'd expected. There was plenty of bass-heavy techno music blaring and lights flashing in concert. On stage, a trio of women were performing some sort of routine on long silver poles. He supposed some men liked to imagine their dick as the pole, but Gideon could think of better uses for his than having a woman hanging upside down on it. There were plenty of tables, and all of them occupied. The ones nearest the stage were jammed with both men and women sipping drinks. And watching the naked acrobatics, hazy blue smoke fogged in the light streams. But the smell of whiskey and beer was no more offensive than in his own local pub. A lot of the clientele wore black, and a lot of the black was leather. But there were enough obvious couples to make him wonder why a man would bring a date along to watch other women strip. Though the place was somehow more middle class than the dive he and Malachi had spent one memorable evening in on a trip to London. He was glad his mother had sent him over Rebecca's furious objections rather than his sister. This was no place for a young woman of good family, though apparently Cleo Tolliver found it suitable enough. He moved to the bar, ordered a beer. He could see the dancers down to g-strings and tattoos now, as they swung in unison on their poles in the mirrors behind it. He took out a cigarette, struck a match, and considered his best approach. He preferred the direct route whenever possible. As applause and whistles broke out, he gestured to the bartender. Cleo Tolliver working tonight. Why? Family connection. The man didn't respond to Gideon's easy smile, but only mopped at the bar, shrugged. She's around. And moved off before Gideon could ask where. So he'd wait. Gideon thought. There were worse ways for a man to spend his time than watching well-built women peel off their clothes. You looking for one of my girls? Gideon turned from the performer who was currently crawling over the stage like a cat. The woman who stood beside him was nearly as tall as he was. Her hair was Harlow blonde and coiled in complicated lacquered twists. She wore a business suit without a blouse, and the milky tops of her rather amazing breasts. Spilled out between the lapels, he felt a twinge of guilt for noticing them when he looked at her face and realized she was more than old enough to be his mother. Yes, ma'am, I'm looking for Cleo Tolliver. Marcella's brows lifted at the polite address, and she signaled for a drink. Why? Begging your pardon, I'd rather speak to Miss Tolliver about that if it's all the same to you. 
Without glancing at the bar, Marcella lifted the neat scot she knew would be there. Might be handsome as sin, she mused, and have the look of a man who could handle himself in a fight. But he'd been raised to be respectful to his elders. While she didn't necessarily trust such niceties, she appreciated them. You caused trouble for one of my girls, I caused trouble for you. I'd as soon avoid trouble altogether. See you do. Cleo is the next act. She downed her scotch, set down the empty, and strolled away on her ice-pick heels. She made her way backstage through the smell of perfume, sweat, and face paint. Her dancers shared one room lined on both sides with long mirrors and communal counters. Each made her own nest out of a section so that the counters were a messy sea of cosmetics, pasties, stuffed toys, and candy. Photographs of boyfriends, film stars, and the occasional toddler were pasted to the mirrors. As usual, the room was a gaggle of languages, of bitching, gossip, and complaints. Complaints ranged from cheap tips, cheating lovers, and menstrual cramps to aching feet. In the midst of it, like a cool island... Cleo stood putting the last pins in her long, sable-colored hair. She was friendly enough with the other girls, Marcella thought, but not friends with them. She did her work and did it well, collected her money, and went home alone. So, Marcella remembered, had she in her time. There is a man asking about you. Cleo's eyes, a deep, dark brown, met Marcella's in the mirror. Asking what? Just asking. He's handsome, maybe thirty, Irish. Dark hair, blue eyes, well-mannered. Cleo shrugged shoulders, currently covered in a conservative gray pinstripe suit jacket. I don't know anyone like that. He asked for you by name, told Carl you were a family connection. Cleo leaned forward to slick murderous red over her lips. I don't think so. You in trouble... She shot the cuffs of the tailored white shirt she wore under the jacket. No. If he gives you any, just signal to Carl. He'll show him out. Marcella nodded. The Irishman's at the bar. You won't miss him. Cleo slipped into the spike-heeled black pumps that completed her costume. Thanks, I can handle him. I think this is so. Marcella laid a hand on her shoulder briefly then moved on to break up an argument between two of the dancers over a red-spangled bra. If she was concerned someone had come in and asked for her by name, Cleo didn't show it. She was, after all, a professional. Whether dancing Swan Lake or peeling it off for Euro trash, there were professional standards for a performer. She didn't know any Irishman, she thought, as she clipped out to wait for her cue, and she certainly didn't buy that anyone remotely connected to her family would trouble themselves to ask about her even if they'd tripped over her bleeding body in the street. Probably just some asshole, she decided, who'd gotten her name from another customer and thought he might wrangle a cheap boink from an American stripper. He was going to go home disappointed. As her music came up, she pushed all thoughts but her routine out of her head. She counted the beats, and when the lights flashed on, Cleo erupted onto the stage. At the bar, Gideon's hand froze in the act of lifting his beer. She was dressed like a man, though no one would mistake her for one, he admitted. Not if he were blind and on the back of a galloping horse. But there was something primitively erotic about the way she moved inside that traditional pinstripe suit. The music was hot, edgy American rock, and her lighting a steamy and smoky blue. He found it clever and ironic that she'd select Bruce Springsteen's Cover Me to strip to. She knew what she was about, he realized, as she tugged the tailored jacket off her shoulders, moving, always moving, pulled it off. While the others on the stage had been spinning or sliding, shaking or shimmying, this one was dancing. Sharp, complicated moves that demonstrated genuine talent and style. Though when, with one of those sharp moves, she ripped the breakaway trousers aside... He lost track of the style for a moment. Christ, she had legs, didn't she? She used the poles as well, doing three fast circles with those long legs cocked up. Her hair tumbled free, past her shoulders in a straight rainfall of rich brown. He didn't see how she opened the shirt, but it was flying around her now, revealing a scrap of black lace 
over high, firm breasts. He tried to tell himself they were likely manufactured, and either way they had nothing to do with him. But he found saliva pooling in his mouth when she stripped off the shirt. To clear his throat, he sipped his beer and watched her. She'd made him from her first turn. She couldn't see him clearly and wasn't concerned enough to worry about it. But she knew he was there and that his attention was on her. That was fine. That's what she got paid for. With her back to the audience, she slid a hand down her back, flicked open the catch of her bra. Crossing her arms over her breasts, she spun back. There was a light dew of sweat on her skin now and a small grin, ice cold, on her lips as she made eye contact with the men in the audience she deemed most likely to part with folded money. She tossed her hair back and, wearing nothing but the heels and a black G-string, lowered to a crouch so that they could see what they were paying for. She ignored the fingers sliding over her hips and registered the money tucked under the G-string. She eased back when one over-enthusiastic patron reached for her. In a move that could have been mistaken for playful, she wagged a finger at him and thought, asshole. She came up in a one-armed backbend, then using her legs surged to her feet. She played the other side of the stage in much the same way. But here she got a better look at the man at the bar. Their eyes met, held for two beats. He held up a bill, cocked his head. Then he went back to sipping his beer. She wished she'd been able to make the denomination of the bill but she thought it might be worth five minutes of her time to find out how much he'd pay. Still, she took her time, cooled off in the shower, then pulled on jeans and a T-shirt. It was a rare thing for her to go out into the club after a performance, but she trusted Carl and the other muscle Marcella kept on tap to keep her from being hassled. In any case, most of the patrons kept their attention on stage toward the fantasy sex, rather than scoping out the real women in the area. Except for Slick, she thought, at the bar. He wasn't watching the stage. Though in her professional opinion the current act was one of the more creative ones. His gaze stayed on her as she crossed to the bar, and on her face, which she gave him points for, rather than on her tits. You want something, Slick? Her voice surprised him. It was smooth and silky and without any of the hard edge he'd expected from a woman in her line of work. Her face did credit to her body. It was hot and sultry with those dark almond-shaped eyes and the full, red-slicked mouth. There was a little mole, a beauty mark, he supposed you called it, just at the lower end of her right eyebrow. Her skin was dusky, adding a touch of erotic gypsy. She smelled of soap, another illusion shattered and sipped idly from a tall bottle of water. I do of your Cleo Tolliver. She leaned back on the bar. She wore tennis shoes now rather than heels, but the jeans were black and molded tight to her hips and legs. I don't do private parties. Do you talk? When I have something to say, who gave you my name? Gideon merely showed her the bill again, watched her gaze flick on it and narrow in speculation. I think this should buy an hour's conversation. It might. She'd reserved judgment on whether or not he was a moron, but at least he wasn't cheap. She reached for the bill, annoyed when he moved it just out of reach. What time do you finish here? Two. Look, why don't you just tell me what you want, and I'll tell you if I'm interested. Conversation. He said again, and tore the bill in half. He handed her one part, pocketed the other. If you want the rest of it... Meet me after closing. The coffee shop in the Wenceslas Hotel. I'll wait till 2.30. If you don't show, we're both out 50 pounds. He finished his beer, set down the glass. It was an entertaining performance, Miss Tolliver, and lucrative from the looks of it. But it's not every day you can make 50 pounds by sitting down and having a cup of coffee. She frowned when he turned to walk away. You got a name, Slick. Sullivan. Gideon Sullivan, you've got to 2.30. Four. Cleo never missed a cue, but neither did she believe in giving her audience the appearance she'd rushed to hit one. 
Theater was rooted in illusions, and life, like the big guy had said, was just a bigger stage. She strolled toward the coffee shop at two minutes to deadline. If some jerk with a pretty face and a sexy voice wanted to pay her for some conversation, that was fine by her. She'd already determined the exchange rate from Irish pounds to check corona, using the little calculator she carried in her bag to figure it to the last hollera. In her current position, the money would go a very long way. She didn't intend to make her living stripping off her clothes for a bunch of suckers for long. The fact was, she'd never intended to make her living, however temporary, dancing naked in a prog strip club. But she'd been stupid, Cleo could admit. She'd walked straight into a con, blinded by good looks and a clever line. And when a girl was flat-ass busted in Eastern Europe, in a city where she could barely manage the simplest phrase in the guidebook, she did what she could to make ends meet. She had one thing on her side, she thought now. She never made the same mistake twice. In that regard, at least, she was not her mother's daughter. The little restaurant was brightly lit, and there were a few patrons scattered around the tables having coffee or a late meal. The company, such as it was, was a plus. Not that she was particularly worried about the Irish guy making a move on her. She could handle herself. She spotted him at a corner booth, drinking coffee and reading a book, with a cigarette smoking away in a black, plastic ashtray. With those dark, romantic looks, she thought he'd pass for some kind of artist, a writer, maybe. No, she decided, a poet. Some struggling poet who wrote dark, esoteric free verse, and had come to the great city for inspiration, as others had before him. Looks, she thought with a smirk, were always deceiving. He glanced up as she slid into the booth across from him. His eyes, a deep and crystal blue in the poetic face, were the type that shot straight to a woman's glands. Good thing, Cleo acknowledged. She was immune. You caught a close, he commented, and continued to read. She merely shrugged, then turned to the waitress who stepped up to the booth. Coffee, three eggs scrambled, bacon toast. Thanks. Cleo smiled when she saw Gideon studying her over the top of his book. I'm hungry. I suppose what you do works up an appetite. He marked his place, set the book aside. Yates, Cleo noted. It figured. That's the point, isn't it, working up appetites? She stretched out her legs as the waitress poured her coffee. How did you like my act? It's better than most. She hadn't removed her stage makeup. In the bright lights, she looked both hard and sexy. He imagined she knew it, had planned it. Why do you do it? Unless you're a Broadway scout slick, that's my business. Watching him, she lifted a hand, rubbed her thumb and two fingers together. Gideon took the half bill out of his pocket, then slid it under his book. Talk first. He'd already outlined how he wanted to approach the matter with her and decided the direct, well, fairly direct route would work best. You have an ancestor on your mother's side, a Simon White Smith. More puzzled than interested, Cleo sipped her coffee, strong and black. So? He was a collector, art and artifacts. There was a piece in his collection, a small silver statue of a woman, Greek style. I represent a party that's interested in obtaining that statue. Cleo said nothing as her breakfast was served. The scent of food, particularly food she wasn't going to have to pay for, put her in a cooperative mood. She scooped up a bite of egg, picked up a slice of bacon. Why? Why? Yeah. This client got a reason for wanting some little silver woman? Sentimental reasons, primarily. There was a man back in 1915 who was traveling to London to purchase it from your ancestor. He made an unwise choice in his mode of transportation, Gideon added as he helped himself to Cleo's bacon, and booked passage on the Lusitania. He went down with it. Cleo studied the selection of jams and settled on black currant. She slathered a slice of toast generously as her mind worked through the story. Her grandmother on her mother's side, the one family member who'd been human and humorous, had been a white smith by birth 
so his story gelled as far as it went. Your interested parties waited over eighty years to track down the statue. Some were more sentimental than others, he said evenly. You could say this man's fate was determined by that small statue. My job is to locate it, and if it remains in your family, to offer a reasonable price for it. Why me? Why not contact my mother? Your generation closer that way. You were closer geographically. But if you've no knowledge of the piece, that's my next step. Your client sounds pretty screwy, slick. Her lips curved as she bit into her toast. Her eyebrows winged up, making the beauty mark a velvet period and a sexy exclamation point. What's his definition of a reasonable price? I'm authorized to offer five hundred pounds. Pounds. Jesus, Jesus, she thought as she continued to eat with every appearance of calm. That kind of money would fatten her get out of Dodge fund. More, it would help her get back to the states without losing face. But the man must have tagged her as an idiot if he thought she was buying his story from top to bottom. A silver statue, of a woman, he said, about six inches high, holding a kind of measuring spool. Do you know it or not? Don't rush me. She signaled for more coffee and continued to plow her way through the eggs. I might have seen it. My family has a lot of dust catchers, and my grandmother was the world title holder. I can check on it if you add another fifty to that. She said with a nod toward the note sticking out from under Yates. Don't wind me up, Cleo. A girl's got to make a living, and the extra fifty is less than it would cost your client to send you to the states. Plus, my family is more likely to cooperate with me than a stranger, which was bullshit, of course. She thought. Considering his options, Gideon slid the half bill across the table. You get the other fifty if and when you earn it. Come by the club tomorrow night. She plucked up the bill, stuffed it into her jeans pocket. Not an easy feat, Gideon mused, as those jeans appeared to be painted on. Bring the money. She slid out of the booth. Thanks for the eggs, Slick. Cleo. He closed a hand over hers, squeezed just hard enough to be sure he had her attention. You try to hose me. It's going to make me irritable. I'll remember that. She tossed him an easy grin, tugged her hand free, then strolled out with a deliberate swing of hips. She made a statement. Gideon mused, "Any man with a single red corpuscle would want to fuck her, but only a fool would trust her." Eileen Sullivan hadn't raised any fools. Cleo went straight to her apartment. Though calling the single room an apartment was like calling a Twinkie a fine dessert, you had to be either really young or stupidly optimistic. Her clothes were hung on the iron rod that was screwed into a water-stained wall, stuffed into the banana crate-sized dresser with its missing drawer, or tossed where they'd landed. She decided the problem with growing up with a maid was you never learned to be tidy. Even with its single dresser, cot-sized bed, and lopsided table, the room was crowded. But it was cheap and boasted its own bath, such as it was. While the room wasn't to her taste, and she was neither really young nor in any way optimistic, she could cover the weekly rent with one night's tips. She'd installed the deadbolt lock herself after one of her neighbors had tried to muscle his way into her room for a free show. It gave her a considerable sense of security. She switched on the light, tossed her purse aside. She went to the dresser. Pawing her way through the top drawer, she'd had a considerable wardrobe when she'd landed in Prague, and a great deal of it had been new lingerie. Bought, she thought viciously as she shoved through silk and lace to delight one Sidney Walter, the prick. Then again, when a woman let herself spend a couple grand on undies because she was hot for a man, she deserved getting screwed in every possible sense. Sidney had certainly obliged her. Cleo thought now. Heating up the sheets in the presidential suite of the priciest hotel in Prague, then strolling away with all her cash, her jewelry, and leaving her with a hefty hotel bill. Leaving her, she added, flat, broke, and mortified. Still, Sidney wasn't the only one who could cash in on an opportunity when it slapped him in the face. 
She smiled to herself as she yanked out a pair of athletic socks, unrolled them. The little silver statue she uncovered was badly tarnished, but she remembered what it looked like when it was shiny and clean. Smiling to herself, Cleo rubbed a thumb over the face with absent affection. You don't look much like my ticket out of here, she murmured, but we'll see. She didn't show until nearly two the following afternoon. Gideon had just about given up on her. As it was, he nearly didn't recognize her when she finally came out into the broiling sunlight. She wore jeans, a low-cut black top that offered peaks of her midriff. So it was her body he made first. She'd pulled her hair back in a thick braid, shielded her eyes with dark wraparound glasses, and, walking briskly in some sort of thick-soled black boots, melded with pedestrian traffic. About damn time, he thought, as he followed her. He'd been stuck kicking his heels for hours waiting for her. Here he was in one of the most beautiful, most cultured cities in Eastern Europe, and he couldn't risk the time to see anything. He wanted to drop in on the MUCA exhibit, to study the Art Nouveau foyer of the main station, to wander among the artists on the Charles Bridge. Because the woman apparently slept half the day, he'd had to make do with reading a guidebook. She didn't window shop, never paused at the displays of crystal or garnets that flashed in the brilliant sunlight. She walked steadily, down sidewalks, over the cobbled bricks of squares and gave her shadow little time to admire the domes, the Baroque architecture, or Gothic towers. She stopped once at a sidewalk kiosk and bought a large bottle of water, which she stuffed in the oversized purse on her shoulder. Gideon regretted, when she kept up, the clipped pace and the sweat began to run down his back, that he hadn't followed her lead. He cheered a bit when he realized she was heading toward the river. Maybe he'd get a look at the Charles after all. They passed pretty painted shops thronged with tourists, restaurants where people sat under umbrella tables and cooled off with chilled drinks or ice cream, and still those long legs of hers climbed steadily up the steep slope to the bridge. The breeze off the water did little to bring relief, and the view, while spectacular, didn't explain what the hell she was doing. She didn't so much as glance at the grandeur of Prague Castle or the cathedral, never paused to lean on the rail and contemplate the water and the boats that plied it. She certainly didn't stop to haggle with the artists. She crossed the bridge and kept going. He was trying to decide if she was heading to the castle, and if so, why the hell she hadn't taken a bloody bus when she reared off and walked breezily downhill to the street of tiny cottages where the king's goldsmiths and alchemists had once lived. They were shops now, naturally, but that didn't detract from the charm of low doorways, narrow windows, and faded colors. She cut through the tourists and tour groups as the uneven stone street climbed again. She turned again, walked onto the patio of a little restaurant, and plopped down at a table. Before he could decide what to do next, she turned around in her chair and waved at him. "'Buy me a beer!' she called out. He ground his teeth as she turned away again, stretched out her long, apparently tireless legs, then signaled to the waiter by holding up two fingers. When he sat across from her, she offered a wide smile. "'Pretty hot today, huh? What the hell was this all about?' "'What?' Oh, this? I figured if you were going to follow me around, the least I could do was show you a little of the city. I was planning to hike up to the castle, but... She tipped down her glasses and studied his face. It was a little sweaty, a lot pissed off, and down to the ground, gorgeous. I figured you could use a beer about now. If you wanted to play tour guide, you could have picked a nice cool museum or cathedral. Hot and cranky, are we? She tipped her sunglasses back in place. If you felt compelled to follow me, you could have asked me to show you around today and bought me lunch. Do you think about anything but eating? I need a lot of protein. I said I'd meet up with you tonight. You tailing me like this makes me think you don't trust me. He said nothing, just stared at her stonily as the beers were served and he downed half of his in one long swallow. What do you know about the statue? he said, when he set his glass down. 
Enough to figure you wouldn't have followed me on a two-mile jaunt in high summer if it wasn't worth a lot more to you than five hundred pounds. So here's what I want. She paused, snagged the waiter again, and ordered another round of beer and a strawberry sundae. You can't eat ice cream with beer, Gideon said. Sure you can. That's the beauty of ice cream. It goes with anything, any time. Anyway, back to business. I want five thousand USD. And a first-class ticket back to New York. He lifted his glass again and polished off the first beer. You're not going to get it. Fine. Then you don't get the girl. I can get you a thousand once I see the girl, and maybe five hundred more when she's in my hands. That's the cap. I don't think so. She clucked her tongue when he pulled out his cigarettes. Sucking on those is why you had trouble with an afternoon stroll. Afternoon stroll, my ass. He blew out a stream of smoke while the fresh beers and her ice cream were served. You eat like that on a regular basis, you're going to be fat as a hog. Metabolism, she said with a mouthful of ice cream. Mine runs like a rabbit. What's the name of your client? You don't need names, and you needn't think they'll deal with you directly. You go through me, Cleo. Five thousand. She said again and licked her spoon, and a first-class flight back home. You come up with that, I'll get you the statue. I told you not to hose me. She's wearing a robe, right shoulder bared, with her hair in a curly updo. She's wearing sandals and she's smiling just a little, sort of pensive. He closed a hand over her wrist. I don't negotiate till I see her. You don't see her till you negotiate. He had good, strong hands. She appreciated that in a man. There were enough calluses on them to tell her he worked with them, and he didn't make his living hunting up art pieces for sentimental clients. You've got to get me home if you want her, don't you? It was reasonable. She'd spent time working out the reasonable angles. To go home, I've got to quit my job, so I need enough money to tide me over until I get another one back in New York. I imagine there's plenty of tip bars in New York. Yeah. Her voice chilled. I imagine there are. It's your choice of profession, Cleo. So spare me the hurt feelings. I need proof she exists, that you know where she is, and that you can acquire her. We don't move forward on terms until that time. Fine, you'll get your proof. Pay the check, slick. It's a long walk back. He waved a hand for the waiter, and reached for his wallet. We'll have a taxi. She brooded at the side window of the taxi on the drive back. Her feelings weren't hurt, she told herself. She did honest work, didn't she? Hard, honest work. What did she care if some Irish jerk looked down his nose at her? He didn't know anything about her, who she was, what she was, what she needed. If he thought her feelings got bruised because of one rude comment, he was underestimating her. She'd spent nearly her entire life as an outcast from her own family. A stranger's opinion didn't matter to her. She'd get him his proof, and he'd pay her price. She'd sell him the statue. She didn't know why the hell she'd kept the damn thing all these years anyway. Good luck for her, she had. She decided. The little lady was going to get her home and give her some breathing space until she snagged a few auditions. She'd have to shine the thing up, then she'd sweet talk Marcella into letting her use that little digital camera and the computer. She'd take a picture, then send it through, print it out. Sullivan wouldn't know where it came from, and he'd never guess she had what he wanted tucked in her purse for safekeeping. Figured he was dealing with a loser, did he? Well, he was sure going to find out different. She shifted as they made the turn toward her building. Come by the club, she said without looking at him. Bring cash. We'll do business. Cleo, he clamped a hand on her wrist as she pushed open the cab door. I apologize. For what? For making an insulting comment. Forget it. She climbed out, headed straight toward her building. Funny, she thought. The apology had gotten under her skin even more than the insult. She turned on her heel and headed down the block again without going back to her apartment. 
She'd go to the club a little early, she decided, after a quick stop for some silver polish. It was still shy of seven when she walked in. She skirted the stage and headed down the short hall that led to Marcella's office. Marcella answered the knock with a quick bark that made Clea wince. Asking Marcella for a favor was always problematic, but asking when Marcella was in a snarly mood could be downright dangerous. Still, Cleo poked her head into the ruthlessly organized office. Sorry to interrupt. If you were sorry, you would not interrupt. Marcella continued to hammer at the computer keyboard on her desk. I have work. I am a businesswoman. Yes, I know. What do you know? You dance, you strip. This is not business. Business is papers and figures and brains, she said, tapping a finger on the side of her head. Anybody can strip. Sure, but not everybody can strip so people will pay to watch. Your doors increased since I stepped on stage and took my clothes off in here. Marcella peered over the straight rims of her half glasses. You want raise? Sure. Then you're stupid to ask for one when I'm busy and in bad mood. But I didn't, Cleo pointed out and closed the door behind her. You asked. I just want a favor, a very small favor. No extra night off this week. I don't want a night off. In fact, I'll trade you an extra hour on stage for the favor. Now Marcella gave Cleo her full attention. The books could wait. I thought it was a small favor. It is, but it could be important to me. I just want to borrow your digital camera for one picture and your computer to send it. It'll take, what, ten minutes? You get an hour back. That's a good trade. You send a picture out for another job. You want to use my things to get work in another club? No, it's not for a job, Christ. Cleo huffed out a breath. Look, you gave me a break when I was in trouble. You gave me some professional pointers and helped me through the first night's queasies. You dealt straight with me. You deal straight with everybody. Going behind your back to a competitor isn't how I pay that back. Marcella pursed her slick red lips, nodded. What do you need to take a picture of? It's just a thing. It's a business deal. When Marcella's gaze narrowed, Cleo sighed. It's not illegal. I've got something someone wants to buy, but I don't trust him enough to let him know I've got it with me. At Marcella's steely stare, Cleo dug into her bag. Nag, 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 she muttered under her breath. There's nothing wrong with my hearing or my English. This. Cleo held up the newly polished statue. Let me see. Marcella wagged a finger until Cleo walked over and put it in her hand. Silver. Very nice. Needs polishing. I got most of the gunk off. You should care better for your things. Sloppy. This is pretty. She mused and tapped at it with a red slicked fingernail. Solid silver? Yeah, it's solid. Where do you get? It's been in my family for years. I've had it since I was a kid. And this man, the Irishman, she assumed. He wants it. Apparently. Why? I'm not sure. He's got a story that may or may not be true. Doesn't matter to me. I've got it. He'll pay for it. Can I use the equipment? Yes, yes. This is an heirloom. Marcella frowned as she turned the statue over in her palm. You would sell your heirloom. Heirlooms only count if family counts. Marcella set the statue on the desk where it glinted in the lamplight. That is a hard heart, Cleo. Maybe. Cleo waited while Marcella unlocked a desk drawer, took out the camera. But it's also a hard truth. Get your picture, then put on your costume. You can put in the extra hour now. Thirty minutes later, Cleo zipped up the tight black leather skirt that went with the bustier and silver-studded black jacket. The little whip worked well with the outfit, and Cleo gave it a testing flick that made the other girls jump and bitch at her. Sorry. Turning to the mirror, 
She straightened the dog collar she'd strapped around her neck and ran a hand over the hair she'd sleeked back into a tight bun at the base of her neck. A couple of good head shakes would free it, so she'd have to be careful it didn't tumble down off cue. She added a little more black eyeliner, then practiced pivots and plies in the high-heeled boots. She was executing a spread leg squat, shifting her weight from side to side when Gideon burst in. Several of the girls called out comments or made kissing noises. Let's go. He snagged her hand and hauled her to her feet. Go? Let's move, I'll explain later. I'm on in three minutes. Not tonight you're not. When he started to drag her to the door, she shifted her body, angled it, and jammed an elbow into his gut. Hands off. God damn it! He'd think about the pain later and how to pay her back for it. But for now he caught his breath as the others in the dressing area cheered and whistled. They've already been to your place. Your landlady's in the hospital with a concussion. They can't be more than five minutes behind me. What the hell are you talking about? She took a step back from him. Another. Who's been to my place? Somebody who wants a particular item and isn't as nice as I am about how they get it. He grabbed her arm again. They slapped your landlady around before they bashed her in the head. You want to wait for them to try it with you, or are you coming with me? You've got ten seconds to decide. Impulse, Cleo thought, had always gotten her in trouble. Why should tonight be any different? She snagged her purse. Let's go. He moved fast, heading out into the corridor, then dragging her to the right. No, not out the front, he said. They could already be out there. We'll, we'll go out the back. Back door locks from the inside. We go out that way and there's trouble. We can't get back in. He nodded, then opened the back door far enough to look out. The alleyway dead-ended to the left, and didn't that just figure? But he could see nothing and no one at the mouth of it. How fast can you move in those things? He asked, gesturing toward the boots. I can keep up with you, Slick. Then move! He pulled her out, kept a hand like a vice on her arm as he jogged down to where the alley opened onto the street. When they came out on the street, he shot a quick glance in either direction, swore, and turned a hard right. He slid an arm around her waist. Just keep walking. Two men across the street, one heading toward the club, the other for the alley. Don't look back! But she already had, and made both of them quickly enough. We could take them. Christ, just walk. If we're lucky, they didn't see us come out that way. At the corner, he glanced back. So much for luck. He switched his grip to her hand. Here's your chance to prove you can keep up. He ran, and when they were halfway down the block, yanked her out in the street and across traffic. Brakes squealed, horns blasted. Cleo felt the wind from a fender that missed her by inches. You crazy son of a bitch. But when she looked back, she saw a man trying to thread his way between cars. She didn't slow down. The heels of her boots skidded and slipped over the uneven bricks. If she could have spared ten seconds, she'd have dragged them off and run barefoot. There's only one, she called out. There are two of us. The other's somewhere. Following instinct, he pulled her into a restaurant raced with her past a number of startled diners and through the kitchen and out the back onto the narrow street. Oh, baby! It was nearly a prayer when he spotted the sleek black motorcycle parked against the back of the building. Give me a hairpin. You start that thing with a hairpin, I'll kiss your ass. But panting a bit, she dragged one out of her hair. Her hair tumbled free as he used the pin to pry off the ignition box. Within ten seconds, he had it hot-wired and was swinging his leg over. Get on. You can kiss my ass at a more private moment. Her skirt hiked up to crotch level as she climbed on, so her black G-string pressed snug against his butt. He ignored that as best he could, and the way her breasts pressed into his back as he whipped the bike into a tight circle and flew toward the mouth of the alley with the roar of a serious engine. She strapped her arms around him and let out a whoop when they shot down the street. At the corner, he nearly ran over the toes of the man who'd pursued them. 
Cleo got a good close look at his shocked and furious face and laughed wildly as Gideon leaned into the turn. They've got a car, she called out, straining to see behind her as the wind whipped her hair into her face. The other guy must have gotten the car, the one you nearly creamed getting in it. That's all right. Gideon swung around another corner, punched it, then bulleted down the first side street. We'll lose them on this. Using the map in his head, he maneuvered out of the city. He wanted an open road, the dark and the quiet. He wanted five damn minutes to think. Hey, Slick. Her voice was close to his ear. He could smell her, a pungent and erotic combination of female and leather. He could be sure now that her breasts, and they were beauties, were the ones God had given her. What? I've got to concentrate here. You just go right ahead. I wanted you to know I'm not interested in the five thousand anymore. You don't sell that statue to me. They'll keep after you. We'll talk about the why of that when we're not so busy. She looked behind her at the lights and glow of Prague, but the five thousands off the table. She leaned into him again, because I just became your fucking partner. To seal the deal, she nipped lightly at his ear and laughed. Five. You lost track of them. Anita Gay leaned back against the butter-soft leather of her desk chair and examined her manicure. The phone call did not please her. Were my instructions unclear? She asked in a low, silky voice. Which part of locate the woman and find out what she knows didn't you understand? Excuses, she thought, as she listened to her employee's apologetic explanation. Incompetence. It was really very annoying. Mr. Jasper, she interrupted in the most pleasant of tones. I believe I told you by any means. Do you need a definition of that phrase? No. Well then, I suggest you find them and quickly, or I'll be forced to think you're not half as clever as a second-rate Irish tour guide. She broke the connection. Then, to calm herself, swiveled in the chair to gaze out at her view of New York. She enjoyed being able to watch the noise and bustle of the city, while being removed from it. She enjoyed more knowing she could leave her plush corner of the elegant brownstone, stroll directly onto Madison Avenue, wander into any of the Tony shops, and have whatever her whim dictated, and be recognized, admired, envied as she did so. There had been a time not so many years before when she'd been out there on the streets, rushing over the pavement, hounded with worries about rent payments, credit card bills, and how to stretch her paycheck into one more good pair of shoes. Standing with her nose pressed to the window, she thought now, knowing she was better, smarter, worthier than any of the ladies who shopped inside that cool, fragrant air, trailing pampered fingers over hand-stitched silks. She'd never had a doubt she'd be on the other side, the right side of the glass. She'd never had a doubt she was meant to be. She'd had something a great many of the workforce lacked as they'd scrambled to their next hive. A towering ambition and a nearly violent belief in self. She'd never intended to work her life away just to put a roof over her head, unless the roof was spectacular. She'd always had a plan. A woman Anita thought as she pushed back from the rosewood desk was a man's toy, his doormat or his punching bag without one, and most often a combination of the three. With a plan and the brains to implement it, he became hers. She'd worked hard to get where she was. If marrying a man old enough to be her grandfather wasn't work, she didn't know the meaning of the word. When a twenty-five-year-old woman had sex with a sixty-six-year-old man, the woman, by God, worked. She'd given Paul Morningside his money's worth for twelve long, laborious years. Dutiful wife, faithful assistant, elegant hostess, and live-in whore. He died a happy man, and not a minute in Anita's estimation too soon. Morningside Antiquities was hers now, because it always entertained her. She took a turn around her office. Letting her heels sink into the faded wool of the Bacara carpet, clicked lightly on polished wood. She'd selected every piece personally, from the George the Third settee 
to the Tang horse riding on a shelf of the Regency break front. It was a mix of styles and eras that appealed to her, an elegant and distinctly female melding, all in superior taste. She'd learned a great deal from Paul about value, continuity, and perfection. The colors were soft. She saved the bold and splashy for other areas, but her downtown office was done in quiet female tones, the better to seduce clients and competitors. Best of all, she thought as she picked up an opal snuff box, everything in the room had once belonged to someone else. There was such a thrill in possessing what had been another's. It was to her mind a kind of theft, a legal one, even a distinguished one. What could be more exciting? She was perfectly aware that after fifteen years, three of them as head of Morningside, some continued to consider her little more than a gold digger. They were wrong. There had been gossip, there had been snide comments when Paul Morningside had fallen for a woman more than forty years his junior. Some had passed her off as a bimbo. They'd been very wrong. She had been and was a beautiful woman who knew exactly how to exploit her attributes. Her hair was flame red, and at forty she wore it in a sleek chin-length sweep to play up smooth round cheeks and a full, deceptively soft mouth. Her eyes were bright blue and cupid doll wide. Many who'd looked into them found them guileless. They were wrong too. She had pale, flawless skin, a small, streamlined nose. And a body a former lover had described as a walking wet dream. She presented the package carefully: tailored suits for business, fashionably elegant gowns for social occasions. Throughout her marriage, she'd been meticulous about her behavior, public and private. There might have been some who whispered, but there were no whiffs of scandal, no questionable behavior attached to Anita Gay. Some might continue to look askance. But they accepted her invitations and they issued them to her in return. They patronized her company and paid well for the privilege. Inside the package was the brain of a born operator. Anita Gay was the dedicated widow, the society hostess, the respected businesswoman. She intended to live the part for the rest of her days. It was, she mused, the longest con on record. Gold digger, she thought with a quiet laugh. Oh no, it had never been just about money. It had been about position and power and prestige. It was no more about dollars and cents than owning something was about filling space on a shelf. It was about status. She crossed to a Corot landscape, pushed a mechanism hidden in the frame to lever out the painting. With quick fingers, she punched in her security code on the keypad behind it, inputted the combination to the safe. For her own pleasure, she took out the silver fate, and hadn't it been fate, she reflected, that had had her traveling to Dublin, spending those few weeks overseeing the opening of a Morningside branch there, just as it had been fate that had urged her to take an appointment with one Malachy Sullivan. She'd known of the three fates. Paul had told her the story. He'd had an endless supply of long-winded, tedious stories, but this one had caught her interest. Three silver statues forged, some said, on Olympus itself. That, of course, was nonsense. But legend added luster and a value to objects. Three sisters, separated by time and circumstances, falling into various hands over the years, and separated, they were no more than pretty bits of art. But if and when they were brought together, she ran her fingertip over the shallow notch in the base. Where Clotho had once linked to Lachesis, together they were beyond price. And some, a gullible some in Anita's mind, said that together they were beyond power, wealth beyond imagining, control of one's own destiny, unto immortality. Paul hadn't believed they'd existed. A pretty story, he'd claimed, a kind of holy grail for collectors of antiquities. She'd passed it off as well. Until Malachy Sullivan had asked for her professional opinion, it had been child's play to seduce him into seducing her, then to blind his caution with lust until he trusted her enough to put the statue into her hands, for tests and assessments. She told him, for research. He told her enough, 
more than enough to assure her that she could take the statue from him with impunity. What could he do? Some middle-class Irish sailor, descended by his own accounting from a thief against a woman of her unimpeachable reputation. Stealing outright, she thought now, had been a glorious rush. He'd made noise, of course, but her money and position and the miles of ocean between them insulated her against any trouble he could stir. As she'd expected, he'd quieted down again in a matter of weeks. What she hadn't expected was for him to outmaneuver her, even temporarily, for the other two pieces of the prize. She'd wasted time delicately questioning Wiley Antiques's current owners while he had zeroed in on Tia Marsh. He got nothing from her, Anita knew now. There hadn't been time. There'd been nothing in her hotel room, nothing on her laptop that pertained to the statues or to her ancestor. And nothing in the more discreet search of her New York apartment. Still, she believed Tia was a key, one worth turning in any case. She'd pursue that personally, she decided, just as she would pursue the New York threat of Simon White Smith personally. She'd leave her incompetent employees to track down the black sheep of that family while she courted the cream of it. Once she had the second fate, she'd use all her resources, all her energies by any means to find and acquire the third. Tia spent the first twenty-four hours after the flight home sleeping or shuffling around her apartment in her pajamas. Twice she woke up in the dark without a clue where she was, and remembering had hugged herself in sheer joy before snuggling back into her pillow and sleep. The second day she indulged in a long bath, lukewarm water and plenty of lavender oil, then changed into fresh pajamas and went back to sleep. When she was awake and wandering the apartment, She'd stopped to touch something, the back of a chair, the side of a table, the round dome of a paperweight. She would think, mine, my things, my apartment, my country. She could open the drapes and look out on her view of the East River, enjoy the look of the water that always managed to soothe and thrill her, or close them again and imagine herself in a lovely, cool cave. There was no one waiting for her, no need to dress, to style her hair, to gear up mentally and emotionally for an appearance. She could, if she wanted, stay in her pajamas for a week and talk to no one. She could lie in her own wonderful bed and do nothing but read or watch television. Of course, that was bad for the back. And of course, she needed to fix proper meals and reacquaint her system with basic routine. She was running low on echinacea, too, and really needed to go out and buy some fresh bananas if she didn't want her potassium level to dip. But she could make it one more day, just one more, because the prospect of having no conversations whatsoever, even with a clerk at the market, was so wonderful it was worth the risk of a potassium dip. To relieve her guilt for not phoning her family, not stirring herself to travel the few blocks to see her mother, she sent her parents an email. Then she confirmed her next appointment with Dr. Lowenstein the same way. She loved email and offered thanks that she lived in an age in which it was possible to communicate without speaking. Despite all her travel precautions, she was pretty sure she was coming down with a cold. Her throat was a bit scratchy, her sinuses a little stuffy. But when she took her temperature, twice, it was dead normal. Still, she took some extra zinc, more echinacea, and made herself a pot of chamomile tea. She was just settling down with it in a book on homeopathic remedies when her doorbell chimed. She nearly ignored it. It was guilt that had her setting cup and book aside. It could very well be her mother who tended to drop by unannounced, and who would certainly let herself in with her key if Tia didn't answer. It was guilt as well that had her glancing around and wincing. Her mother would see that she'd been lounging around like a slog for days. She wouldn't criticize— or she would mask her criticism so expertly in indulgence that Tia would, she knew, end up feeling like a self-centered, lazy child. Worse, if she sniffed out even a hint of the cold Tia was sure she was brewing, she would make a terrible fuss. Resigned, Tia peered out the peephole and squeaked. It wasn't her mother. Flustered, she pushed a hand through her hair and opened the door to a man she'd nearly convinced herself she'd imagined. Hello, Tia. 
If Malachi thought it odd she was answering the door in her pajamas at three in the afternoon, his warm smile didn't show it. Um, something about him seemed to crosswire the circuits in her brain. She wondered if it was chemical. How did you find you? He finished. She looked a bit pale, he thought, and sleepy. The woman needed some fresh air and sunshine. You're in the book. I should have called, but I was in the neighborhood, more or less. Oh, well, uh. Her tongue wouldn't cooperate on more than one syllable. She made a helpless gesture of invitation and had closed the door behind him before she remembered she was wearing pajamas. Oh, she said again, and clutched the lapels together. I was just recuperating from your travels, I expect. It must be lovely being home. Yes, yes, I wasn't expecting company. I'll just change. No, don't. He snagged her hand before she could rush off. You're perfectly fine, and I won't keep you long. I was worried about you. I hated leaving you so abruptly. Did they find who broke into your hotel room? No, no, they didn't, at least not yet. I never thank you properly for staying with me through all the questioning and paperwork. I wish I could have done more. I hope the rest of your trip went well. It did. I'm glad it's over. Should she offer him a drink? She fretted. She couldn't possibly, not while wearing pajamas. Did you... Have you been in New York long? I've just arrived. Business. She had the drapes pulled over the windows, he noted. The place was dim as a cave, but for the reading lamp on the table by the sofa. Still... What he could see was tidy as a church and quietly pretty, as she was, despite the prim cotton pajamas. He was, he realized, more pleased to see her than he'd expected to be. I wanted to look you up to you, as I've been thinking about you the last few weeks. Really? Yes, really. Would you have dinner with me tonight? Dinner? Tonight? It's short notice, I know, but if you're not busy, I'd love to have an evening with you. Tonight? He moved in just a little. Tonight, tomorrow, as soon as you're free. She'd have considered it all a hallucination, but she could smell him. Just a hint of his aftershave. She didn't think she'd identify men's aftershave in a hallucination. I don't have any plans. Brilliant. Why don't I pick you up at 7.30? He released her hand, wisely opting to retreat before she could think of an excuse. I'll look forward to it. While she stood staring at him, he let himself out. It's just dinner to you. Relax. Carrie, I asked you to come over and help, not advise me to do the impossible. What about this? Tia turned from her closet, holding up a navy suit. No. What's wrong with it? Everything. Carrie Wilson, a streamlined brunette with skin the color of melted caramel and ebony eyes, angled her head. It's fine if you're going to address the board of directors on fiscal responsibility. It's dead wrong for a romantic dinner for two. I never said it was romantic. You're going out with a great-looking Irishman you met in Helsinki who stayed by your side during a criminal investigation and who has shown up on your doorstep in New York the minute he hit the States? Carrie's voice had the rapid-fire punch of a machine gun as she lounged on the bed. The only way it could be more romantic would be if he'd shown up on a white charger with the blood of a dragon on his sword. I just want to look reasonably attractive, Tia replied. Honey, you always look reasonably attractive. Let's swing the hammer and ring the bell. She unfolded herself from the bed and plunged into Tia's closet. Carrie was a stockbroker, Tia's stockbroker. Somehow, during their six-year association, they'd become friends. She was Tia's image of the modern independent woman, the type who normally would have intimidated Tia into muscle spasms and had until they discovered a mutual interest in alternative medicine and Italian shoes. Thirty, divorced, professionally successful, Carrie dated a string of interesting, eclectic men, could analyze the Dow Jones or Kafka with equal authority, and vacationed solo every year, selecting the location by sticking a pin in an atlas. There was no one Tia trusted more in matters of finance, fashion, or men. Here, the classic little black number. Carrie pulled out a simple sleeveless sheath. We'll sex it up a bit. I'm not looking for sex. That, as I've told you for years, is your core problem. 
She stepped out of the closet, then studied Tia. I wish we had more time. I'd call my stylist, get him to squeeze you in. You know I don't go to salons, all those chemicals and the hair flying everywhere. You don't know what you might pick up. A decent haircut for one thing. I'm telling you, you'd really open your face up, accent your bone structure in your eyes if you'd just get that mop whacked off. Carrie tossed the dress on the bed, then gathered Tia's long hair in her hand. Let me do it. Not as long as I still have a brainwave pattern, she chided. Just help me get through the evening, Carrie. Then he'll go back to Ireland or wherever, and things will get back to normal. Carrie hoped not. As far as she was concerned, her friend had entirely too much normal in her life. Malachy thought the flowers were a nice touch. Pink roses. She struck him as the type for pink roses. He was afraid he was going to have to rush her a bit, and he regretted that. She also struck him as the type for slow, rather sweet seductions. And oddly, he thought he'd enjoy seducing her slowly. But he couldn't spare the time. He wasn't at all sure he should have left home, not before Gideon had returned. The fact that Anita had managed to track down the Tolliver woman worried him. Was it another case of her trailing their path? Or were their roots just coinciding? Either way, he was absolutely sure that Anita would move on Tia soon, if she hadn't already. He needed to get his pitch in, to lure Tia over to his side before Anita could confuse matters. So here he was, toting a dozen pink rosebuds to the door of Wiley's descendant, while his brother was God knew where, with one of White Smith's. He'd have preferred striding to Anita's door, and leading with his boot there. If he hadn't promised his mother, who had the good sense not to want her oldest son locked in a foreign jail, he'd have done just that. Still, when it came down to it, spending the evening having dinner with a pretty woman was a better bet than dragging one all over Europe as Gideon was doing. He knocked, waited, then was caught off balance when she opened the door. You look fantastic. Tia struggled not to tug at the hem of the little black dress that Carrie had ruthlessly shortened a full two inches. Carrie had chosen the opera-length pearls, too, and was responsible for the hairstyle that added a few wispy bangs and whisked the rest away in a long fall down the back. Thank you. Those are lovely. I thought they suited you. Would you like to sit down, have a drink before we go? I have some wine. I'd like that, yes. Well, I'll just put these in some water. She restrained herself from mentioning she was relatively sure she'd inherited her mother's allergy to roses. Instead, she chose an old Baccarat vase from her display cabinet. She carried them back into the kitchen, setting them aside while she got out the bottle of white she'd opened for Carrie. I like your place, Malachy said from behind her. So do I. She poured a glass, turned to offer it. As he was closer than she'd anticipated... She nearly plowed the glass into his chest. Thanks. I think the hardest aspect of traveling is not having your own things about you. The little things that comfort you. Yes. She let out a quiet breath. Exactly. To keep busy, she filled the vase with water, then began to arrange the flowers in it, one by one. That's why you caught me in pajamas this afternoon. I was wallowing in being home. In fact, other than the limo driver, you were the first person I spoke to since I got back. Is that right? So Anita hadn't beaten him, after all. Then I'm very flattered. He picked up one of the roses, handed it to her. And I hope you'll enjoy the evening. She did a great deal. The restaurant he'd chosen was quiet, with soft lighting and discreet service. Discreet enough that the waiter hadn't blinked when she'd picked her way through the menu, ordering a salad without dressing, and requested her fish be broiled without butter and served without the accompanying sauce. Because he'd ordered a bottle of wine, she accepted a glass. She rarely drank. She'd read several articles on how alcohol destroyed brain cells. Of course, a glass of red wine was supposed to counteract that by being good for your heart. But the wine was so soft, and he managed to put her so completely at ease— that she never noticed how often her glass was topped off. It's so interesting that you live in Cove, she said, another tie to the Lusitania, and indirectly to you. Well, my great-great-grandparents were brought back here for burial, but I suppose, like so many of the others, they were taken to Cove or Queenstown then. 
It was foolish, really, for those people to make that crossing during wartime, such an unnecessary risk. We never know what another considers necessary or a risk, do we? Or why some lived and some died. My ancestor wasn't from Ireland, you know. She nearly missed what he was saying. When he smiled at her, just that way, slow and intimate, his eyes seemed impossibly green. He wasn't? No, indeed. He was born in England, but lived most of his life here in New York. Really? After the tragedy, he was nursed back to health by a young woman who was to become his wife. It said the experience changed him. Word is, he was a bit of a loose cannon before it happened. In any case, his story's been passed down through the family. It seems he was interested in a certain item he'd heard was in England. Seeing as you're an expert on Greek myths, you might have heard of it. The Silver Fates. Struck, she set down her fork. Do you mean the statues? His pulse jumped, but he nodded easily. I do, yes. Not the Silver Fates. The Three Fates. Three separate statues, not one. Though they can be linked by the bases. Ah, well, stories take on a life of their own, don't they, over generations? He cut another bite of his beef. Three pieces, then. You know of them. I certainly do. Henry Wiley owned one, and it went down with the Lusitania. According to his journal, he was going to England to buy the second of the set and to hopefully follow a lead on finding the third. It seems so interesting to me as a child to think that. He'd essentially die for those pieces that I looked up the fades. He waited a beat. What did you find? Oh, about the statues next to nothing. In fact, it's most commonly believed they don't really exist. For all I know, Henry had something else entirely. She moved her shoulders. But I found out about the fates of mythology and kept reading. The more I read, the more fascinated I was by the gods and the half gods. I had absolutely no talent for the family business, so I turned an interest into a career. Then you have Henry to thank for that. She'd always thought the same. You're right, I do. He lifted his glass, tapped it to hers, to Henry then, and his pursuit of the fates. He let the conversation wind into other areas. Damn it, she was pleasant company when she loosened up. The wine added a sparkle to her eyes, a pretty glow to her cheeks. She had a mind that was quick enough to jump into any area, and a subtle and dry wit when she forgot to be nervous about what came out of her mouth. He gave himself an hour to simply enjoy her company, and didn't circle back to the fates until they were in the cab heading back to her apartment. Did Henry note down in his journal how he planned to acquire the other statues? Idly, Malachy toyed with the ends of her hair. Weren't you curious if they existed, if they were real? Hmm, I don't remember. With the wine spinning gently in her head, she relaxed against him when he slid an arm around her shoulders. I was thirteen, no, twelve, when I first read it. It was the winter I had bronchitis. I think it was bronchitis, she said lazily. Now, I always seemed to have something that kept me in bed. Anyway, I was too young to think about heading off to England to find some legendary statue. He frowned. It seemed to him that was precisely what a twelve-year-old girl should have thought of doing. The adventure of it, the romance of it, would have made a perfect fantasy for a housebound child. After that, I was too steeped in gods to worry about artifacts. That's my father's area. I'm hopeless at business. I've no flair for figures or for people. I'm a crushing disappointment to him. That's not possible. It is, but it's nice of you to say it isn't. Wiley Antiques paid for my education, my lifestyle, and my piano lessons, and I've given nothing back, preferring to write books on imaginary figures rather than accept the weight and responsibilities of my legacy. Writing books about imaginary figures is an art and a time-honored profession. Not when you're my father. He's given up on me, and as I've yet to latch onto a man long enough to produce a grandchild for him. He despairs that on his retirement, Wileys will pass out of the family. A woman's not required to birth a child for the sake of a bloody business. She blinked a bit at the temper in his voice. Wileys isn't just a business; it's a tradition. Oh my! I shouldn't have had so much wine. I'm rambling. You're not. He paid the driver when they pulled to the curb. 
and you shouldn't worry so much about pleasing your father if he can't see the value of who you are and what you do. Oh, he's not. She was grateful for the firmness of Malachi's hand as she climbed out of the cab. The wine made her limbs feel loose and disconnected. He's a wonderful man, amazingly kind and patient. It's just that he's so proud of Wiley's. If he'd had a son or another daughter with more business skills, it wouldn't be so difficult. Your thread's been spun, hasn't it? He led her into the elevator. You are what you are. My father doesn't believe in fate. She shook back her hair, smiled. But maybe he'd be interested in the fates. Wouldn't it be something if I research and manage to find one of them or two? Of course, they don't have any serious significance unless they're complete. Maybe you should read Henry's journal again. Maybe I should. I wonder where it is. She laughed up at him as they walked toward her door. I had the best time. That's twice now I've had the best time with you, and on two continents. I feel very cosmopolitan. See me tomorrow. He turned her into him, slid a hand up her back to the nape of her neck. Okay. Her eyes fluttered closed as he drew her closer. Where? Anywhere. He whispered it, then touched his lips to hers. It was a simple matter for a man to deepen a kiss when a woman was all but melting around him. It was easy to take as much as he wanted when she sighed and wrapped her arms around him. And when what she gave back was sweet and warm and unbearably soft, it was damn near impossible not to want more. He could have more, he thought, as he changed the angle of the kiss. He had only to open her door, step inside with her. Already there was a purr in her throat and a quiver along her skin, and he couldn't do it. She was half drunk and criminally vulnerable. Worse, somehow worse, the want for her was a great deal more personal than he'd bargained for. He eased her back with the sudden, certain knowledge that his plans had just suffered a major snag, and the snag could become a large and tangled knot. Spend the day with me tomorrow. She felt as if she were floating. Don't you have work? Spend the day with me. He repeated and tortured himself by leaning her back against the door and taking her mouth again. Say yes. Yes. What? Eleven. I'll be here at eleven. Go inside, Tia. Go where? Inside. God help him. Inside. He repeated, as he fumbled a bit with her lock. Damn it! One more. He yanked her back against him, kissed her until the blood was roaring in his head. Lock the door, he ordered, and giving her a little shove inside, shut it smartly in his own face before he could change his mind. Six. Tia wasn't sure if it was curiosity or lust that drove her to look for the old journal. Whichever it was, it was a powerful force to make her face her mother in the middle of the day. She loved her mother sincerely, but any session with Alma Marsh was wearing on the nerves. Rather than risk a germ-crawling taxi, she walked the eight blocks to the lovely old townhouse where she'd spent her childhood. She was so energized. So full of the delight of the last two days and Malachi, she didn't even think about the pollen count. The air was thick as a brick, and so miserably hot it wilted her crisp linen blouse before she'd walked the two cross-town blocks to Park Avenue. But she strolled along as she headed uptown, humming a tune in her mind. She loved New York. Why hadn't she ever realized how much she loved the city, with its noise and traffic, its crowded streets, its life? There was so much to see if you just looked. The young women pushing baby carriages, the boy walking a group of six little dogs that pranced along like a parade, the sleek black hired cars taking ladies to lunch or home again after a morning shopping, and look how gorgeous the flowers were along the avenue, and how smart the doormen looked in their uniforms as they stood outside the buildings. How had she missed all this? She wondered, as she turned onto her parents' pretty shady street. Simple. On the rare time she actually walked outside of her own three-block radius, she kept her head down, her purse in a stranglehold, and imagined herself being mugged or run over by a bus that jumped the curb. But she'd walked yesterday with Malachi. 
They'd strolled up Madison Avenue, had stopped at the little sidewalk cafe for cold drinks and careless conversation. He talked to everyone. The waiter, the woman beside them with, of all things, a miniature poodle in her lap, which could hardly be sanitary. He talked to shop clerks and barneys, to a young woman debating over scarves in one of the terrifying boutiques Tia usually avoided. He struck up conversations with one of the guards at the Met and the sidewalk vendor where he'd bought hot dogs. She'd actually eaten a hot dog right on the street. She could hardly get over it. For a few hours, she'd seen the city through his eyes, the wonder of it, the humor in it, the grit and the grandeur. And she was going to see it again tonight with him. She was nearly skipping by the time she reached her parents' house. There were flower pots flanking the entrance. Tilly, the housekeeper, would have planted and tended them. She remembered now that she'd wanted to help plant the pots once. She'd been about ten, but her mother had worried so much about dirt, allergies, and insects that she'd given up the idea. Maybe she'd buy a geranium on the way home just to see. Though she had a key, Tia used the bell. The key was for emergencies, and using it meant decoding the alarm, then explaining why she'd done so. Tilly, a sturdy fireplug of a woman with stone gray hair, answered quickly. Why, Miss Tia, what a nice surprise! All settled in then after your trip. I really enjoyed the postcards you sent me. All those wonderful places. A lot of places, Tia agreed as she stepped into the quiet, cool air. She kissed Tilly's cheek with the easy comfort she felt for few. It's good to be home. One of the best parts of traveling is coming home, isn't it? Don't you look pretty today? Tilly said, surprise in her voice as she studied Tia's face. I think traveling agreed with you. You wouldn't have said that a couple of days ago. Tia set her purse on a table in the foyer, glanced at the Victorian mirror above it. She did look pretty, she realized. Sort of rosy and bright. Is my mother available? She's upstairs in her sitting room. You go right up, and I'll bring you both something cold to drink. Thanks, Tilly. Tia turned to the long sweep of stairs. She'd always loved this house, the elegant dignity of it. It was such a combination of her parents, her father's great love for antiques, her mother's deep need for organized space. Without that combination, that balance, she supposed. It might have been a hodgepodge, a kind of subshop for Wileys. As it was, the furnishings were arranged with an eye for style as well as beauty. Everything had its place, and that place rarely changed. There was something comforting in that continuity, that stability. The colors were pale and cool, rather than flower arrangements. There were lovely statuary, wonderful old bowls filled with chunks of polished, colored glass. Ladies' gloves, jeweled handbags, hat pins, cufflinks, watch fobs, snuff boxes were displayed behind ruthlessly clean glass. Temperature and humidity were strictly maintained by a climate control system. It was always 71 degrees, with a 10% humidity rate inside the Marsh townhouse. Tia paused outside her mother's sitting room door, knocked. "Come in, Tilly." The moment Tia opened the door, her spirits dropped. She caught the faint scent of rosemary, which signaled her mother was having one of her difficult mornings. Though the window glass was treated to filter out UV rays, the drapes were drawn. Another bad sign. Alma Marsh reclined on the silk cushioned recamie, with an eye bag draped over her upper face. I think I have one of my headaches coming on, Tilly. I shouldn't have tried to answer all that correspondence at one time, but what can I do? People will write you, won't they? And then you have no choice but to respond. Would you mind getting my fever few? Perhaps I can ward off the worst of it. It's Tia, mother. I'll get it for you. Tia? Alma slid the eye bag aside. My baby, come give me a kiss, dear. There couldn't be any better medicine. Tia crossed over and gave Alma a light kiss on the cheek. She might have been having one of her spells, Tia thought, but her mother looked, as always, perfect. Her hair, nearly the same delicate shade as her daughter's, was glossy and swept back in gentle waves from a face suitable for a cameo. It was delicate, lovely, unlined.
Though she tended to be thin, her body was turned out with casual elegance in a soft pink blouse and tailored trousers. There now, I feel better already," Alma said as she shifted to sit up. "I'm so glad you're home, Tia. Why, I didn't get one moment's rest while you were gone. I was so worried about you. You took all your vitamins, didn't you, and didn't drink the tap water? I hope you demanded non-smoking sweets in all your hotels, though God knows they don't enforce that. Just come in and spray after some horrible person spewed carcinogens into the air. Pull open the drapes, dear. I can barely see you. Are you sure? I can't indulge myself," Alma said heroically. "I've a dozen things to do today, and now that you're here, well, we'll make time for a nice visit, and I'll work harder later. And you—you you must be exhausted. A delicate system like yours suffers under the demands of travel. I want you to arrange for a complete physical right away. I'm fine," Tia moved to the windows. When the immune system's compromised, as yours must be, it can take several days before you recognize the symptoms. You make that appointment, Tia, for my sake. Of course. Tia drew open the drapes, relieved when light poured into the room. You don't have to worry. I took very good care of myself. Be that as it may, you can't. She trailed off when Tia turned around. Why, you're all flushed. Are you feverish? She leaped off the daybed, clamped a hand over Tia's brow. Yes, you feel a little warm. Oh, I knew it. I knew you'd catch some foreign germ. I'm not feverish. I got a bit hot on the walk over. That's all. You walked in this heat. I want you to sit down. Sit down right here. You're dehydrated, courting heat stroke. I'm not. But she thought she might feel just a little dizzy after all. I'm perfectly fine. I've never felt better. A mother knows these things. Revived, Alma waved Tia to a chair and marched to the door. Tilly, bring up a pitcher of lemon water and a cold compress and call Doctor Rialto. I want him to examine Tia right away. I'm not going to the doctor. Don't be stubborn. I'm not. But she was beginning to feel a bit queasy. Mother, please sit down before you aggravate your headache. Tilly's bringing up cold drinks. I promise, if I feel the least bit ill, I'll phone Doctor Rialto. Now, what's all this fuss? Tilly came in carrying a tray. Tia's ill. You only have to look at her to see it, and she won't have the doctor. She looks just fine to me, blooming like a rose. It's fever. Oh, now, Miss Alma, girl's got some color in her cheeks for a change. That's all. You sit down and have some nice iced tea. It's jasmine, your favorite, and I've got some lovely green grapes here. You wash them in that antitoxin solution. Absolutely, I'm going to put your Chopin on. She added when she set down the tray, real low. You know how that always soothes your nerves. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you, Tilly. What would I do without you? Lord only knows. Tilly said under her breath and added a wink for Tia as she walked out. Alma sighed and sat. My nerves haven't been good, she admitted to Tia. I know you felt this trip was important for your career, but you've never been so far away for so long. And according to Doctor Lowenstein, Tia thought as she poured the tea, that was part of the problem. I'm back now, and all in all, it was a fascinating trip. The lectures and signings were well attended. And it helped clear out some of the cobwebs I've been dealing with about the new book. Mother, I met this man. A man? You met a man? Alma came to attention. What kind of man? Where? Tia, you know perfectly well how dangerous it is for a woman alone to travel, much less to hold conversations with strange men. Mother, I'm not an imbecile. You're trusting and naive. Yes, you're right. So when he asked me to go back to his hotel room to discuss the modern significance of Homer, I went like a lamb to the slaughter. He ravished me, then passed me on to his nefarious partner for sloppy seconds. Now I'm pregnant, and I don't know which one is the father. She didn't know why she'd said it. Honestly, she didn't know how all that had burst out of her mouth. She felt her own headache coming on as Alma went white and clutched her chest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I wish you'd. Give me some credit for common sense. 
I'm seeing a perfectly nice man. We have an interesting connection that goes back to Henry Wiley. You're not pregnant. No, of course not. I'm simply seeing a man who shares my interest in Greek myths, and who coincidentally had an ancestor on the Lusitania, a survivor. Is he married? No. Shocked, insulted, Tia got to her feet to pace. I wouldn't date a married man. Not if you knew he was married, Alma said significantly. Where did you meet him? He attended one of my lectures, and he had business here in New York, so he looked me up. What sort of business? Growing more frustrated by the minute, Tia pushed at her hair. It felt suddenly abominably heavy, as if it were smothering her brain. He's in shipping. Mother, the point is that in talking about the Greeks and the Lusitania, we touched on the three fates. The statues? You've heard Father mention them? No, I can't say I have, but someone asked me about them just the other day. Who was it? Someone asked you about them? That's odd. It's neither here nor there, Alma said irritably. It was in passing at some function your father dragged me to, though I was feeling unwell. That gay woman, Alma remembered. Anita Gay, she has a hard look about her, if you ask me. And no wonder marrying a man forty years older and so blatantly for his money, no matter what anyone says. Well, more fool he. She's fooled your father, of course. Women like that always fool men. Good businesswoman, he says. A credit to the antiquity community. Huh. But where was I? I can't concentrate. I'm just so out of sorts. What did she ask you? Oh, for heaven's sake, Tia! I dislike speaking to the woman, so can hardly be expected to remember some irritating conversation with her about some silly statues I've never heard of. You're just trying to change the subject. Who is this man? What's his name? Sullivan, Malachi Sullivan. He's from Ireland. Ireland? I've never heard of such a thing. It's an island just northwest of England. Don't be sarcastic. It's very unattractive. What do you know about him? That I enjoy his company, and he appears to enjoy mine. Alma let out a long-suffering sigh, one of her best weapons. You don't know who his family is, do you? Well, I'm sure he knows who yours is. I'm sure he knows very well who you come from. You're a wealthy woman, Tia, living alone, which worries me to distraction, and a prime target for the unscrupulous. Shipping? We'll see about that. Don't. Tia's voice snapped out. Surprising Alma into lowering herself back into her chair, just don't. You're not going to have him investigated. You're not going to humiliate me again that way. Humiliate you? What a thing to say! If you're thinking of that, that history teacher, well, he wouldn't have been so angry and upset if he'd had nothing to hide. A mother has a right to look after her only child's welfare. Your only child is nearly thirty, mother. Couldn't it be just on a wild whim of fate? Couldn't it be that an attractive, interesting, intelligent man chooses to go out with me because he finds me an attractive, interesting, intelligent woman? Does he have to have some dark underlying motive? Am I such a loser that no man would want a normal, natural relationship with me? A loser. Sincerely shocked, Alma gaped. I don't know what puts ideas like that in your head. No, Tia said wearily and turned toward the windows. I bet you don't. You needn't worry. He's only in New York a few days. He'll be going back to Ireland soon, and it's unlikely we'll ever see each other again. I can promise if he offers to sell me some bridge over the River Shannon or pops up with a great investment opportunity, I'll turn him down. Meanwhile, I was wondering if you know where Henry Wiley's journal might be. I'd like to study it. How should I know? Ask your father. Obviously, my concerns and advice are worthless to you. I don't know why you bother to come by. I'm sorry I upset you. She turned back, walked over to kiss Alma's cheek again. I love you, mother. I love you very much. You get some rest. I want you to call Doctor Rialto. Alma ordered as Tia walked away. Yes, I will. She lived dangerously and took a cab downtown to Wiley's. She knew herself well enough to be certain if she went home in her current mood, she would brood and eventually decide her mother was right about the state of her health, about Malachi. About her own pitiful appeal to the opposite sex. Worse, she wanted to go home, to draw the drapes, huddle in her cave with her pills, her aromatherapy, and a cool, soothing gel bag over her eyes.
just, she thought, disgust, like her mother. She needed to keep busy, to keep focused, and the idea of the journal and the fates was a puzzle that would keep her mind occupied. She paid the cab driver, slid out and stood for a moment on the sidewalk in front of Wiley's. As always, she felt a rush of wonder and pride. The lovely old brownstone with its leaded windows and stained glass door had stood for a hundred years. When she'd been young, her father, over Alma's dire predictions and dark warnings, had taken her with him once a week, into that treasure trove, into that Aladdin's cave. He taught her, patiently, she thought now, about eras, styles, woods, glass, ceramics, art, and the bits and pieces people collected that became in time an art of its own. She'd learned, and God, she'd wanted to please him. But she'd never been able to please them both, never been able to stay on her feet in that subtle and constant tug of war her parents had played with her. And she'd been afraid of making a mistake and embarrassing him, had been tongue-tied with clients and customers, baffled by the inventory system. In the end, her father had deemed her hopeless. She could hardly blame him. Still, when she stepped inside, she felt another wave of pride. It was so beautiful, so perfectly lovely. The air smelled lightly of polish and flowers. Unlike the house uptown, things changed here all the time. It was a constant surprise to see a familiar piece missing, a new one in its place, and a kind of thrill when she recognized the changes, identified the new. She moved through the foyer, admiring the curves of the settee. Empire period, she decided, 1810 to 1830. The pair of gilt gesso side tables were new stock, but she remembered the Rococo candlesticks from her visit before she'd left for Europe. She stepped into the first showroom and saw her father. Seeing him always struck her with pride and wonder, too. He was so robust and handsome. His hair was silver and thick as mink pelt, his eyebrows black as midnight. He wore small, square-framed glasses, and behind them she knew his eyes would be dark and clever. His suit was Italian, a navy pinstripe that was tailored for his strong frame. He turned, glanced her way. After an almost imperceptible hesitation, he smiled. He passed an invoice to the clerk he'd been speaking to and crossed to her. So the wanderer returns. He bent to kiss her cheek, his lips barely meeting her skin. She had a rush of memory of being tossed high in the air, of squealing with terrified pleasure, of being caught again by those big, wide hands. I don't mean to interrupt you. It doesn't matter. How was your trip? It was good. It was very good. Have you been by to see your mother? Yes. She shifted her gaze, stared hard at a display cabinet on chest. I've just come from there. I'm sorry we had a disagreement. I'm afraid she's upset with me. You had a disagreement with your mother? He took his glasses off and polished the lenses with a snowy white handkerchief. I believe the last time that happened was sometime in the early 90s. What did you argue about? We didn't really argue, but she may be upset when you get home tonight. If your mother isn't upset every other evening, I think I've walked into the wrong house. He gave her an absent pat on the shoulder that told her his mind was already moving away from her. I wonder if I could talk to you a minute about something else. The three fates? His gaze and his attention snapped back to her. What about them? I had a conversation the other day that reminded me of them, and of Henry Wiley's journal. It sparked my interest when I was a child, and I'd like to read it again— in fact, I've been thinking I might be able to work a section on the mythology of those pieces into my next book. The interest may be timely. Anita Gay brought them up in a conversation a few weeks ago. So Mother told me. Do you think she has a line on one of the other two that still exist? If she does, I couldn't get it out of her. He slid his glasses back on and gave her a wolfish smile. And I tried. If she locates one of the others, it would be of some interest in the community. Two, and she'll make a reasonable splash, but without all three, it's no major find. And the third, according to the journal, must be lost in the North Atlantic. Still, I'm interested. Would you mind if I borrowed the book? The journal is of considerable personal value to the family, he began. 
as well as its historic and monetary value given its age and author. Another time she would have backed off. You let me read it when I was twelve, she reminded him. I had some hope you'd show an interest in the family history and the family business when you were twelve. And I disappointed you. I'm sorry. I'd very much appreciate seeing the book. I can study it here if you'd prefer I didn't take it home. He made a little hiss of impatience. I'll get it for you. It's up in the vault. She sighed when he strode off, then retreated back into the foyer to sit on the edge of the settee and wait for him. When he came back down the stairs, she rose. Thank you. She pressed the soft, faded leather to her breast. I'll be very careful with it. You're very careful with everything, Tia. He walked to the door, opened it for her. And that's why I think you disappoint yourself. Where did you go? Malachi danced his fingers over the back of Tia's hand and watched her attention shift back to him. Nowhere important. Sorry, I'm not very good company tonight. That's for me to decide. What she'd been all evening was broody. So far, she'd barely touched her polenta, though he was sure it had been prepared following her specific instructions. It was clear to him that her mind kept drifting, and when it did, a sadness came over her face that made his heart ache. Tell me what's troubling you, darling. It's nothing. It warmed her when he called her darling. Really, just a family. She couldn't call it an argument. No voices had been raised, no angry words tossed. Disagreement. I managed to upset my mother and irritate my father all in the space of a couple of hours. How did you do that? She poked at her polenta. She hadn't told him of the journal yet. As it was, by the time she'd gotten back to her apartment, she'd been too tired, too depressed to open it. She'd wrapped it carefully in an unbleached cloth and had tucked it in her desk drawer. In any case, she thought, it wasn't the journal that had caused the problem. It was, as usual, herself. My mother wasn't feeling well, and I spoke out of turn. I'm forever speaking out of turn to mine, Malachi said easily. She just gives me a cough, or that terrifying look mothers develop while you're still in the womb, I imagine, and goes about her business. It doesn't work that way with mine. She's worried about me. Worried I'm endangering my health, she thought. Worried I'm letting myself care about a man I know little to nothing about. I had a lot of health problems as a child. You seem pretty healthy to me now. He kissed her fingers, hoping to tease her out of her mood. I certainly feel healthy when I get close to you. Are you married? The absolute shock on his face gave her the answer and made her furious with herself for asking the question. What? Married? No, Tia. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. I mentioned to my mother that I was seeing someone, and before I knew it, you were married and after my money, and I'm having some wild illicit affair that will leave me penniless and heartbroken and probably suicidal. He let out a breath. I'm not married, and I'm not interested in your money. As to the affair, I've been giving that considerable thought. But I'll have to rearrange my plans for the rest of this evening if getting you into bed could result in leaving you broke, heartbroken, and suicidal. Jesus. She wrung her hands. Why don't we skip all of that and you can just shoot me now and put me out of my misery? Why don't we skip dinner instead and go back to your flat so I can get my hands on you? I give you my word that when we're done, you won't be after jumping out the window. She had to clear her throat. She had an urge, an outrageous one, to lean over and slide her tongue over the long, strong line of his cheekbone. Maybe I should get that in writing. Happy to. Why, it's Tia Marsh, isn't it? Stuart Marsh's daughter. It was a voice Malachi would never forget. His fingers tightened convulsively on Tia's as he shifted, looked up and met Anita Gay's glittering smile. Seven. Malachi's grip on her hand was enough to make Tia jolt. But she got over that quickly enough, as the fact that she couldn't put a name to the face of the woman smiling sharply enough to drill holes in her brought on a quick spurt of social panic. Yes, hello. Tia struggled furiously for the connection. How are you? 
I'm wonderful, thanks. You won't remember me. I'm Anita Gay, one of your father's competitors. Of course. Conflicting emotions trickled through the wash of relief. Malky's grip on her fingers had eased slightly, but still held firm. Anita's eyes glittered like suns, and her companion looked politely bored. Tia began to wonder if the strangling tension she felt came from a source other than her own social clumsiness. It's nice to see you. This is Malachi Sullivan. Ms. Gay, she began, shifting to Malachi, is in antiques. As a matter of fact, she had to bite back a yelp when his hand viced on hers again. Ah,、uh, she's one of the top dealers in the country. She finished weakly. You flatter me. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Sullivan. There was a laugh in her voice, but the tone of it made Tia want to shiver. It was so predatory. Are you in the business of antiques? No. The single syllable was clipped and as rude as a slap. Anita only purred and touched a hand lightly to Tia's shoulder. Our table's ready, so I won't keep you. We must have lunch sometime soon, Tia. I read your last book and was just fascinated. I'd love to discuss it with you. Of course. Give your parents my best, she added. And sent one last laughing look at Malachi as she glided away. Deliberately, Tia drew her hand from his, then reached for her water glass to soothe her throat. You know each other. What? Don't. She set her glass down again, then folded her hands together in her lap. You must think me the perfect fool, both of you. She's never said two words to me in my life. Women like her don't notice women like me. I'm not her competition. His blood was up, which made it difficult to think clearly. That's a ridiculous thing to say. Stop it. She gathered herself, let out a breath. You knew each other, and you were surprised. You were angry when she came over, and you were afraid I was about to mention the fates. That's a great deal of conclusions for such a short interlude. People who stay in the background tend to develop good observation skills. She couldn't look at him, not yet. I'm not wrong, am I? No, Tia, this isn't the place to discuss it. Her voice was dismissive, as was her slight shift away from him when he touched her arm. I'd like you to take me home. All right, he signaled for the check. I'm sorry, Tia. It's I don't want an apology. I want an explanation. She rose and, because her legs were unsteady, kept moving. I'll wait outside. She didn't speak in the cab, which was just as well. He needed time to figure out how and where to begin. He should have anticipated Anita would muck up the works. He should have anticipated her making a move, and he'd wasted valuable time. Wasted it, he admitted, because he enjoyed being with Tia and hadn't been able to make himself push her too hard and fast toward the goal. And he thought, because the longer he knew her, the more he wished he'd approached the whole matter differently. Instead, he'd tangled himself up in lies. Still, she was a reasonable woman. All he had to do was make her understand. She ignored the hand he offered to help her out of the cab. He began to feel a little sick. When they reached the door to her apartment, he braced for her to try to slam it in his face. But she walked inside, left it open, and walked straight across the room to the windows, as if he thought she still needed air. It's a complicated business, Tia. Yes, deceit and underhanded behavior often are. She'd had time to think. Concentrating on the puzzle of it helped distance her from the hurt. It all deals with the fates. You and Ms. Gay want them. I'm a link. She'd work on my parents, and you. She turned back now, her face cool and set. You'd work on me. It's not like that. Anita and I are no way partners. Oh, she nodded. Competitors then, working against each other. That does make more sense. Did you have a lover's spat? Christ. He rubbed his hands over his face. No, listen to me, Tia. She's a dangerous woman, ruthless, completely unscrupulous. And you're just loaded with scruples. I suppose you misplaced all those scruples when you lured me away from my hotel in Helsinki, spent all that time charming me, making me believe you were interested in me, so someone could break into my hotel, search it. 
Did you really think I carried clues to the fates around on a book tour? I didn't have anything to do with the break-in. That was Anita. I'm not a fucking criminal. Oh, pardon me, just a fucking liar then, huh? He reigned in his fury. What right did he have to be pissed off? I can't deny I lied to you. I'm sorry for it. Oh, you're sorry? Well, that's different then. All is forgiven. Malachy slid his hands into his pockets, balled them there. The woman facing him wasn't the soft, sweet, slightly neurotic one who'd snuck under his skin. This woman was coldly furious and tougher than he'd believed. Do you want an explanation, or would you rather just pound on me? I'll have the first and reserve my right to the second. Fair enough. Can we sit? No. Be easier if you pounded on me first and got it out of your system, he responded. I told you some of the truth. You'll have a long wait for your Medal of Honor, Malachy. Is that your name, or did you make it up? It's my name, God damn it! You want to see my bloody passport? He began to pace now, as she stood cool and still. I did have an ancestor on the Lusitania. Felix Greenfield, who survived and married Meg O'Reilly and settled in Cove. The experience changed his life, turned it around, and made something out of him. He worked the fishing boats with his wife's family, had his children, converted to Catholicism, and by all accounts was quite devout about it. He paused, ran his fingers, as she'd allowed herself to imagine doing herself, through his thick, chestnut hair. Before that time, before the ship sank under him, he wasn't such an admirable man. He'd book passage on that particular vessel, as he was on the run from the police. He was a thief. Blood tells. Oh, stop it, I've never stolen a flaming thing. The insult grated and had him whirling on her. He didn't look so much the cultured gentleman now, Tia thought dispassionately. Despite the handsome suit, he looked more the brawler. I don't think you're in a position to be so touchy. I come from a good family. We may not be as fancy and fine as yours, but we're not thieves and bandits. Felix was, and I can't be blamed for that. In any case, he turned a corner. It just happened he turned it after he'd taken a few items from the stateroom of the Henry W. Wileys. The fate. She had to wait until her mind could absorb it. He took the fate. It was never lost. It would have been if he hadn't pinched it, so you might want to consider that in the grand scheme of things. He didn't know what it was, only that it was pretty and shiny and it, well, it called to him, so to speak. It was passed down through the family along with the story and kept as kind of a good luck charm. Fascinating. Fantastic. Beneath the hurt and fury she felt interest stirring, and it came to you. It came to my mother and threw her to myself and my brother and sister at this point. He was calmer now. He was Catholic enough himself to feel some of the weight of the lies lift by the confessing of them. I had some curiosity about it, and that's where I made my fatal mistake. I took it to Dublin. I thought to have it identified, if possible, appraised, certainly. My sister, who has a knack for such things, said that she'd see what she could find out through researching books on the Internet. But I took it with me impatient, and walk like a sheep into Morningside Antiquities. You showed it to Anita. Not at first, no. I told her about it. Why shouldn't I? He asked, frustrated all over again. She was supposed to be an expert on such things and a reputable businesswoman. I didn't burst out with the history of it right off, but over the next few days... He trailed off as impotent embarrassment shimmered around him. Yes, I can fill in the blanks. Because it made it worse, it somehow, perversely, made it better. She wasn't the only one who could be blinded stupid by her own hormones. She's very beautiful. So is a Mako shark to some points of view. There was bitterness there, for the woman who duped him, and for the one who stood placidly, with the dark river at her back. Well, she got enough of it out of me before I noticed the teeth. She came by my hotel so she could see it privately. She thought that would be best. Naturally, I agreed, because she'd already demonstrated a keen personal interest in me. She uses sex the way other women use lipstick, he declared. Putting it on and taking it off on a whim, I handed it right over to her. She thought of Anita Gay. Sharp, sexy, confident, predatory. 
Yes, she could understand why even a clever man might be a fool around her. No receipt? I might have thought to ask for one if she hadn't been undoing my trousers at the time. We had sex and we had wine. Or I had wine. The bitch must have put something in it because I didn't wake up until past noon the next day. She was gone, and so was the fate. She drugged you. He caught the edge of disbelief, set his teeth. I don't pass out near to twelve hours on a bounce and two glasses of wine. I didn't believe in myself at first. I went to Morningside and was told she was in meetings and unavailable. I left messages there and at her hotel. She never returned them. When finally I managed to contact her after she'd come back to New York, she told me she had no idea who I was or what I was talking about and not to bother her again. It wasn't easy having the image of him and Anita romping in a hotel bed, but she worked at it so she could think clearly. You're telling me that Anita Gay of Morningside Antiquities drugged you unconscious after sleeping with you, then stole from you, then denied ever meeting you? I've just said so, haven't I? Made a fool of me in the bargain using sex, pretending to care. He broke off when he caught Tia's arch look. Yes, it's mortifying, isn't it? This wasn't the same. But his stomach pitched nearly to his knees. Not at all the same. Just because we didn't get to the bounce doesn't change the intent or the result. You could have approached me directly, honestly. You chose not to. I did. As far as I knew, you might have been as calculating as she was. Or failing that, how could I know if you wouldn't get it into your head to push some claim on the fate? He lifted his hands. What had seemed perfectly reasonable, certainly necessary at the time, now looked very cold and very ugly. It may not have come to me by a tidy route, Tia, but it's been ours for almost ninety years. And when we found out about there being three of them and, and what that meant, it changed things considerably. Part of it's just wanting back what's ours, and the other, well, damn it, we're talking a lot of money. Great pots of money. We can use it. Ireland's booming at the present, and if we had more to work with, we could expand our business. Your shipping business? She asked dryly, and saw he had the grace to look embarrassed. It's boats, anyway. We run tours at a cove and around the head of Kinsale. Still have a hand in fishing as well. I thought you'd be more comfortable with me if you believed I was in your circle of things. So you consider me shallow. He let out a breath, met her eyes directly. I expected you to be. I was wrong. You were going to come back here with me tonight, go to bed with me. That's cold, that's despicable. You used me right from the beginning, a means to an end, as if I had no feelings. I never mattered to you at all. That's not true. He crossed to her then, and though she held her arms rigidly at her sides, gripped her hands. I won't have you think that. When you came up to me the first time, when you smiled at me, Asked me to go for a walk. It meant nothing to you. I meant nothing. All you wanted was to see if I could be of any use. Nothing more or less. I didn't know you. At first you were just a name, just a possibility. But, please, is this the part where you tell me everything changed once you got to know me to care about me? Spare us both that particular cliché. I got tangled up being with you, Tia. That wasn't part of my plan. Your plan's a mess. Let go of my hands. I'm sorry I hurt you. It was pitiful, but he could think of nothing else. I swear to God I never meant to. Let go of my hands, she repeated. When he did, she stepped back. I can't help you and wouldn't now if I could. But you can comfort yourself that I'll be no help to Anita Gay either. I'm useless to both of you. You're not useless, Tia. Not to anyone. And I'm not speaking of the fates. She only shook her head. It's all we have to speak of. Now I'm tired. I'd like you to go. I don't want to leave it like this. I'm afraid you'll have to. I really have no more to say to you, at least nothing more that would be the least bit constructive. Throw something, then, he suggested. Punch me. Yell at me. That would make it easier for you. She needed her cave, her solitude, and some scrap of pride. I asked you to go. If you have any conscience about what you've done, you'll respect that. Without a choice, he went to the door. He turned, 
studying her as she stood framed by the window. The first time I looked at you, he said quietly, really looked at you, Tia. All I could think was you had the loveliest and saddest eyes. I haven't been able to get them out of my head since. This isn't over. None of it's over. She let out a long breath when the door shut behind him. That's for me to say. The streets were steep in Cove. Like San Francisco, they speared up from a bay at a leg-aching angle. At the top of one was a pretty house painted a pale water green, with a colorful dooryard garden behind a low stone wall. There were three bedrooms, two baths, a living room with a TV that needed upgrading, and a comfortably sprung couch covered with blue and white checks. There was a small parlor and a dining room as well, both used only for company. There, the furniture was ruthlessly polished, and the lace curtains were soft with age. On the wall of the parlor were pictures of John F. Kennedy, the current Pope, and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. That particular trio had always made Malachy so uneasy. He rarely sat in the room unless given no choice. Until he'd turned twenty-four and had moved into the set of rooms over the boathouse, he lived in that same house, shared one of the bedrooms with his brother, and fought with his sister over her time in the upstairs bath. As long as he could remember, the kitchen was the gathering place. It was the kitchen he paced now, while his mother peeled potatoes for dinner. He'd been back only two days, and on the first he'd been buried in work. He'd taken out one of the two tour boats himself, as Rebecca had pointed out. He hadn't pulled his weight in that area for a good chunk of the summer. Then he'd hacked through paperwork until he couldn't see straight. He'd put in a full twelve-hour day and another ten on his second day home, but he hadn't been able to work off the anger or the guilt. Wash these potatoes off, Eileen ordered. It'll give you something to do besides brood. I'm not brooding. I'm thinking. I know brooding when I see it. She opened the oven, checked the roast. It was Malachy's favorite, and she'd made the Sunday meal in the middle of the week in hopes of cheering him up. The girl had a perfect right to toss you out on your ear, and you just have to live with it. I know it, but you'd think she'd see the logic of it all after sleeping on it. At least give me the chance to make it up to her. She wouldn't answer the damn phone or the door. Probably tossed out the flowers I sent. Who knew she had such a hard side to her? Hard side, my aunt Minnie. Bruce feelings is what she has. You made it personal when you should have kept it businesslike. It got personal. Eileen turned back and softened. Yes, I see it did. That's the wonder of living, isn't it? Never knowing when something or someone's going to turn you down a different road. She started peeling the carrots that would go around the roast with the potatoes. Flowers never worked on me either when your father was in the doghouse. Malachy smiled a little. What did? Time for one thing. A woman's got to sulk a bit and know a man's suffering for his sins. And after that, a good crawling's in order. I like a man who knows how to grovel. I never saw da grovel. You didn't see everything, did you? Eileen chided. I heard her ma. He set the potatoes aside to drain. I didn't have the right to hurt her that way. You didn't know, but you didn't start it all with that in mind. She wiped her hands on a dish towel, hung it back over a hook. You were thinking of the family and your own pride. Now you've got her to think of as well. You'll know what to do next time you see her. She won't see me again. If I thought a son of mine gave up so easily, I'd cush you over the head with this skillet. Haven't I worries enough with Gideon off with that dancer? Gideon's fine. At least he's made contact with a connection in all this, who's still speaking to him. You son of a bitch! She was speaking to him all right, in a low growl, as she planted her fist squarely on his jaw. The sucker punch shot Gideon hard on his ass on the grimy rug outside the door of the dingy room in the last of the flea bag hotels they'd booked. He tasted blood, saw stars, and heard what sounded like the Hallelujah chorus ring in his ears. He swiped at his lip and eyed her maliciously as she stood in a black bra and panties 
with her hair still dripping from what the hotel laughingly called a shower. That's it. He got slowly to his feet. For the good of mankind, I have to kill you now. You're a bloody menace to society. Come on, then. She rocked on the balls of her feet, lifted her fists. Take your best shot. He wanted to. Oh, how he wanted to. For five hideous days, he'd crisscrossed Europe with her in tow. He'd slept in beds that made the cots in the youth hostels of his short, carefree holiday after passing his A-levels seem like celestial clouds. He tolerated her demands, her questions, her complaints. He'd ignored the fact that he shared very close, even intimate quarters with a woman who got paid to dance naked and whose body ensured she'd be well paid for the task. He'd behaved like a perfect gentleman, even when she'd been deliberately provocative. He'd fed her, and Christ could she eat, and made certain she had the best shelter his dwindling budget would allow. What did she do? She punched her fist in his face. He took a step toward her, his hands bunched at his sides. I can't hit a woman. It pains me more than I can say, but I can't do it. Now move aside. Can't hit a woman? She lifted her chin, daring him. But you don't have any trouble stealing from one. You took my earrings. That's right. He couldn't hit her, but he did give her a good shove so he could step in and slam the door. And I got twenty-five pounds for them. You eat like a horse, and I'm not made of money. Twenty-five? Her outrage doubled. I paid three hundred and sixty-eight dollars for those after an hour's hard bargaining in the jewelry exchange on Fifth. You're not only a thief, you're a sucker. And you vast experience hawking earrings, have you? She didn't, but she was sure she could have done better. Those were eighteen-carat Italian gold. Now they're going to be fish and chips at the pub and a night's lodging in this hellhole. You keep hammering at me about being partners, but you don't contribute to anything. You could have asked. Sure, you'd have handed them over if I'd asked. You, who takes her handbag into the flaming shower with her. Her full, taunting mouth curled. You've just proven I was smart to do so. Disgusted, he grabbed a shirt, tossed it to her. Put something on, for Christ's sake. Have some respect for yourself. I have plenty of respect for myself. She'd forgotten she was in her underwear. She tended to miss fine details when the red haze of temper came over her. But now the contempt in his tone had her heaving the shirt across the room. I want that twenty-five pounds. You're not getting it. You want to eat? Get some clothes on. You've got five minutes. He started toward the bath. He should have known better than to turn his back on her. She leaped on him, wrapping those long legs like steel bands around his waist, yanking his head back by the hair until lights exploded in front of his eyes. He spun, tried to buck her off. She clung like a burr and managed to hook an arm around his throat. With his windpipe in danger of being crushed, he reached up, got a good hank of her hair himself. Her howl, when he pulled it, was pure satisfaction. Let go, let go of my hair. You let go of mine, he choked out. Now. They circled, her heaped on his back, both of them cursing, both of them yanking. He rammed into the side of the bed, lost his balance. When he hit, he landed on top of her, hard enough to knock the wind out of her and loosen her grip. Before she could recover both, he flipped and pinned her. You've got a screw loose, he muttered, struggling to hold her arms when she started to fight back. Dozens of screws loose. It's twenty-five pounds, for God's sake. I'll give you twelve and five if you're so crazed for it. My earrings, she panted. My money. For all you know, I'm a desperate man. For all you know, I could bash you on the head and take a hell of a lot more than a pair of earrings. She sniffed derisively, then, inspired, tried a new strategy. Tears threatened to spill down her cheeks. That wide, lush mouth trembled. Don't hurt me. I'm not going to hurt you. What do you take me for? Don't cry. Come on now, darling. He released her arm to brush a tear away. She attacked like a wild cat, teeth, nails, flying limbs. She caught a glancing blow off his temple, shot an elbow into his ribs, 
In his struggle to defend himself, he rolled off the bed, with her on top of him. Grunting, sweating, stunned with pain, he managed to pin her a second time before he realized she was breathless with laughter. What is it about a few tears that make guys all gooey? She grinned up at him. Christ, he was cute. All pissed off and poetical. Your mouth's bleeding, champ. I know it. I guess that was worth twenty-five pounds. But I'm not settling for fish and chips. I want red meat, she demanded. Then she saw that focused, narrow look that meant one thing from a man. Her belly muscles quivered in response. Uh-oh, she murmured. Damn it, Cleo. He crushed his throbbing, bleeding mouth to hers. She tasted of sin and smelled like a rain-washed garden. Beneath his, her mouth opened and it took every bit as greedily. Her limbs wrapped around him again, but silkily this time. She arched center to center in a slow, sinuous invitation. He lifted his head and looked down at her. Her hair, all that warm, damp sable, was spread over the thin, burn-scarred carpet. Her lashes were still set with those mock tears. He wanted to devour her, one quick gulp, no matter how it might make his belly ache afterward. He was rock-hard and randy. And he found himself blocked by the same set of values that had prevented him from striking her. Damn it, he said again, and pushed off her to sit with his back, braced against the bed. Baffled, she levered onto her elbows. What's the matter? Get dressed, Cleo. I said I wouldn't hurt you. I won't use you either. She sat back up on her heels as she studied him. His eyes were closed, his breath ragged. She had good reason to know he was aroused. But he'd stopped. Stopped, she realized, because despite the toughness, the cool calculation she'd recognized in him, he was decent. Right down to the marrow. You're the genuine article, aren't you? He opened his eyes to see her smiling thoughtfully. What? Just one question. Did you back off because I'm a currently unemployed stripper? I backed off because whatever you say about partnerships, I'm responsible for you being here. For you having to run out of Prague and across the continent to England with the clothes on your back. I made the choice to go after these statues and take the consequences, knowing someone was going to try to stop me, however they could. You didn't have the choice. That's what I thought, she replied. That means I'll just have to take you down again. Cut it out, he warned, when she slithered like a snake into his lap. You can just lie back and take it. She ran her tongue over his jaw. Or you can participate. Up to you, Slick. But either way, I'm having you. Mmm, you're all hot and sweaty. When he clamped his hands on her wrists, she just continued to use her mouth. I like it. This'll go easier on you if you cooperate. She rocked on him, then covered his mouth with hers when he moaned. Touch me. It had been so long since she'd had a man's hands on her, since she wanted them on her. Touch me. In one rough move, he had her on her back again, and his hands were everywhere. The floor was hard as rock, smelled of stale smoke, but they rolled over it as she tugged at his shirt, as she dug her nails into his back. She'd wanted this. Even knowing it was stupid, it was pointless, she'd wanted him. Every time she'd felt his gaze linger on her, every night she'd lain awake, knowing he was lying awake an arm's length away, she'd wanted him. The good, solid weight of him pressed her into the unyielding floor. Those strong, hard hands streaked over her. She bowed up when he dragged her bra down to her waist, moaned in pleasure when his mouth ravaged her breast. Her body was a banquet, sleek and curvy, with generous breasts, endless legs. He'd wanted to feast since he'd first seen her strut on stage in her man's clothes, with that knowing smirk on her fabulous face. He couldn't think about how it was a mistake. He could only think how much he needed to feed. He found her mouth again, and pain and pleasure warred through him. She was dragging his jeans down, raking her nails over his hips. 
and his blood was a raging hammer blasting against his heart, in his head. Then he was inside her, ram deep, and she was already coming around him on a wild, wet burst. Jesus! Her eyes flew open and were nearly black with shock. Jesus, what was that? I don't know, but let's try it again. Even as she shuddered, he drove himself into her in fast, nearly violent strokes. He heard her gasp for air, saw the fresh flush of heat flood her cheeks. Then she was matching him beat for frantic beat. And on the instant when he lost himself in her, she dragged his mouth back to hers. 8. Cleo lay face down and crossways on a mattress that had all the yield of concrete. Her lungs had stopped wheezing and the roar of blood in her ears had subsided to a pleasant hum. She'd had her first sexual experience at sixteen when, after a fight with her mother, she'd let Jimmy Moffat do what he'd been begging her to let him do for three months. The earth hadn't moved, but as initiators went, Jimmy had been all right. In the eleven years since, she'd had better and she had worse, and she'd learned to be selective. She'd learned what pleasured her own body and how to guide a man to satisfy her needs. She'd made some mistakes, of course, Sidney Walter being the most recent and the most costly. But by and large, she thought she had a good, healthy sex drive and a reasonably discriminating taste in bed partners. It was true that drive had diminished radically during her stint as a performer down under, but strip clubs tended to show men and sex at their most basic and ordinary. In the same way, she imagined that experience had only honed her discrimination. It certainly seemed to have worked this time around. Gideon Sullivan not only knew how to make the earth move, he had it doing the merengue, and the tango, and the rumba. The man was a regular Fred Astaire in the sheets. It was, she decided, going to add a nice dimension to this odd business partnership of theirs. Not that he considered it a partnership, but she did, and that's what counted. Plus, she had an ace in the hole. She opened her eyes and looked at the purse that sat on the pockmarked dresser. Make that a queen in the hole, she mused, a silver queen. She intended to deal squarely with him when the time came, probably. But experience had taught her it was wise to keep something in reserve. For all she knew, if she told Gideon about the statue, he'd take off with it, just as he had her earrings. Damn it, she really liked those earrings. Of course, he didn't seem to be a total prick. The man had ethics when it came to sex, and she respected that. But money was a whole different ball game. It was one thing to heat the sheets with a man she'd known less than a week, and another to trust him with a potential gold mine. Smarter, much smarter, to keep her own counsel and pump him for information. She rolled over, scraped her teeth along his hip since it was handy. I didn't realize you Irish guys had such stamina. Guinness for strength. His voice was rough with sleep. Christ Jesus, and I do need a beer. You've got a nice build here, Slick. To please herself, she walked her finger up his thigh. You work out? Like at a gymnasium? No, bunch of sweaty guys and terrifying machinery. You run? If I'm in a hurry. She laughed and slithered up to his chest. So what do you do back in Ireland? We have boats. He stirred himself to trail fingers into her hair. He really liked all that dense, dark hair of hers. Tour boats, fishing boats. Sometimes I run tourists around, sometimes I fish, and half the time I'm hammering one of those bloody boats into proper repair. That explains these. She pinched his biceps. Tell me more about the fates. I told you already. He told me some of the history stuff, but that doesn't tell me how you're so sure they're worth a lot of money. Why it's worth our time to try to track them down. I've got an investment here, too, and I don't even know for certain who the hell chased me out of Prague. I know they're worth a lot of money first because my sister, Rebecca, researched them. Becca's a demon with research and facts and data. No offense, Slick, but I don't know your sister. She's brilliant. Has so much information in her brain, I'm always expecting it to start spilling out of her ears. It was she who pushed the whole idea of the touring business on the family. She was only about fifteen, and here she comes up to Ma and Da with all these figures and projections and systems she'd put together. The economy was going to boom, she was sure of it. 
and with Cove already of interest to tourists because of the Titanic and the Lusitania and the fine scenery and harbour, we'd only have the more of them as time went on. She forgot for a moment that she was luring him into giving her more information. They listened to her? The idea of parents paying any attention to the ideas of a child seemed both fascinating and ridiculous. Sure they listened to her. Why wouldn't they? It wasn't as if they jumped up shouting, well, of course, if X has to do it, then we must. But it was discussed and picked over and hammered at until the conclusion was reached that she had a fine notion there, one worth exploring. My parents wouldn't have listened. She settled her head on his chest. Of course, by the time I was fifteen, we'd stopped having what you could define as conversations. Why would that be? Ah, uh, let's see. Oh, right, I remember. We don't like each other. Curious and struck by the sheer bitterness in her tone, he rolled them over so he could see her face. Why do you think they don't like you? Because I'm wild, argumentative, nasty, and wasted the many opportunities they offered me. Why are you smiling? I was just thinking the first three seem to be why I'm starting to like you. What opportunities did you waste? Education, social advancements, all of which I squandered or threw back in their faces, depending on my mood. Hmm. And why don't you like them? Because they never saw me. The minute she said it, she was embarrassed. Where in hell had that come from? To counter it, she wiggled under him and danced her fingers over his ass. Hey, as long as we're here. What did you want them to see? It doesn't matter. She rubbed her foot over his calf in long strokes, lifted her head enough to take a quick nip at his mouth. We washed our hands of each other some time ago. They pretty much washed hands of each other, too. Stopped pretending to be married when I was sixteen. My mother's been married twice since. My father just whores around discreetly. It's rough on you. Nothing to do with me. She jerked a shoulder. Anyway, I'm more interested in now and whether you've got one more round in you before we go get that beer. He wasn't so easily distracted once he'd pinned to a point, but he lowered his head to nibble at her throat. How'd you end up in Prague working at that club? Stupidity. He lifted his head. That's a wide area in my experience. What specific form? She huffed out a breath. If I'm not going to get laid again, I want to take a shower. I'd like to know more about the woman I'm making love with than her name. Too late, Slick. You already fucked me. The first time I fucked you, he said in a cool, steady voice that made her feel ashamed. The second time it was more. If we go on this way, there'll be more yet. That's how it works. It sounded quite a bit like a threat. Do you complicate everything? I do, yes. It's a talent of mine. You said they didn't see you. Well, I'm looking at you, Cleo, and I'm going to keep looking until I see clearly. Let's see how you deal with that. I don't like being pushed. That's a problem, then, as I'm pushy. He rolled off her. You can have the shower first, but make it snappy. I'm half starved to death and dying for a beer. He folded his hands on his belly, shut his eyes. Frowning, Cleo climbed off the bed. On her way to the bath, she shot him one last curious look, then grabbed her purse and shut herself in the bathroom. Confused her, Gideon thought. That was fine, as she sure confused the hell out of him. He waited until they were settled at one of the low tables in the pub, she with her tough little steak, he with a better choice of fish and chips. Being as your family's of New York society, would you know Anita Gay? Never heard of her. The stake required a great deal of work, but she wasn't going to complain about it. Who is she? You know Morningside Antiquities? Sure. It's one of those old snooty places where rich people pay too much for things that used to belong to other rich people. She tossed back her mass of hair. Me? I like bright, shiny, and new. He grinned. That's a damning description, particularly by a rich person. I'm not rich. My family is. Privately, he thought anyone who paid more than three hundred American dollars for something that dangled from the earlobes was either rich or foolish, possibly both. 
No inheritance. She shrugged, sawed at the beef. I've got a nice pile due when I hit thirty-five. That won't keep me in beer and pretzels for the next eight years. Where'd you learn to dance? What does Morningside have to do with our current situation? All right then. Anita Gay is at the moment in charge of Morningside, being the widow of the former proprietor. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. She wagged her fork. I remember something about that old dude, Mary Sharp, young chick. Worked for him or something? My mother got all righteous about it. Launched on the horror for weeks. Then when he kicked off, there was a whole second round. I was still speaking on rare occasions to my mother then. She was back in New York between husbands, and I said something like, "If the bimbo saw to it, the old goat died happy. What's the diff?" She, my mother, got all pissed off about it. I guess that was one of our last bouts before we did the Pontius Pilate routine. Washed your hands of each other. Bingo. Over someone else's dead husband. Actually, the hand washing came when her latest husband got a little grabby with my tits, and I was annoyed enough to tell her about it. Your stepfather touched you. His tone was filled with moral outrage. He wasn't my stepfather right at that point, and it was more grab boobs, squeeze boobs, resulting in my knee rammed into his groin sort of event rather than touching. I said he'd come on to me, and he, in a rare use of gray matter, countered that I'd come on to him. She bought his side. Foul language issued from all interested parties. I left. She married him, and they moved to his turf, L.A. She shrugged, lifted her beer. End of sentimental family saga. He touched the back of her hand. I suppose she deserves him then. I suppose she does. She shook it off, drank down beer. So Anita Gay applies to us because. She's the one who backed the muscle who went after us in Prague. Cleo pursed her lips. Maybe not such a bimbo. She's a calculating, devious woman and a thief. She has one of the fates because she stole it from us, from my brother specifically. She wants all three and won't quibble about the method of acquiring them. That's something we'll use against her. We get to the other two first, then we negotiate. So there's no client. It's your brother. My family," he corrected. Malachi, my brother, is working on another angle, and my sister is researching a third. The trouble we're having is whatever route we take. Anita Gay's right there, a step ahead, a step behind, but always close. She's anticipated us, or she has another source of information, or more troubling, she's got a way of keeping tabs on us. Which is why you and I have been staying at crappy hotels, paying cash, and you've been using a bogus name. Which can't go on much longer. He sipped his own beer while scanning the crowded, noisy pub. I'm reasonably sure we've lost her for now. It's time you got to work. His lips twitched, then curved. Partner. Doing what? You said you recalled seeing the fate, which means it's still in your family. So I think the best approach is to start off with a phone call, a nice daughterly call, I think. With just a hint of contrition and apology, she stabbed one of his chips with her fork. That's not even funny. Wasn't meant to be. I'm not calling home like some repentant prodigal. He only smiled at her. I'm not. After your story, I'm no fonder of your mother than you are. But you'll call her if you want a fifth of the take. A fifth? Check your math, slick. Nothing wrong with my figures. There are four of us and one of you. I want half. Well, you can want the world on a string, but you won't get it. A fifth of potentially millions of pounds should be enough to hold you until you reach the ripe age of thirty-five. Are things so strained between you? She'd refuse a collect call. Or perhaps you'd do better with your father. Neither of them would accept charges if I were calling from the third level of hell. But I'm not making a call anyway. You are. We、we'll、just have to put the call on a credit card. How's yours holding up? When she folded her arms over her chest, stared stonily, he shrugged. We'll put it on mine then. I'm not doing it. Best to find a phone box. He decided. If Anita has some way of tracking my card, I'd as soon not put a target on my back. Hopefully, we'll be out of London by tomorrow. In any case, you need to work in the statue, so I'm thinking a bit of sentiment there. Missing the familiar things of home, that kind of thing. 
You play it right. Maybe one of them will wire you some money. Listen to me. I'll speak very slowly and in short syllables. They wouldn't give me a dime, and I'd slit my own throat before I asked them to. Don't know till you try, do you? He tossed some money on the table. Let's find a phone box. How did you argue with someone who didn't argue back but simply kept moving forward like a big shiny steamroller? Now she was in a real fix and had very little time to wheedle her way out of it. She didn't waste her time talking to him as they walked through the light rain that turned the streets glossy black. She had to use her head, calculate her choices. She could hardly tell him, "Gee, no point in calling mom or dad because <laughs> I happen to have the statue right here in my purse." And if she called, and she'd rather be staked to an ant hill than do so, her parents would probably speak to her, coldly, dutifully, which would only piss her off. If she maintained her temper and asked about the statue, they'd ask her if she was doing drugs, a common inquiry. And she'd be reminded stiffly that the little silver statue had stood in her room at home for years, a fact they would know as her room had been searched weekly for those drugs, which she'd never done, or any sign of a moral, illegal, or socially unacceptable behavior. Since neither of those choices appealed to her, she had to come up with a third. She was still calculating when he pulled her out of the rain and into a shiny red phone booth. Take a minute to think about what you're going to say. He advised, "Which one do you think might be best? Mom in Los Angeles, Dad in New York. I don't have to decide because I'm not going to call either of them or say anything." Cleo, he tucked her wet hair behind her ear. They really hurt you, didn't they? He said it so quietly, so sweetly. She had to elbow her way around and stare out into the rain. I don't need to call him. I know where it is. He leaned down, brushed his lips over her hair. I'm sorry this is hard for you, but we can't keep knocking around from place to place this way. I said I know where it is. Get me to New York, Cleo. Damn it! Stop patting me on the head like I'm a puppy. Give me some goddamn room in here. She used her elbow again to shove him back, then dug into her purse. Here. She pushed the scanned photograph into his hands. He stared at it. Then lifted his gaze and stared at her. What the hell is this? The wonders of technology. I made a call from down under after our little sightseeing jaunt. Had a picture taken of it and sent to me on Marcella's computer. I figured you'd cough up the money I wanted and the ticket once you had proof I could get my hands on it. The chase scene changed things. Having a couple of goons come after me upped the stakes. You didn't bother to show it to me until now. A girl needs an edge slick. She could hear the temper, the cold fire of it licking at the edges of his voice. She didn't mind it. I didn't know you from Jack the Ripper when we drove out of Prague. I'd have to be pretty stupid to toss all my cards on the table until I had a handle on you. Got one now, he said softly. Enough of one to know you're supremely pissed, but you'll choke it back. First, because your mother raised you not to hit girls. Second, because you need me if you want to hold that thing in three dimensions instead of in a picture. Where is it? She shook her head. Get me to New York. How much money do you have? I'm not paying. He simply grabbed her purse. She dug her fingers into it like talons and yanked back. All right, all right. I've got about a thousand. Corona. Dollars once they're exchanged. You've got a thousand fucking dollars in here, and you haven't parted with a single flippin' cent since we started. Twenty-five pounds, she corrected. Earrings. He shoved out of the phone booth. You've just upped your investment, Cleo. You're paying to get us to New York. When Anita Gay wined and dined a client, she did so superbly. In general, she considered such matters a business investment. When the client was an attractive, desirable man she'd yet to lure into bed, she considered it a challenge. Jack Burdett intrigued her on a number of levels. He wasn't as polished, as smooth, nor was his pedigree as sterling as the men she normally chose for her escorts. But he was precisely the type she often preferred as a lover. Dark blonde hair fell as it chose around a strong, roughly hewn face that was more compelling than handsome. 
There was a faint scar running along the side of his mouth, a kind of crescent. Rumor said he'd gotten from flying glass during a bar fight in Cairo. The mouth itself had a sensual, almost hedonistic curve that told her he'd be demanding in bed once she got him there. He had a tough build to go with that tough face, broad shoulders and long arms. She knew he boxed as a hobby and thought he would strip down to his trunks very nicely. His family had had money once, a few generations back, on his mother's side. Lost Anita knew in the stock market crash of '29. Jack hadn't been raised in luxury, and had built his own tidy fortune with his electronics and security firm. A self-made man, she thought, sipping her wine, who at the age of thirty-four earned a sturdy seven figures a year, enough to indulge his other hobby, collecting. He'd been married once and divorced. He owned, among other things, a rehabbed warehouse in Soho, and lived alone in one of the lofts when he was in the city. He traveled extensively for both business and pleasure. He collected, most particularly, antique art pieces with a clearly documented history. With the first fate tucked in her safe, Anita hoped Jack Burdett could offer her a path to the others. So tell me all about Madrid. Her voice purred out just over the quiet strains of Mozart. She'd had her staff set up the table for two on the little garden terrace off the third-floor drawing room of her townhouse. I've never been and always wanted to go. It was hot. He sampled another bite of the Chateau Brion. It was perfect, of course, as was the wine, the level of the music, the light scent of verbena and roses, and the face and form of the woman across from him. Jack never trusted perfection. I didn't have much time for recreation. The client kept me busy. A few more of that paranoid, and I can retire. Who was it? When he only smiled and continued to eat, she pouted. You're so frustratingly discreet, Jack. I'm hardly going to race off to Spain and try to get through your security and rob the man. My clients pay me for discretion. They get what they pay for, he added. You should know. It's just that I find your work so fascinating. All those complicated alarm systems, infrared this and motion detecting that. Come to think of it, with your expertise, you'd make a hell of a burglar, wouldn't you? Crime pays, but not nearly well enough. She wanted something from him. He decided. The intimate meal at home was the first tip-off. Anita liked to go out, where she could see and be seen. If he'd let ego rule him, he might have convinced himself what she had on her mind was sex. Though he had no doubt she'd enjoyed sex, nearly as much as she'd enjoy using it, he imagined there was more here. The woman was a ruthless operator. It wasn't something he held against her, but neither did he intend to become another trophy on her very crowded shelf or another tool in her formidable arsenal. He let her guide the conversation. He was in no hurry for her to get to whatever point she had. She was an attractive companion and an interesting one who was knowledgeable about art, literature, music. Though he didn't share a great many of her tastes, he appreciated them. In any case, he liked the house. He'd liked it more when Paul Morningside had been alive, but a house was a house, and this one was a jewel—a jewel that maintained its dignity and its style decade after decade, and could, he assumed, continue to maintain that dignity regardless of its mistress. The atom fireplaces would always be stunning frames for simmering fires. The Waterford chandeliers would continue to drip sparkling light on gleaming wood, glinting glass, and hand-painted china. Whoever warmed themselves by the flame or turned the switch for the lamp. The Venetian side chairs would be just as lovely, no matter who sat in them. It was one of the aspects he most appreciated about the continuity of the old and the rare. Not that he could fault Anita's taste. The rooms were still elegantly furnished with the art, the antiques, the flowers placed just so. No one would ever call it homey, he supposed, but as livable galleries went, it was one of the finest in the city. As he'd designed and installed the security, he knew every inch of it. As a collector, he approved of how that space was used to display the beautiful and the precious, and rarely refused an invitation. Still. By the time they'd reached the dessert and coffee stage, 
His mind was beginning to drift toward home. He wanted to plop down in his underwear and catch a little ESPN. I had an inquiry from a client a few weeks ago that might interest you. Yeah? She knew she was losing him. It was frustrating, infuriating, and strangely arousing to have to work so hard to keep a man's attention. It was about the three fates. Do you know the story? He stirred his coffee, slow, circular motions. The three fates? I thought you might have heard of them, since your collection runs to that type of art. Legendary, so to speak. Three small silver statues, depicting the three fates of Greek mythology. When he only watched her politely, Anita told him the story, carefully picking her way through fact and fantasy, in the hope to whet his appetite. Jack ate his lemon tort, made appropriate noises, asked the occasional question, but his mind had jumped very far ahead. She wanted him to help her find the fates, he mused. He knew of them, of course. Tales of them had been among his bedtime stories as a child. If Anita was interested enough to hunt them down, it meant she believed all three were still accessible. He finished off his coffee. She was going to be very disappointed. Naturally, she continued. I explained to my client that if they ever existed, one was lost with Henry Wiley, which negates the possibility of a complete set. The other two seem to be lost in a maze of history, so even the satisfaction of locating two-thirds of the set would take considerable effort. It's a pity when you think what a fine they would be, not just in financial worth, but artistically, historically. Yeah, it's a shame, all right. No line on the other two? Oh, hints, now and then. She moved her bare shoulders, swirled her after-dinner brandy. As I said, they're legendary, at least among high-end dealers and serious collectors, so rumors about their whereabouts pop up occasionally. The way you travel and the contacts you've made around the world, I thought you might have heard about them. Maybe I haven't asked the right people the right questions. She leaned forward. Some men might have thought the candlelight flickering in her eyes made them dreamy, romantic. To Jack, they were avaricious. Maybe you haven't, she agreed. If you do, I'd love to hear the answers. You'll be the first, he assured her. When he got back to his loft, he stripped off his shirt, turned on the TV, and caught the last ten minutes of the Braves crushing the Mets. It was a keen disappointment, as he'd had twenty on the Mets, which just went to show you what happens when you bet on sentiment. He muted the screen, then picked up the phone and made a call. He asked the right person the right questions and had no intention of sharing the answers. Nine. Henry W. Wiley, Tia discovered, had been a man of diverse interests with a great lust for life. He had, she supposed, due to his working-class background, put a great deal of stock in status and appearances. He hadn't been a man to pinch pennies, and though by his own admission had enjoyed the attributes of young, comely females, had remained faithful to his wife throughout their more than three decades of marriage. That, too, she imagined, stemmed from his working-class roots and mores. As a writer, however, he could have used a good editor. He would ramble on about some dinner party, describing the food, of which he seemed inordinately fond, in such detail she could almost begin to taste the lobster bisque or rare roast beef. He talked of other guests until she could begin to imagine the music, the fashions, the conversations. And just when she'd lose herself in the moment, he'd shift into business mode and list painstakingly his current investments and interest rates, along with his own pedantic views on the politics that drove them. He was a man, Tia learned, who loved his money and loved spending it, who doted on his children and grandchildren, and considered good food one of life's greatest pleasures. His pride in wily antiques was paramount, and his ambition to make it the most prestigious dealer a steady drive. Out of that ambition had come his interest and his desire for the three fates. Here he had done his research. He tracked Clotho to Washington, D.C. in the fall of 1914. A large section of the journal was devoted to his delighted boasting of wheeling and dealing and his ultimate purchase of the silver fate for $425. 
highway robbery, he'd called it, and Tia could only agree. He had, by his own account, all but stolen the statue that would be in less than a year stolen from him in turn. But old Henry, unaware of his own fate, kept his ear to the ground. He seemed to delight in the hunt every bit as much as he did in the anticipation of a seven-course meal. In the spring of that next year, he had linked Lachesis to a wealthy barrister named Simon White Smith, Mansfield Court, London. He booked passage for himself and his wife Edith on the doomed ship, believing he would finagle the second fate for himself, for Wiley's, then follow his next lead toward Atropos to Bath. Uniting the three fates was his great ambition. For the sake of art, yes, but more for the sheen it would layer over Wiley's and his family. And, he had thought, even more than that, for the sheer fun of it all. As she read, Tia made her own notes. She'd check his facts, use his detailing to find more. She had an ambition and an anticipation of her own now. Though they had sprung out of injured pride and anger, they were no less formidable than her ancestors. She would track down the fates and would, in a manner she'd yet to completely pin down, reclaim Henry's property. She would find them with meticulous research, consistent logic, careful cross-referencing, just as he had done. When she had them, she would astonish her father, one-up the oh-so-clever Anita Gay, and skewer the detestable Malachy Sullivan. When her phone rang, she was sitting at the desk in her office, her glasses perched on her nose, as she sipped a protein supplement. As usual, when she was working, she told herself to let the machine pick up. And as usual, she worried it might be some sort of emergency only she could handle. She fretted over that for two rings, then gave in. Hello? Dr. Marsh? Yes? I'd like to speak to you about your work, specific areas of your work. She frowned at the phone, at the unrecognizable male voice. My work? Who is this? I think we have a mutual interest. So, what are you wearing? I beg your pardon? I bet you've got on silk panties. Red silk? Oh, for heaven's sake! She slammed down the phone. Embarrassed, shaken, she hugged herself and rocked. Pervert! That's it. I'm getting an unlisted number. She picked up the journal again, set it down. You'd think being listed as T.J. Marsh would be enough to protect a woman from rude, disgusting calls by sick people. She brooded over it and pulled out the white pages to look up the phone company's business office when her doorbell chimed. Her first reaction was annoyance at the interruption, and on its heels rushed a paralyzing fear. It was the man on the phone. He would break into her apartment attack her, rape her, then slit her throat from ear to ear with the large, jagged-edged knife he carried. Don't be stupid, don't be stupid. She rubbed a hand over her mouth as she got to her feet. Obscene phone callers are idiots, nuisances, who hide behind technology. It's just your mother or Mrs. Lockley from downstairs. It's nothing. But she inched her way out of the office, staring at the front door as she crossed the room. With her heart hammering, she eased up on her toes and looked through the peep. The sight of the big, tough-faced man in a black leather jacket had her gasping, spinning around with her hand to her throat she imagined about to be cut. She looked around wildly and grabbed the closest weapon. Armed with the bronze figure of Circe, she squeezed her eyes tight. Who are you? What do you want? Dr. Marsh? Dr. T. Marsh? I'm calling the police. I am the police, Detective Burdett, ma'am, NYPD. I'm holding my shield up to the Judas Hall. She'd read a book once in which the homicidal maniac had shot one of his victims through the peephole, a bullet in the eye and straight into the brain. Shaking now, she jerked toward the peep and away again, trying to get a look without risking a violent death. It looked like proper identification. What's this about, Detective Burdett? I'd just like to ask a few questions, Dr. Marsh. If I could come in? You can leave the door open if you'd be more comfortable. She bit her lip. If you couldn't trust the police, she told herself, where were you? She set the bronze aside and unlocked the door. Is there a problem, Detective? He smiled now. A friendly, 
reassuring gesture. That's what I'd like to talk to you about. He stepped inside, pleased that she felt safe enough to shut the door behind him. Has there been some trouble in the building? No, ma'am. Could we sit down? Yes, of course. She gestured to a chair, then perched on the edge of another when he sat. Nice place. Thank you. I guess you get your taste for antiques and such from your father. The blood drained out of her face. Is something wrong with my father? No, but this has something to do with your father's line of work and yours. What do you know about a set of silver statues known as the Three Fates? He saw her pupils dilate, that quick jolt of shock, and knew his instincts here were on target. What is this about? She demanded. Is this about Malachi Sullivan? Does he have something to do with the fates? I hope you've arrested him, she said bitterly. I hope you have him in jail this minute, and if he gave you my name thinking I'd help him wheedle out, you're wasting your time. Dr. Marsh. He saw the instant she made him, heard the quick gasp an instant before she tried to leap up. He was faster and pinned her back in the chair. Take it easy now. You're the one who called on the phone. You're not a cop at all. He sent you, didn't he? Jack had expected tears, screams, and was impressed when she stared holes through him instead. I don't know your Malachi Sullivan to you. My name's Jack Burdett, Burdett Securities. You're just another liar and a pervert on top of it. Fury was shrinking back, and she could feel her throat closing. I need my inhaler. You need to stay calm, he corrected when she started to wheeze. I've done business with your father. You can check with him. My father doesn't do business with perverts. Listen, I'm sorry about that. Your phone's tapped. When I realized it, I said the first thing that came to mind. My phone is not tapped. Honey, I make my living knowing this stuff. Now, I want you to relax. I'm going to give you my phone. It's secure. I want you to call the 61st Precinct and ask for Detective Robbins, Bob Robbins. You ask him if he knows me, if he'll vouch for me. If he doesn't, you tell him to send a radio card to this address. Okay with that? She pressed her lips together. He had hands like rock, she thought, and a cold expression on his face that warned her she wasn't going to get away. Give me the phone. He eased back, reached one hand into his jacket, and took out both a small phone and a business card. That's my company. I'd let you call your father for another reference, but I don't know if his phones are secure. She kept her attention on Jack as she contacted information. I want the number for the 61st Precinct in Manhattan. I want you to connect me. Jack nodded. Ask for the detective's division, Bob Robbins. She did and worked on her breathing. Detective Robbins? Yes, this is Tia Marsh. She spoke clearly, gave her address down to the apartment number. Good, Jack thought. She wasn't an idiot. There's a man in my apartment. He gained entrance by impersonating a police officer. He says his name is Jack Burdett and that you'll reassure me as to his character. She lifted her brows. About 6'2", 230, dark blonde hair, gray eyes. Yes, a small scar, right side of the mouth. I see. Yes, I see. I couldn't agree more, thank you. She tilted her ear away from the phone for a moment. Detective Robbins confirms that he knows you, that you're not a psychopath, and assures me he'll be happy to kick your butt for impersonating an officer, as well as issue a warrant for your arrest should I want to pursue that option. He also says you owe him twenty dollars. He'd like to speak with you. Thanks. Jack took the phone and a step back. Yeah, yeah, I'll fill you in first chance I get. What fake ID? I don't know what you're talking about. Later. He broke the connection, pocketing the phone. Okay? He asked Tia. No, it's not okay. It's certainly not okay. Excuse me. She popped out of the chair and marched out of the room. Because he wasn't entirely sure she wasn't going for a weapon, Jack followed her. She opened a cupboard in the kitchen, and his brows shot up at the rows of pill bottles. She snagged aspirin, wrenched open the refrigerator. I have a tension headache, thank you very much. I apologize. I couldn't risk the phone. Look. He lifted the kitchen portable off its stand, 
opened the mouthpiece. See this? It's a tap. Decent quality. Since I wouldn't know a listening device from a horned toad, I'll just have to take your word, won't I? His research hadn't indicated she was quick. Guess you will. I'd be careful what I said on this line. Why should I take your word, Mr. Burdett? Jack, make it Jack. Got any coffee? Her withering look made him shrug. Okay, I need a gay. He smiled when she slowly lowered the water bottle. Thought that would ring a bell. Odds are she's the one who got your phone tapped. She wants the fates, and you and your family have a connection to them. Henry Wiley's statue of Clotho wasn't lost on the Lusitania, was it, Tia? If you and Anita are friends, ask her. I didn't say we were friends. I'm a collector. That's something you can confirm with your father, but I'd appreciate it if you'd do it face to face so Anita isn't tracking my moves. I've bought some nice pieces from Wiley's. The latest was a Lalique vase, molded. Six nude maidens pouring water from urns. I like naked women, he said with a chuckle. Sue me. I thought you liked red silk panties. I haven't got anything against them. I can't help you, Mr. Burdett. You might as well go back and tell Miss Gay she's wasting her time with me. I don't work with or for Anita. I work for myself, and I have a personal interest in the fates. Anita dropped some bait on me. Got to figure she's hoping I'll do some of her legwork and lead her to them. She's miscalculated. She's covering bases with you too, he added, gesturing toward the phone. I'm betting you know something she doesn't. I think we can help each other out. Why should I help you, even if I could? Because I'm really good at what I do. You tell me what you know, and I'll find them. That's what you want, isn't it? I haven't decided what I know. Who's Malachi Sullivan? That's one thing I'm sure of. Sure, because the mere mention of his name made her chest tight. He's a liar and a cheat. He claimed that Anita duped him, but for all I know, they're thick as thieves. She decided. Where would I find him? I assume he's back in Ireland, Cove. But I'd prefer he was roasting in hell. What's his connection? She hesitated. Then can find no reason not to elaborate. He claims that Anita stole one of the fates from him, but as his tongue would probably turn black if it tasted truth, I reason to doubt that. Now this has been very interesting, but you've interrupted my work. You've got my card. You think about it, get in touch. He started out, then turned and looked back at her. If you know anything, be careful where you step. Anita's a snake to you. The kind that likes to gulp down soft, pretty things. And what are you, Mr. Burdett? I'm a man who respects and appreciates the whims of fate. Malachi Sullivan, he thought as he walked out. It looked as if Jack was going to take a trip to Ireland. It was a long trip from London to New York. Longer when you were wedged into a center seat the size of a postage stamp between a woman whose legs were nearly as long as your own and a man who used his elbows like switchblades. Gideon tried to bury himself in his book, but even Steinbeck's brilliant prose couldn't compete. So he spent the hours thinking, winding his way through the morass of the situation he and his family had gotten themselves into. He survived the flight, then shuffled brainlessly through the agony of customs and baggage retrieval. You're sure about this friend of yours? He asked Cleo. Look, you asked me to come up with a friend in the city who put us up for a few days. No questions, no hassles, because you're too cheap to spring for a hotel. That's Mikey. I can't afford a bloody hotel at this point, and I don't know how you can trust a grown man named Mikey. You're just cranky. Cleo took deep gulps of air as they walked through the terminal. It was airport air, but it was New York. You should have slept in the plane. I slept like a log. I know it, and for that single act, I'll hate you to my dying day. Bitch, bitch, bitch. It won't bother me a bit. She stepped outside into the choking exhaust and hellacious noise. Oh, baby, I am back. He'd hoped to doze in the cab, but the driver had some sort of eye-twitching Indian music on the radio. How long have you known this, Mikey? I don't know, six, seven years, I guess. We've done some gigs together. He's a stripper. 
No, he's not a stripper, Cleo retorted. He's a dancer, and so am I. Look, I've done Broadway. Briefly, but she'd done it. We were partnered up in the revival of Greece. Did the road tour. The two of you have a thing going. No. She tucked her tongue in her cheek. Mikey's a lot more likely to hit on you than on me. Oh, wonderful. You're not homophobic, are you? I don't think so. He was too tired to search his social conscience. Just remember the cover story and stick to it. Shut up, Slick. You're spoiling my homecoming. Been a week with the woman. He grumbled as he shut his eyes. Not once does she use my name. Cleo glanced over at him and found herself smiling. He was all rumpled and tapped out, and so damn cute with it. He'd be feeling a whole lot better in a day or two after she'd implemented her plan. He wasn't the only one who'd spent time thinking on the flight. The first order of business was getting the statue to a nice, secure place, say a bank box. Then she'd contact Anita Gay and get down to serious negotiations. She figured she could settle for a cool million, and being a stand-up gal, she intended to split it with Gideon. Sixty forty. Oh, he'd bitch about it, but she'd bring him around. A bird in the hand, after all. He was never going to finesse the first fate from a woman like Gay, not in this lifetime. And if he wanted to go chasing off after the third, well, he'd have financial backing. She was doing him a favor, payback to her way of thinking for getting her to New York, and for finding her a way to plump up her bank account. Six hundred thousand would tide her over very nicely. After he'd calmed down, maybe he'd hang in New York for a few weeks. She'd like to show him around, show him off too. Despite the heat, Cleo rolled down the window so New York could slap her in the face. The blast of horns was music as the cab inched its way in jerks through crosstown traffic. By the time they pulled to the curb in front of Mikey's building off Ninth, she was riding on such a high she didn't think to complain when Gideon told her to pay the driver. So what do you think? She demanded. About what? He asked groggily. New York. You said you hadn't been here before. He looked around numbly. It's crowded. It's noisy, and everybody looks annoyed about something. Yeah. Cleo felt sentimental tears clog her throat. It's the best. She danced up to the call box at the entrance to the building and pressed Mikey's button. Moments later, there was a long, vaguely obscene sucking sound that made Cleo laugh. Mikey, you perv, buzz me in. It's Cleo. Cleo. Damn! Get your fine firm ass in here. The buzzer sounded, locks clicked, and Cleo dragged open the door. There was a tiny closet of a lobby and a dull gray elevator that made suspicious grinding noises as the doors opened. But Cleo, apparently unconcerned, stepped right on and pushed a button for the third floor. Mikey's from Georgia, Cleo told Gideon, from a fine, upstanding family full of doctors and lawyers. Since we both ended up being an embarrassment to our parents, we bonded fast. At the moment, Gideon didn't care if Mikey came from Georgia or the moon, whether he was gay or had three heads, as long as he had a shower with hot running water and an available bed. When the doors ground open again, Gideon got a glimpse of a tall, dark-skinned man wearing a red muscle shirt, tight black pants, and an explosion of glossy dreadlocks. He let out a ululant howl that had Gideon bracing for attack, then moved like lightning. Cleo was plucked off her feet and swung around. Before Gideon could react, she was plunked down again, then whipped into some sort of dance. He thought it was a kind of jitterbug that spun her and her partner down the narrow hallway. She didn't miss a beat, and ended the impromptu number with her arms wrapped around his neck and her legs around his waist. Baby doll, where have you been? Everywhere, Jesus, Mikey, you look great. Damn right I do. He kissed her one cheek, the other, then with a humming smack on the lips. You look like you've been dragged through the street and dumped on the curb. Could use a shower. She rested her head on his shoulder. So could my friend. Mikey angled his head. His body and gave Gideon a long, piercing look. Hmm, what have you brought me, Cleopatra? 
His name's Gideon. Enjoying herself, Cleo ran her tongue over her top lip. He's Irish. I picked him up in Prague. I'm keeping him for a while. He's fucking gorgeous. Yeah, he's got some personality flaws, but in the looks department, he's aces. Come on, Slick, don't be shy. Does that mean the show's over for now? Moves well, Mikey commented when Gideon came down the hall. Lovely accent. So is yours. At Gideon's response, Mikey's lips spread in a huge toothy grin. Come inside. I want to hear everything. And though, in Gideon's opinion, the man was built like a toothpick, he carried Cleo's not unsubstantial weight into the apartment. It's humble, he added, setting Cleo down, patting her ass. But it's home. Gideon didn't see humble. What he saw was color, from the navy blue walls and white trim, the dozens of theater posters, the wildly geometric pattern in the rug. The couch was white leather, big as a boat, and piled with plump, multicolored pillows. He imagined falling face down on it and sleeping for the rest of his life. Cocktails, Mikey announced. Tall, frosty cocktails. I think Slick here could use a tall, frosty shower first, Cleo said. Go ahead, back through the bedroom there on the right. He glanced at Mikey, got a friendly wave of invitation. Help yourself, handsome. Thanks. Gideon hauled his duffel with him and left them alone. Gin and tonics, I think. Mikey crossed to the glossy white bar. Lots of ice, lots of gin, and a whiff of tonic for form. Then you can tell Daddy all. Sounds perfect. Mikey, can we bunk here a couple days? Me casa and all that sugar plum. It's a hell of a story. She crossed over to the bedroom door. Angled her head in until she heard the shower start. Then, easing the door shut, she walked back to the bar and told him the whole of it. Gideon was wet and naked when she stepped into the bathroom with the gin and tonic. Thought this might come in handy. Thanks. He took the glass, downed the contents in one grateful gulp. Do we stay? We stay. She confirmed. In fact, he's generously offered you his bed. Gideon remembered it from his pass through to the shower, big, soft, red, and so appealing at that point he barely blinked at the mirrors on the ceiling over it. Do I have to sleep with him? She laughed. No, you get me. Go ahead, tune out for a few hours. I will. In the morning, we're going to work out how to get our hands on the fate. I'm too punchy to think straight now. Then get some sleep. Mike and I can spend some time catching up before he leaves for the theater. He's in the chorus of "Kiss Me, Kate." Good for him. Tell him I appreciate the hospitality. Still naked, still damp, Gideon went to the bed, crawled in, and conked out. He woke to the sounds of horns and the rumble of garbage trucks. While his brain caught up, he stared in mild fascination at the reflection in the overhead mirror. The red sheets hit him at the waist, so that he looked as if he'd been cut in two during the night. No, he corrected. Like they had. Cleo was sprawled over him, her hair swept back, black against red, so that it seemed to melt into the sheets. Her skin was shades darker than his own, so that the arm she'd flung over his chest, the long curve of her shoulder, the long line of her back lay like gold dust against the white of him and the glossy scarlet sheets. He remembered the dreamy sensation of her sliding into bed sometime in the night, of her sliding over him in the dark. And him sliding into her, she hadn't spoken, not a word. He hadn't been able to see her, but he'd known the shape of her and the taste, even the scent. What did it mean? He wondered when he knew her so instantly, so intimately in the dark. He'd have to think about it eventually, just as he'd have to analyze why, with a bed as big as a lake, they'd tangled together in sleep and held on. But for now, there were other things to think about. A man couldn't trust his brain until it had been primed with coffee. He started to ease away and was surprised and oddly touched when Cleo shifted closer and snuggled in. It made him want to cuddle right back and perhaps wake her so he could make proper use of the mirror on the ceiling. Won't do, he thought, and giving her a careless kiss on the top of her head, untangled himself. 
He tugged on Jean's and, leaving her sleeping, went out to find the kitchen. His first jolt of the day didn't come from caffeine, but from seeing Mikey stretched out on the white leather couch, all but buried in the colorful pillows, his own dreadlocks and a sheet of bright emerald green. Though it felt awkward, the desire for coffee was stronger than his sense of propriety. Gideon skirted the couch and moved as quietly as possible into the kitchen. It was like a page from a catalog, all glossy and spotless with a number of canny-looking devices tidily arranged on the counter. He opened cupboards, found dishes of navy and white in perfectly alternating stacks, glasses arranged according to type and size, and finally, when he was on the point of whimpering, a bag of coffee. He opened it, swore under his breath when he stared into a bag of fragrant beans. What the hell do I do with these? Chew them? You could, but it's easier to grind them. Gideon jolted, spun, and stared. Mikey was wearing a pair of gold briefs that barely covered his balls. Ah, uh, sorry, didn't mean to wake you. I sleep like a cat. Mikey plucked the bag from Gideon's hand and poured some of the beans into a grinder. Nothing like the smell of freshly ground beans, he said over the noise of it. Did you sleep well? I did, yes, thanks. We shouldn't have kicked you out of your own bed. Two of you, one of me. He sent Gideon a sidelong look as he measured out water. You must be starving. How about some breakfast to go with this? I'm in the mood for French toast. That'd be brilliant. It's kind of you to let us drop in on you this way. Oh, Cleo and me, we go back. With a careless wave, Mikey started the coffee, then turned to get eggs and milk from the refrigerator. That girl's my honey. I'm so glad to see her back and hooked up with someone with style. I warned her about that Sydney character. He looked tasty, no argument there, but he was all flash, no substance. And what does he do but steal her money and leave her high and dry? He made disapproving sounds while he cracked eggs into a bowl. And in Prague, of all places? But she told you all about that. Not really. And Gideon was fascinated. You know, Cleo, she tends to skim over the details. Wouldn't have run off with that rat bastard, excuse my French, if her daddy hadn't told her again how she wasted her time, how she was embarrassing herself in the family. How? Dancing. Theater. He said it with a deliberately dramatic air, doing a fluid leg extension as he got down coffee mugs. Fraternizing with people like me, not only a black man, but a gay black man, a gay black dancing man. I mean, really. Cream? Sugar? No, thanks. Just straight. He winced. That is... Mikey let out a rollicking laugh. Me? I like a whole lot of sugar. He wouldn't like you either. Mikey added, as he handed Gideon a mug. Ah, Cleopatra's daddy? No? Well, fuck him. Gideon lifted his mug in toast, then drank. Ah, oh, God be praised. Drink up, honey. Mikey dipped thick slices of sourdough bread in the egg batter. You and me, we're gonna get along just fine. And they did. Plowing through half a loaf of bread, a pot of coffee and nearly a quart of the orange juice Mikey squeezed fresh. By the time Cleo staggered out of the bedroom, Gideon no longer found anything odd about the gold briefs, the tattoo of a dragon on Mikey's left shoulder blade, or being called honey by another man. Part 2 Measuring I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. T.S. Eliot 10. Sugar Plum, I'm not sure you're doing the right thing here. I'm doing the smart thing, Cleo insisted. The smart thing's always the right thing. Whatever's going on between you and Gideon is going to get screwed up. Mikey shook his head as they hit the bustle of Broadway and squeezed through the eastbound crosswalk traffic. I've got a good feeling about you two, and you're going to fuck it over before you get it started. You're too romantic for your own good. Can't be. He disagreed. Romance turns sex into art. Without it, it's just a messy, sweaty business. That's why you get your heart broken, Mikey, and I don't. A little heartbreak would do you good. Don't sulk. Because she knew he would, she slid an arm around his waist as they turned on the corner of 7th and 52nd and headed north. 
Besides, I'm doing this for him as well as myself. Once Anita's got the fate, she'll leave him alone, and he'll have a big fat pile of money out of it. The statue is mine, after all. I don't have to share, but I'm going to. She gave him a quick squeeze as she swung into the bank. Let's make this as fast as we can. If I don't meet him by one, he's going to ask questions, and... She added, dropping her voice as they stepped into the quiet lobby. He's got something going himself right this minute, or he'd never have agreed so easily to me heading out to run some errands without him. Your trouble, Cleopatra, is you're a cynic. You try working a few months in a strip club in the Czech Republic, she chided. We'll see if you come out of it with a Pollyanna complex. You didn't go into this with one, he pointed out, and she gave him a smirk as she stepped up to a teller. I need to get a safe deposit box. When she walked back out on 7th, the fate was safely locked in the vault. Both she and Mikey had keys. That, she'd calculated, was the smartest move. If there was any trouble which she didn't anticipate, he could retrieve the statue in her stead. Okay, now I make the call, set up the meet. Some plays public, she added, as she held out a hand for Mikey's cell phone but where it's unlikely anyone we know will come by and recognize us. It's like a spy thriller. And because he loved a good melodrama, Mikey grinned as he handed her his phone. It's business, and I've got the perfect spot for it. She pulled out the scrap of paper on which she'd written the number for Morningside and dialed as they walked toward 6th. Anita Gay, please, it's Cleo Tolliver. I think she'll recognize the name and speak with me now. If she doesn't, just tell her I'm calling to discuss the price of fate. Yes, that's right. With her destination already in mind, she turned south on 5th and lost Mikey briefly when he glued himself to a jewelry store window. Stay with me and don't be such a girl. She gave one of his dreads a tug. This is serious business. Oh, you sound all cold and tough, Mikey commented. Like Joan Crawford, I'm no, 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 Barbara Stanwyck in Double Indemnity, a woman with balls. Shut up, Mikey, she ordered, and bit back a snicker as Anita Gay came on the line. Cleo. The voice didn't sound cold or tough, but soft and warm as velvet. I can't tell you how delighted I am to hear from you. Cleo considered it a good sign Anita had agreed to the terms of the meeting without hesitation. She thought of the wild race across Europe and shook her head. Men, she decided. They had to flex their muscles, turn a simple business deal into an altercation. No wonder the world was so screwed up. She felt a little foolish with her choice of arenas. But Mikey was getting such a kick out of it all now, she deemed it worth it. In a fair to remember, Cary Grant, Deborah Carr? He stood on the observation level of the Empire State Building, arms spread, dreads flying. That's romance, baby. And the difference between them, Cleo mused was that the spot reminded her not of poignant romance, but of King Kong's fatal obsession with Fay Ray. She considered Fay Ray's character a moron, cringing and screaming on the ledge, waiting for the big strong man to rescue her, Cleo thought, instead of getting her ass moving when the idiot ape set her down. Well, it took all kinds. You go stand over there, keep me in sight. When she shows, I'll give you a sign if she gives me any grief. Then you can hulk over and help me out. She checked the Wonder Woman watch Mikey had lent her. She'll be here any minute. If she's on time, we'll stay on schedule. I've got a good half hour before I'm supposed to meet Gideon. What are you going to tell him? Same old, same old, until I have the cash in hand. I can stall him for another 24 hours, and that's the deadline I'll give Anita. A million smackaroos is a lot to put together in a day, Cleo. We're talking Morningside here, and that spells Boku de Nero. She wants the fate. She'll find a way. I'm going to stand over there and practice looking bored. She wandered to the safety rail, leaned back on it, and watched the elevator through the glass. Tourists swarmed the souvenir shop inside or stood out snapping pictures, shoving coins into the telescopes. She wondered if anyone who lived in the city ever came here unless they were dragged along by out-of-towners. And she wondered why anyone felt compelled to come all the way up here when all the action, all the life, all the meaning was down on the streets. Her belly tightened when she saw the spiffy-looking woman step out of the elevator. Anita had said she'd be wearing a blue suit. The number was blue, all right, smoke blue, with a long, sleek jacket, 
a tube of a skirt cut at a conservative length. Valentino, Cleo decided, all richly understated and whispering of class. She waited while Anita slipped on dark glasses and stepped out into the wind. Watched while the woman scanned the area, the faces, and honed in on her. She shifted the slim leather portfolio bag on her shoulder and crossed over. Cleo Tolliver. Anita Gay. Cleo accepted the handshake while the two women measured each other. I almost expected to have to exchange passwords. There was a trace of humor in the tone as Anita glanced around. You know, this is the first time I've been up here. What is the point? Since it so clearly mirrored her own sentiments, Cleo nodded. You got that right. But it seemed like a good place to do a little private business in a public place. A place where we both feel comfortable. We'd both feel more comfortable at a table of Raphael's. But I imagine Gideon's filled you with trepidation about dealing with me. Anita spread her arms, looking chic, attractively windblown and amused. As you can see, I'm no threat. The muscle you had chased us down in Prague didn't seem very friendly. An unfortunate miscommunication, which often happens when you're dealing with men, doesn't it? Anita tucked her hair behind her ear. My representatives were instructed to stop by your place of employment and speak to you. No more, no less. Apparently Gideon and they became a little overexcited. In point of fact, Cleo, my representatives thought you were being abducted and pursued. Is that right? A miscue, as I said. In any case, I'm happy you're back in New York, safe and sound. I'm sure you and I can discuss the matter without the histrionics. She glanced around again. Gideon's not with you. I brought someone else in case of histrionics. She could see Mikey over Anita's shoulder. He stood several feet away, elaborately flexing his biceps. First, what made you track me down and instruct your representatives to speak with me? A hunch, after considerable research. Both are vital in my business. This meeting today makes me assume both were accurate. Do you have a fate, Cleo? If there'd been more time, Cleo would have made her work harder, for form's sake. I've got it in a safe place. I'm willing to sell it. One million dollars cash. Anita let out a laughing breath. A million dollars. Gideon certainly told you some fairy tales. Don't try to hose me, Anita. You want the statue. That's the price. Non-negotiable. That gives you two of three since you've already stolen one from Gideon's brother. Stolen? Annoyance flashed through her as she turned to pace. As she paced... She scanned the others on the deck, trying to pick out Cleo's backup. Those Sullivans, I should sue them for slander. Morningside's reputation is above reproach, and so is mine. She added tightly, as she stopped to face Cleo again. I purchased that statue from Malachi Sullivan, and will be happy to produce the signed receipt. For all I know, he may very well have told his brother some trumped-up story and kept the money for himself. But I will not have them spreading vicious lies about my company. How much did you pay him? Less. She seemed to draw herself in. Considerably less than your asking price. Then you got a bargain first time out. You get number two, you pay. You can have her in your hands tomorrow, three o'clock, right here in this spot. You bring the cash, I bring the girl. Cleo. Anita's lips curved thinly. I've dealt with the Sullivans. How do I know you're not as underhanded as they? I have no assurance you actually have the fate. Saying nothing, Cleo reached in her bag and took out the photograph. Locasis, Anita murmured as she studied the photo. How do I know this is authentic? I guess you play your hunch. Look, my grandmother gave it to me when I was a kid. She had a couple of loose screws and thought about it like a doll. Up until about a week ago, I considered it a sort of good luck charm. A million buys me a hell of a lot of luck. Anita continued to study the picture as she considered her options. The rundown confirmed what Cleo's father had told Anita during a long evening of perfectly prepared coq au vin, a superior Pinot Noir, and mediocre sex. Interestingly, the man hadn't known that his daughter was in New York or had been in Prague. In fact, he couldn't have been less informed or concerned about his only child's whereabouts or well-being, which meant handily 
No one was likely to look if Cleo Tolliver suddenly disappeared. I assume the fate is yours legally. Cleo arched her eyebrows. Possession and all that. Yes. Anita smiled and couldn't have agreed more. Of course. She took the picture back, tucked it in her bag. Your call, Anita. That's a lot of money in a short amount of time. We can meet tomorrow, that table at Raphael's. You bring the statue so I can examine it. I'll bring a quarter million as deposit. All. Straight exchange, right here at three. Or I'd put it on the open market. I'm a professional dealer. I'm not, Cleo interrupted. And I've got another appointment, fish or cut bait. All right, but I'm not carrying that kind of cash into this place. She looked around, a faint line of annoyance between her perfect eyebrows. A restaurant, Cleo, let's be civilized. You pick the spot if you don't trust me. That's reasonable. Teresa's in the East Village. I've got a yen for some goulash. Make it one o'clock. One o'clock. Anita offered her hand again. And if you decide to give up the theater, I could use someone like you at Morningside. Thanks, but I'll stick with what I know. See you tomorrow. She waited until Anita was back in the elevator. Then she counted to ten, slowly. When she turned to where Mikey was waiting, she broke out into a grin. She did a quick tap shuffle in his direction. Kiss me, baby, I'm rich. She went for it? All the way. Put up a struggle, but not much of one. Overreacted to some stuff, underreacted to others. She hooked her arm through Mikey's. She's not as good as she thinks she is. She'll cough up the dough because I've got what she wants. I never got the chance to hulk and look mean. Sorry, you'd have been great. She walked with him through the souvenir shop to the elevators. You know the first thing I'm going to do when I get the money? I'm throwing a big kick-ass party. No, first I'm buying a place, then I'm throwing a big kick-ass party. Guess you won't be heading out to the cattle calls anymore. You kidding? She squeezed in the elevator car with him. Let me wallow in it for a week, maybe two. Then I'm going to every audition my agent can push me into. You know how it is, Mikey. Gotta dance. I can get you a shot at the chorus of Kiss Me Kate. No, shit, that'd be great. When? Let me put the word in with the director tonight. Told you my luck was changing. She rode on it all the way down to ground level. I got a split, she said on the street. Go meet Slick. Why don't you come to the show tonight? I'll get you a couple house seats and introduce you to the director. Cool, I love you, Mikey. She gave him a long, noisy kiss. Look, I'll meet you back at your place in a few hours. I'm going to buy a big bottle of champagne. Buy two. We'll get toasted after the show. That's a deal. I love you, Mikey. I love you, Cleopatra. He headed west. She headed east. As she crossed the street, she glanced back, laughing like a loon when he threw her a kiss. With a spring in her step, she started uptown. Right on schedule, she thought. She'd meet Gideon on the east corner of 51st and 5th. Maybe grab some pizza. She'd tell him she needed another day or two to get the statue. He wouldn't like it, but she'd smooth it out. And when she handed him $400,000 the next day, he'd have no room to bitch. She'd talk him into staying in New York for a while. Maybe Mikey was right about the thing between them. Not the romance part, that wasn't in the cards. But she had a good feeling when she was with him. She liked the steady side of him as much as she liked the reckless one. What was wrong with wanting a little more time with both? The glint from a jewelry display caught her eye, had her moving toward the window. She'd buy Mikey something to thank him for the help, something extravagant. She brooded over the gold neck chains, too ordinary, and the flash of stones, too gaudy. Slowing her pace, she browsed from window to window, then let out a little aha at the wink of a thin gold anklet with ruby cabochons. Tailor-made for Mikey, she decided, and tilted her head in hopes of seeing the price tag tucked discreetly under the chain. She froze that way, her nose all but pressed to the window, her body in a slight dip as she caught a reflection in the glass. She knew that face. Though he was turned away from her in profile, as if studying the traffic, she recognized him. They'd all but run over him on the street in Prague. 
Shit, shit, shit. She straightened, then moved casually on, as if to study the offerings in the next display. He didn't follow, but angled his body a little more toward her. Anita fucking gay, she thought. So businesslike, the professional dealer, and she sent out one of her goons. Well, that was fine. That was great because this was New York. This was her turf. She sauntered as if she had all the time in the world. He was following now. She noted and careful to keep pace. She kept sauntering right into the international jewelry exchange, meandering into the babble of voices down the crowded aisles between booths. He kept half the store between them, shaking his head, scowling when the merchants began their pitch, and she sprinted. Her long legs ate up the distance to the side door. She was through it and loping across the street and muscling aside a man who was about to climb into a cab. While he stumbled back, shouted at her, she slammed the cab door. Step on it. Get me five blocks down in under a minute. I got twenty dollars. She pulled a bill out of her pocket, waved it even as she glanced over and saw her tail running across the street. For added incentive, she shoved the twenty into the security slot. Move, he moved. Cut over to park, she ordered, swiveling around on her knees to watch out the rear window. Go up to fifty first and cut back to fifth. Yeah, baby, she waved as he charged down the cross street. Already huffing and puffing. Still, she watched until they hit Madison. When they made the right on Park, she dropped back down on the seat. Fifty-first and fifth, she repeated coolly. Drop me on the east corner. That's a hell of a ride, lady, for a couple of blocks. You get what you pay for. She popped out on the corner, grabbed Gideon's hand. You're late, he began, but she was already running. What's going on? Taking a subway ride slick? You haven't been to New York until you do. Summer tourists were thronged around Rockefeller Center. All the better for cover, she decided, if they needed it. Then she whipped him down the stairs of the subway stop at Fifty Rock. My treat, she added, and dug out the fare for both of them. When they were through the turnstiles on the platform, she caught her breath. We'll get off at Washington Square, bop around the village, give you a real tour, grab some lunch. Why? Because a girl's got to eat. Why do we run like maniacs into the tube to ride a train to a village, the village, you alien? And we're taking a ride to make sure I've thrown off the shadow. I was doing a little window shopping on Fifth, and who should I see but one of our friends from Prague? He grabbed her as the rumble of the approaching train shook the air. Are you sure? Absolutely. He's got a face like a pie plate, flat, round, and shiny. I ditched him, but maybe he circled around so better safe than sorry. She pushed through into the car, dropped down on a seat. She patted the place beside her. What have you done, Cleo? What do you mean? What have I done? I just told you. Imagine that asshole thinking he could tag me in my city. And he just happened to be walking down the same street at the same time as you. I don't think so. Actually, Fifth is an avenue as opposed to a. His hand tightened on her arm. A hard warning. What have you done? Where's Mikey? Hey, ease up, pal. We ran some errands, hung out a little. It's a free country. I did some window shopping on the way to meet you, and he headed home to catch a nap. Mikey's not a morning person, and you had him up at dawn. How did she know where to find you? Look, you said you ditched him. Just one. What about the other guy? He was really bumming out her triumphant mood. How the hell do I know? Are they joined at the hip? How long after you and Mikey split up did you see him? Jesus, a few minutes, a couple of blocks. What's the big? But she trailed off as it struck her. You think the other one moved on Mikey? That's crazy. He's not part of this. But she'd made him part of it. She realized, and the arm Gideon gripped began to tremble. Okay, so maybe they'll follow him. Maybe they will. We'll just get off at the next stop, and I'll call him on his cell phone, clue him in. He'll lose a tail as easy as I did. He'll get a kick out of it. But her hands were like ice by the time she pushed her way out at the 34th Street stop, got to a phone, and her fingers shook as she punched in the numbers. You got me spooked, she grumbled. Wait till I tell Mikey; he'll laugh his bony ass off. Answer, damn it! Answer the phone. But in two rings, his cheerful and recorded voice came on. I'm busy, honey. Hopefully, making sweet love.
Leave a message and Mikey will get back to you. He made a signature kissing sound that ran right into the beep. He's turned it off. She took a calming breath, then another. He's home taking a nap and he's turned off his pocket phone, that's all. Ring him on the landline, Cleo. I'm just going to wake him up, she dialed. He hates it when you wake him up from a nap. The phone rang four times. She was braced for another recording when he answered. The instant she heard his voice, she knew he was in trouble. Mikey. Don't come back here, Cleo. There was a shout, a crash, and she heard him call her name again. Run. Mikey. A second crash and the short scream had her hand going wet on the receiver. Even when the phone went dead in her ear, she kept shouting his name. Stop, stop it. Gideon pried the phone out of her fingers. They're hurting him. We have to get there. We have to help him. Call the police, Cleo. He clamped his hands on her shoulders before she could run. Call them now. Give them his name, his address. We're too far away to help. The police. Don't give your name, he added as she fumbled to hit 911. Just his. Make sure they hurry. I need the police. I need help. She ignored the calm voice of the emergency operator. Mikey. Michael Hicks. 445 West 53rd. Apartment 302. Just, just off 9th Avenue. You have to hurry. You have to help. They're hurting him. They're hurting him. Gideon depressed the receiver as she began to cry. Hold it together. Just hold it together. We're going. Which train do we take? What's the fastest way to get there? Nothing could be fast enough. Not with that scream of pain and terror echoing in her head. She all but flew the blocks from the subway stop, but it wasn't fast enough. Relief spurted through her when she spotted the two radio cars outside Mikey's building. They got here, she managed. New York's finest. Uniforms were already setting up barricades, and a small crowd was gathering. Don't say anything, Gideon warned with his lips against her temple. Let me ask. There should be an ambulance. He needs to get to the hospital. I know they heard him. Just stay quiet and I'll find out. Gideon kept his arm tight around her as they stepped up to the barricade. What's going on? He glanced toward a bike messenger who was straddling his ride and snapping a wad of gum. Dude got killed in there. No. Cleo shook her head slowly from side to side. No. Hey, I should know. I was heading in to make my delivery when the cops came back out. Said I had to hang out and be interviewed and shit, because they had a homicide on the third floor. Suit cops are coming, you know, like on NYPD Blue. One of the uniform dudes told me this black guy got his face and head all bashed to shit. No, 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 she said again, her voice rising as Gideon pulled her away. Keep moving, Cleo. We're just going to keep moving for a little while. He's not dead. That's a lie, a stupid fucking lie. We're going to his show tonight. He's getting us house seats. We're going to get shit-faced on champagne. He is not dead. We were just... It was only an hour ago. I'm going back. I, I've got to go back. He needed to get her someplace quiet, someplace private. Gideon wrapped both arms around her to hold her still. Where the hell do you find quiet in a city like this? Cleo, you listen to me. Just listen to me. We can't stay here. It isn't safe. When she let out a low moan, when her knees buckled, he took her weight. He half-dragged, half-carried her down the street. We need to get inside somewhere. You need to sit down. He scanned the street, the shops, and spotted a bar. There was nothing he decided like an urban dive for a little privacy. He pulled her inside, keeping his arm banded around her. There were only three patrons all hunched at the bar. None of them even bothered to glance over as he poured Cleo into a dim corner booth. Two whiskeys, he ordered. Doubles. He dragged out bills, slapped them on the bar. He carried the glasses back to where she was curled in a ball in the corner of a booth. He slid in beside her, took her chin firmly in his hand, and poured half the shot down her throat. She choked, sputtered, then simply laid her head down on the table and sobbed like a baby. It's my fault. It's my fault. I need you to tell me what happened. He lifted her head again, held the glass to her lips. Take another drink and tell me what you did. 
I killed him. Oh, God. Oh, God, Mikey's dead. I know it. He picked up his own untouched glass of whiskey and urged it on her. Better drunk, he thought, and half passed out than hysterical. What did you and Mikey do, Cleo? I asked him. He'd have done anything for me. I loved him, Gideon. I loved him. Now he thought in grief. She finally used his name. I know you did. I know he loved you. I thought I was so smart. Her tears plopped on his hand as he made her take another swallow. I had it all figured out. I'd sell that bitch the fate, skin her for a million dollars, give you a nice cut to keep you happy and dance in the goddamn street. Christ, you contacted her. I called her, set up a meet, my turf, top of the fucking Empire State. She continued with her voice slurring now with liquor. Like King Goddamn Kong. Mikey went with me just in case she got testy, but she didn't. Butter wouldn't melt. Didn't have a good word to say about you or your brother, but that's beside the point. Gonna give me a million dollars tomorrow, cash money. I give her the little lady. Sensible deal, no harm, no foul. Mikey and I got a good laugh out of it. I told him the whole story, you know. Yeah, I got that. Gonna split it with you, slick. Sixty, forty. She swiped at tears and smeared mascara over her cheek, over the back of her hand. You got a $400,000 bird in the hand. Why beat around the fucking bush, right? He couldn't work up any anger. Not when she was shattered. He pushed her hair back from her damp cheeks. No, I guess you don't. But she was never going to give me the money. She played me. Mikey's dead because I was too stupid to know it. I'll never forgive myself. Never. Not for as long as I live. He was harmless. Gideon, he was harmless and sweet, and they hurt him. They hurt him. I know it, darling. He drew her head down on his shoulder, stroking her hair as she cried. He thought of the man who'd fixed French toast that morning, had given up his bed to a stranger because a friend had asked. Anita Gay would pay for it, he promised himself. It was no longer just about money, about principle. It was about justice. So he stroked Cleo's hair, drank the last swallow of the whiskey. He could think of only one place to go. Eleven. Dr. Lowenstein had his own problems. They included an ex-wife who had successfully skinned him in the divorce, two children in college who were under the delusion he owned a grove of money trees, and an administrative assistant who'd just demanded a raise. Sheila had divorced him because he'd spent more time working on his practice than his marriage. Then she had sucked the financial benefits of that practice up like a hoover. The irony of it had been lost on her which, Lowenstein decided, only proved he was well rid of the humorless bitch. But that was neither here nor there. As his son, who changed majors as often as he changed his socks, was given to say, it was only money. Tia Marsh had money. A steady stream of interest and dividends and mutual funds, as well as, he supposed, a reasonably substantial trickle of royalties from her books. And God knew the woman had problems. He listened to her now as she sat tidily in the chair facing him and told a convoluted tale of sneaky Irishmen, Greek myths, historic disasters, and thievery. When she ended with a police impersonator and tapped phones, he rubbed his steepled fingers on his thin blade of a mouth and cleared his throat. Well, dear, you've certainly been busy. Tell me, what do you think fate represents in this context? Represents? Finding the courage to tell the tale and telling it had used up most of her steam. For a moment, Tia could only stare. Dr. Lowenstein, it's not a metaphor, it's statues. Determining your own fate has always been one of your core dilemmas, he began. You think I'm making this up? You think this is all some complicated delusion? The insult of it kicked her energy level back up again. Certainly she had delusions, or else why would she be here? But they were much more simplistic, much more ordinary. And he, at $250 for a 50-minute hour, should know it. I'm not that crazy. There was a man in Helsinki. An Irishman, Lowenstein said patiently. Yes, yes, an Irishman. But he could have been a one-legged Scotsman, for all that matters. He smiled gently. Your month of travel was a big step for you, Tia. I believe it opened you up to yourself, to the imagination you often stifle. 
The challenge now will be to channel and refine that imagination. Perhaps as a writer, there was a man in Helsinki. She said again between her teeth. He came to New York to see me, pretended a personal interest in me when, in fact, he was only interested in my connection to the three fates. Those fates are real; they exist. I've documented it. My ancestor owned one and was traveling to England on the Lusitania to acquire the second. That's fact, documented fact. And this Irishman claims his ancestor also aboard the ship stole the statue. Exactly. She huffed out a breath. And that Anita Gay stole the statue from him, the Irishman. I can't substantiate that. In fact, I had strong doubts about it until Jack Burdett came to see me, the one who pretended to be a police detective. Yes,、yeah, see, it, it's not that complicated if you just follow the steps in a linear fashion. My problem is I'm not sure what to do about it, what step to take next. If my phones are tapped, it seems to me I should report it. But then there'll be all sorts of awkward questions, won't there? And If the phones are subsequently untapped, Miss Gay will know that I know she had them tapped. Then I lose the advantage of working behind the scenes, so to speak, to find the other two fates. She took a long breath, and I don't actually talk on the phone that much anyway, so maybe I should leave it alone for now. Tia, have you considered that your reluctance to report this stems from your subconscious knowledge that there is nothing wrong with your phones? No. But his calm, patient question planted the seed of doubt in her mind. This isn't paranoia. Tia, do you remember calling me from your hotel in London at the beginning of your tour and telling me you were afraid the man staying down the hall was stalking you because twice he rode in the elevator with you? Yes. Mortified, she dropped her gaze to her hands. But that was different. That was paranoia. Except for all she knew, for all anyone knew, she thought. She'd been right, and had had a lucky escape from a crazed British stalker. You've made great strides, he continued. Important ones. You faced down your travel phobia. You confronted your fear of dealing with the public. You spent four consecutive weeks exploring yourself and your own capabilities and expanded your safety zone. You should be proud of yourself. To show he was proud of her, he leaned over, patted her arm lightly. Change, dear. Change creates new challenges. You have a tendency, as we've discussed before, to manufacture scenarios within your mind—exotic, complicated scenarios wherein you're surrounded or beset by some sort of danger or threat, a fatal illness, an international plot. And so beset, you retreat, constrict that safety zone to your apartment. I'm not surprised that finding yourself in familiar surroundings again, dealing with the natural physical and mental fatigue of a long, demanding trip, you need to revert to pattern. I'm not doing that," she said under her breath. "I can't even see the pattern anymore. We'll work on that during our next session." He leaned over to pat her arm again. "It might be best if we go back to our twice weekly sessions for the time being. Don't think of that as a step back, but as a new beginning." Angela will schedule you. She looked at him, the kindly face, the trim beard, the dash of grey at the temples. It was like she realized being indulged and dismissed by an affectionate parent. If there was a pattern in her life, she thought as she got to her feet, this was it. Thank you, doctor. I want you to continue your relaxation and imagery exercises. Of course. She picked up her purse, walked to the door. And there turned. Everything I just told you is a hallucination. No, dear, of course not. I believe it's all very real to you, and a combination of actual events and your very creative imagination. We'll explore it. In the meantime, I'd like you to consider why you find living inside your head more comfortable than living outside it. We'll talk about it during our next session. It's not comfortable inside my head. She said quietly. She stepped into his outer office and kept on going. He hadn't believed a word she'd said, and worse, she discovered as she rode the elevator down to the lobby, he'd stirred up doubts, so she wasn't sure she believed herself. It had happened. She was not crazy, damn it. She wasn't some sort of loony who wore aluminum foil on her head to keep out the alien voices, for God's sake. She was a mythologist, a successful author. A functioning adult, and she added as temper began to rise, she was sane. 
felt saner, steadier, stronger than she'd ever felt in her life. She wasn't hiding in her apartment. She was working there. She had a goal, a fascinating one. She would prove she wasn't delusional. She'd prove she could stand on her own two feet, that she was a healthy, well, moderately healthy, woman with a good brain and a strong will. As she strode out on the street, she whipped out her cell phone, punched in a number. Carrie, it's Tia. Get me an emergency appointment at your salon. When? Now, right now. It's coming off. Are you sure about this? Carrie was still winded from her six-block dash from her Wall Street offices to Belladonna. Yes, no. Tia clutched Carrie's hand as they sat in two of the streamlined leather chairs in the salon's waiting area. There was loud techno rock blaring, and one of the stylists, a rail-thin woman dressed all in black, had her hair arranged in a terrifying magenta cloud. Already she could feel her air passages shutting down as they were assaulted with the beauty shop's scents of peroxide and polish remover and overheated perfume. The sound of hair dryers blowing was like plane engines. She was going to get a migraine, hives, respiratory arrest. What was she doing here? I'd better go. I'd better go right now. She fumbled in her bag for her inhaler. I'm going to stay with you, Tia. I'm going to see you through this every step of the way. Carrie had canceled two meetings to see to it. Julian's a genius, I swear it. She squeezed Tia's free hand as Tia sucked on the inhaler. You're going to feel like a new woman. What? She asked when Tia mumbled. Removing the inhaler, Tia tried again. I said, I'm just getting used to the old one. This is a mistake. I only did it because I was so upset with Dr. Lowenstein. Look, I'll pay for the appointment, but I... Julian's ready for you, Dr. Marsh. Another wand, slim, black-clad female came out. Didn't anyone here weigh over a hundred pounds? Tia thought frantically. Wasn't anyone over twenty-three? I'll take her back, Miranda. In the bright, cheerful voice mothers use when they drag their children to the dentist's chair, Carrie hauled Tia to her feet. You're going to thank me for this, trust me. Tia's vision blurred as they walked past operators, customers, past gleaming black shampoo bowls, and sparkling glass displays holding dozens and dozens of sleekly packaged products. Dimly, she heard overlapping chatter and a cackle of laughter that sounded just a bit insane. Carrie, be brave, be strong. She steered Tia toward a large cubicle done in dazzling black and silver. The man who stood by the big leather chair was short, sleek as a greyhound, with white blonde hair cut like a skull cap. For some reason, he made her think of a very hip Eros, and that didn't comfort her a bit. So, he began in a voice that bit down on vowels with the teeth of a native New Yorker. This is Tia, at last. He took one look at her pale face and judged his quarry. Louise, some wine here. Sit. I was just thinking that maybe sit, he interrupted Tia, then leaned over to kiss Carrie's cheek. Moral support? You bet. Carrie and I have been plotting endlessly on how to get you in my chair. He got her there, finally, by simply nudging her backward. And from the looks of this, he fingered a lock of hair that had come loose from its knot. It's not a moment too soon. I really don't think I need... Let me be the judge of what you need. He took one of the wine glasses Louise brought in, handed it to her. When you go to the doctor, do you tell him what you need? Actually, yeah, I do, but you have lovely eyes. She blinked them. I do? Excellent brow line, very nice bones, he added, and began to touch her face with smooth, very cool fingertips. Sexy mouth. The lipstick's wrong, but we'll fix that. Yes, it's a fine face we've got here. Dull, outdated here. With a couple of tugs, he had the pins out and the heavy weight of it tumbling free. It doesn't suit you at all. You're hiding behind your hair, my Tia. He swiveled the chair around so she was facing the mirror, and his head was close to hers, all but cheek to cheek. And I'm going to expose you. You are? But don't you think, what if there's nothing particularly interesting to expose? I think you underestimate yourself he chided, and expect everyone else to do the same. While she was blinking over that, she found herself being shampooed by one of the slender shop girls in one of the glossy black sinks. 
By the time she thought to ask if they used hypoallergenic products, it was too late. Then she was back in the chair, facing away from the mirror, with a glass of very nice white wine in her hand. He talked to her, asked her what she did, who she dated, what she liked. Every time she gave a non-committal answer or asked what he was doing with her hair, he asked another question. When at one point she made the mistake of looking down and seeing the piles of shorn hair littering the floor, her breath began to hitch. Little white dots danced in front of her eyes, and from a distance she heard Carrie's alarmed voice. The next thing she knew, Julian pushed her head between her knees, holding it there until the roar of her heartbeat slowed. Steady, honey, Louise. I need a cold cloth here. Tia, Tia, snap out of it. She opened her eyes to find Carrie crouched on the floor in front of her. What? What? It's a haircut, okay? Not brain surgery. A traumatic event. A traumatic event. Julian laid a cool, damp cloth on the back of Tia's neck. Now I want you to sit up slowly. Deep breath. Now that's the way. Now another. There now. Tell me about this Irish guy Carrie mentioned. He's a bastard, Tia said weakly. We all are. The scissors began to snip again, frighteningly close to her face. Tell me all about it. So she did, and when his reaction was shock, fascination, delight, so very different from Lowenstein's, she forgot about her hair. Incredible. You know what you have to do, don't you? She stared up at him as he clicked her chair back. What? You have to go to Ireland, find this Malachi, and seduce him. I do. It's perfect. You track him down, seduce all pertinent information on the statues out of him, then you add that to what you've dug up, and you're ahead of everyone. We're going to put in a few highlights, jazz it up a bit, especially around her face. But I can't just go. Besides, he isn't really interested in me that way, and more to the point, it's not right to use sex as a weapon, sweetie. When a woman uses it on me, I'm usually grateful. You have wonderful skin. What are you using on it? Oh well, right now I'm using this new line I read about, all natural ingredients. But you have to keep the products refrigerated, which is a little inconvenient. I have something better. Louise, Bioderm, full skin care treatment, normal. Oh well, I always do a patch test before I use another new. Not to worry. He dipped a flat brush in a small bowl and came up with a dab of pale purple goo. You just lie back and relax. It wasn't easy to relax when a strange woman was rubbing creams on your face and your hair. What was left of it was full of goop and aluminum foil, and no one would let you look in the mirror. But he gave her another glass of wine, and Carrie stayed loyally within arm's reach. Somehow she was talked into having her eyebrows waxed and dyed to give them more definition. Then, after her hair was rinsed, into a full makeup treatment. By the time Julian was wielding the blow dryer on her, she was so tired, so tipsy, she nearly nodded off in the chair. Whoever claimed an afternoon at the salon was a luxury had a sick sense of humor. Keep your eyes closed, Julian ordered, and the wine sloshed around in her head a little as her chair revolved. Now open up and take a look at Tia Marsh. She opened her eyes, looked in the mirror, and felt a fast slam of pure panic. Where did she go? The woman who stared back at her had a sunny cap of hair with a snazzy fringe down to dramatically arched eyebrows. Her eyes were enormously and richly blue, her mouth wide and boldly red, and when Tia's jaw dropped, so did hers. I look. I look like Tinker Bell. Once again, Julian lowered his head so that his was close to hers. You're not far wrong. Fairies are fascinating, aren't they? Clever and bright and unpredictable. That's how you look. Carrie's face joined theirs in the mirror so that for a dizzy second, Tia imagined herself with three heads, none of which was actually hers. You look fabulous. A tear trickled down Carrie's cheek. I'm so happy to you. Look, really look at yourself. Okay. She took a huge breath. Okay, and reached up gingerly to touch the nape of her neck. It feels so strange. She shook her head a little, laughed a little. Light, but it doesn't look like me. Yes, it does. The you that was hiding. Give me some photo ID, Julian demanded. Baffled, she dug in her purse and her wallet and took out her bank card. Which. 
he asked. Do you want to be? Tia stared at the photo, stared at the mirror. I'll take everything you used on me today, and another appointment in four weeks. She'd spent fifteen hundred dollars, fifteen hundred on nothing more than vanity. And Tia thought, as she sat in the cab with her shopping bag brimming with beauty products, she didn't feel guilty about it. She felt exhilarated. She couldn't wait to get home and look at herself in the mirror again and again. Because she couldn't, she slid her hand into her purse, clicked open her compact, holding the mirror inside the bag to shield her foolishness from the cab driver. She tilted it up and grinned at herself. She wasn't ordinary at all, not beautiful certainly, but not by any means ordinary. She was even pretty in an odd sort of way. Caught up with herself, she didn't register that they'd stopped in front of her building until Rosie O'Donnell's recorded voice reminded her to take all her belongings. Flustered, Tia dropped her compact back into her purse, fumbled with a fare she would normally have had ready, then juggling her bag in her purse, climbed out. As a result, she dropped her purse on the sidewalk, had to scoop the contents hurriedly back in. When she straightened, took a step toward her building, she nearly plowed into the couple who'd stepped into her path. Doctor Marsh. Yes, she answered without thinking, as she was looking at the beautiful tall brunette who'd obviously been crying. We need to speak with you, he began, and the Irish in his voice finally got through. As did when she shifted her gaze to his face and homed in on the family resemblance, the name. You're a Sullivan, she said the name as some might an oath with bitter passion. I am, yes, Gideon. This is Cleo. If we could come up to your flat for a minute, I don't have anything to say to you, Doctor Marsh. He put a hand on her arm as she turned. She whipped back, surprising them both with the speed and the fury. Take your hand off me, or I'll start screaming. I can scream very loud and very long. As he was a man who understood and respected a woman's temper, he lifted his free hand, palm out, in a gesture of truce. I know you're angry with Mal, and I don't blame you for it. But the fact is, we've got nowhere else to go right at the moment. Not that safe. We're in trouble here. That doesn't concern me, and neither do you. Let her alone, Slick. Cleo said it wearily, weaving a little from the whiskey. It's all fucked anyway. You've been drinking. Outraged and conveniently forgetting two glasses of afternoon wine, Tia sniffed. You've got some nerve coming round here drunk, accosting me on the street. You want to get out of the way, Mr. Sullivan, before I call the police. Yeah, she's been drinking. With his own temper rising, Gideon took Tia's arm again, because I saw to it as it was the only way I knew to numb her enough for her to deal with having her closest friend murdered, murdered because of the three fates, murdered because of Anita Gay. You can walk away from that, Doctor Marsh, but that doesn't stop you being part of it. He's dead. Cleo's voice was flat and dull, and in it, Tia heard the ravages of grief. Mikey's dead, and hassling her won't bring him back. Let's just go. She's sick and she's tired, Gideon said to Tia. I'm asking for her. Let us come in. She needs a place until I can think what to do. I don't need anything. Come in, damn it. Tia dragged a hand through her newly styled hair. Come on. She streamed in ahead of them, jammed the button for the elevator. Didn't it just figure that Malachi Sullivan would find some way to ruin her triumphant day? I'm grateful to you, Doctor Marsh. Tia. Inside, she jammed the button for her floor. Since your friend's very likely to pass out on my floor, why be formal? I hate your brother, by the way. I understand. I'll let him know next time I see him. I almost didn't come up to you outside. Mal said you had long hair. I used to. She led the way down the hall to her apartment. How did you recognize me? Well, he said too that you were blonde and delicate and pretty. With an unladylike snort, she opened the door. You can stay until she feels better, Tia began, and set aside her purse and shopping bag. Meanwhile, you can tell me what you're doing here and why you expect me to believe Anita Gay murdered anyone. His face hardened, and in it, Tia saw the resemblance again. Malachi's had taken on that same look of barely restrained violence in her trashed hotel room in Helsinki. 
They might be very attractive, musically voiced men, she thought, but that didn't mean they weren't dangerous. She didn't do it personally, but she's responsible. Is there a place Cleo can lie down? I don't need to lie down. I don't want to lie down. All right then, you'll sit down. Tia frowned as Gideon dragged Cleo to the sofa. His voice was rough, she noted, not particularly kind, despite the lovely lilt of it. But he handled the brunette gently, as a man might some fragile antique glass. And he was right to get her off her feet. Tia decided. The woman was sheet white and shaky. You're cold, she heard him say. Now do what you're told for once. Put your feet up. He hauled them up himself, pulled the throw off the back of the sofa, and tucked it around her. I'm sorry for this, he said to Tia. I couldn't risk a hotel, even if I had enough of the wherewithal for one just now. I haven't had time to think since everything happened. It was a quest, you see, an adventure with some annoyances and expenses to be sure, and a risk of a fist in the face or ass kicking. But it's different now. Now there's murder. I'm sick. Cleo pushed off the couch, swayed. I'm sorry. I'm sick. There. Tia pointed to a door on the left and felt a twist of sympathetic nausea in her own belly as Cleo lurched for it. Gideon was two steps behind her and got the door slammed in his face. He stood staring helplessly at it, then lowered his brow to the door. I guess it's the whiskey. I poured it into her because it was all I could think of. He was grieving too. She could see that now. I'm going to make tea. He nodded. We'd be grateful. Come in the kitchen where I can see you and start explaining. My brother says you were a fragile kind of thing. Gideon commented as he followed her into the kitchen. He's not usually so wrong. He's the same one who claimed one of New York's most respected dealers is a thief. Now you add murder. It's not a claim; it's a fact. With restless movements, he paced back to the doorway, looked toward the powder room door, paced back. His brother Tia noted was more contained, at least she amended as far as she knew. She took what wasn't hers. Gideon continued, and because she wants more, she's up the stakes beyond anything that can be justified. A man's dead, a man I met only yesterday, one who gave me his bed because his friend asked him. A man who fixed me breakfast just this morning, a man who's dead only because he was loyal to a friend. How did you meet Cleo? I tracked her down in Europe. Who is she in this? She's connected to the Second Fate. How? She demanded. Through ancestry, she comes down from the White Smiths. One was a collector in London. All right, he amused. All right, another piece of the puzzle in place. You recognize the name? Gideon's statement proved to Tia she'd have to work on her acting skills. You've looked into it, then. I think, under the circumstances, I should be the one asking the questions, and I'll answer them. If I could use your phone first off, I need to call my family. No, I'm sorry. A call collect. You can't use the phone. It's tapped, or maybe it's tapped, or maybe I'm just having a big, complicated hallucination after all. I'm sorry. Bugged. Your phone's bugged. According to another surprise visitor, she turned around. I think, all in all, I'm really taking this very well, don't you? I mean, here I am with a couple of strangers in my apartment, one who is currently being sick in my powder room, and the other telling me fantastic stories in the kitchen, and I'm making tea. I think even Dr. Lowenstein would agree that's progress. I'm not following you. Why should you? Tell me why you believe Anita is responsible for this man's death. I'm responsible. Cleo stood, braced against the doorway. She was still very pale, but her eyes were clear again. He'd be alive if it wasn't for me. I got him involved. I'm the one who got you involved, Gideon reminded her. So you might as well hang it on me. I'd like to, but it won't wash. I was double-crossing you. I justified it, and you were going to get your share, but I was doing a shuffle on you, and I pulled Mikey into it. She must have had them watching the street. So when we came down after I made the deal with her. Mikey goes his way, I go mine. They split up and tail us. Only I make my shadow, and being so goddamn clever, lose him. Only Mikey's clueless, so he just bobs on home, and that bastard takes him down there. If he hadn't been with me, they wouldn't have known he existed. None of us knew she'd resort to murder. Gideon told her. 
Well, we know now. She looked at Tia. If this is true, why haven't you gone to the police? And tell them what? Gideon jammed his hands in his pockets. That we believe a respected businesswoman is directly responsible for the murder of a young black dancer? A murder that very likely took place while she was at some public place or in some meeting? And we tell them we know this because she's stolen a statue while in Dublin and agreed to buy another? I suppose we can tell the police they'll just have to take our word on it when they ask for proof of any sort. No doubt they'll clap the cuffs on her. Regardless, you expect me to believe you. Tia lifted the sputtering kettle off the burner. Do you? Gideon asked. She looked at him, then at Cleo. Yes, I guess I do, but I intend to research if insanity runs in my family. There's a pull-out sofa in my office here. You can use that tonight. Thanks. It isn't free, she told Gideon, and lifted the tea tray. From this point on, I stop being a tool and become an active participant in this little... quest. Cleo smiled as Tia carted the tray into the living room. Translated slick... The doc just informed you she's your fucking partner. Yes, I did. Lemon or sugar? Twelve. An accident. Anita studied the two men who had come to the private entrance of her office. It served her right, she supposed, for selecting brawn over brains. But really, she'd given them such a simple task with such specific follow-the-dots instructions. The guy went nuts on me. Carl Dubrowski, the shorter, stockier of the two, had a belligerent expression on his pockmarked face. He'd been a bouncer at a club before Anita had enlisted him to handle a few pesky chores. She'd had reason to know he needed a job and wouldn't quibble about a few minor legalities, as he'd been arrested twice for assault and had barely beaten a charge of manslaughter. Such activities didn't look well on a resume. She studied him now as he stood in one of the dark Savile Row suits she'd paid for. You can dress them up, she thought, but you can't take them out. Your instructions, Mr. Dabrowski, were to follow Ms. Tolliver and or any companion she might have brought with her to our meeting, to detain her and or these companions only if it should become necessary, and to most important retrieve my property, using persuasion of a physical nature if such action was warranted. I don't believe there were any instructions in there to fracture anyone's skull. It was an accident, he repeated stubbornly. I tailed the black guy, and Jasper took the girl. Black guy went to the apartment, like I said. I went in behind him, like I said. I had to soften him up a little so he'd pay attention while I was asking him about the statue. Went through the place looking for it, didn't find it, so I softened him up some more. And you let him answer the phone. Figured maybe it was the girl. And I'm thinking I put the arm on him while she's on the hook. Maybe she'll talk. Or with Jasper on her, she could maybe take off for the piece you're after. Guy starts screaming, warrants are off, so I give him a good jab. Fell wrong is all. Guy fell wrong and fucked himself. I warned you about your language, Mr. Dabrowski, she said coolly. I see the problem here is that you attempted something in an area where you have no skill. You attempted to think. Don't do so again, and you, Mr. Jasper. She paused for a long, suffering sigh. I'm very disappointed. I had more faith than you. This is the second time you haven't been able to keep up with a second-rate stripper. She's got fast feet, and she ain't as dumb as you think. Marvin Jasper was flat-faced and kept his hair in the same needle-sharp buzz cut he'd worn as an MP during his stint in the Army. He'd hoped to turn that into a stint with the police force, but had washed out during the psych test. He was still bitter about it. Apparently she has brains enough to outmaneuver both of you. Now she could be anywhere, and so could the fate. Moreover, she thought, the police were involved. She had no doubt Dubrowski had been foolish enough to leave some sort of evidence behind. Fingerprints, a stray hair, something that would eventually tie him to the murder, something that could potentially tie her. That would never do. Mr. Jasper, I want you to go back. Keep a surveillance on this apartment where Mr. Dubrowski had his accident. Perhaps she'll go back there. If you see her, I want her taken quickly and quietly. Then contact me. I have a place where we can discuss business in private. Mr. Dubrowski, you'll come with me. We'll go prepare for that business. One of the advantages of marrying a wealthy older man was that wealthy older men so often had myriad holdings. 
and clever businessmen often kept those holdings buried under a morass of corporations and twisting red tape. The warehouse in New Jersey was just one of the many. Anita had sold it only the day before to a developer who planned to open one of those cavernous discount stores. One-stop shopping, she mused, as she drove across the cracked concrete. She wasn't planning on shopping, but she was going to take care of her task with one final stop. Sure was out in bumfuck, Dubrowski muttered, and in the dimming light pulled back his lips in a sneer at her prissy order to watch his language. We can keep her here for several days if necessary. Anita crossed to the loading bay doors, careful not to catch the heels of her Pradas in the cracks. I want you to go over the security to make certain once we have her in, she won't get out. No problem. These loading doors operate electrically and require a code. I'm more concerned with the side doors, the windows. He pursed his lips, studied the sooty block of the building. She'd have to be a monkey to get to the windows, and you got riot bars on them. She studied them as if weighing his opinion. Paul might have left her a number of properties, but Anita had taken the time to tour them all, inside and out. What about around the sides? He trudged around, turning the corner. Weeds sprang up through the broken stone, and though he could hear the sound of traffic from the turnpike, it was a distant whoosh. Bumfuck, he thought again, shaking his head. Broken lock on this side door, he called out. Is there? She knew it. She'd had a complete and extensive report from the appraisal. That's a problem. I wonder if it's locked from the inside. He gave it a hard shove, shrugged. Might be, or it's jammed or something. Well, we won't. No, she said after a moment's thought. Best to see if we can get in through it, so we know what has to be done. Can you push or kick it in? He was built like a bull and proud of it, proud enough that he didn't think to ask why she didn't just unlock the damn door. Slamming his bulk against the thick wood soothed the ego she'd scraped raw in her office. He hated the bitch, but she paid well. That didn't mean he was going to tolerate getting sniped at by a woman. He imagined she was the door, gave it one good kick, and snapped the thin bolt lock on the inside. Like paper, he claimed. Gonna want to put a steel door on here, a police lock if you want to keep out vandals and shit. You're quite right. It's dark inside. I have a flashlight in my bag. Light switch right here. No, we don't want to advertise we're here, do we? She aimed the thin beam inside, scanned the room. It was another concrete box, dark, dusty, and smelling of rodents. It was, she thought, perfect. What's that? What? Over there in the corner, she said, gesturing with her light. He walked over, kicked listlessly. Just an old tarp. You want us to keep her out here for any time? You got to think about how we're going to get food out here. You won't have to worry about it. Ain't no Chinese carryout in the corner, he began as he turned. He saw the gun in her hand, held as steady as the pencil light. What the fuck? Language, Mr. Dubrowski," she said with a tisk, and shot him. The gun kicked. The sound echoed, and both sent a thrill through her. He took a lurching step toward her, so she shot him again, then a third time. When he was down, she stepped very carefully around the blood spilling into a slow river on the concrete floor. Tilting her head like a woman considering a new bauble in a shop window, she sent one more bullet into the back of his head. It was a first for her, a killing. Now that it was done, very well done, her hand shook lightly and her breath came fast and shallow. She shined the light in his pupils just to be sure, to be absolutely sure. The beam bobbed a bit, but she bore down and saw that his eyes were open and staring, and empty. Paul had been like that after she had waited out his first heart attack with his medication tight in her fist. She didn't consider that killing. That she thought now she steadied herself had been patience. She stepped back, took the old broom from the corner, and meticulously brushed at the dust, smearing any footprints on her backward trip to the door. Taking out a lace-trimmed handkerchief, she wiped the broom handle before tossing it aside, then covered her hand with the silk and lace to pull the door closed. It was a bad fit now, she mused, as Dubrowski had conveniently jarred the jam. 
an obvious break-in, an obvious murder. Finally, she wiped off her dead husband's unregistered Beretta and heaved it as far as she could into the scrubby brush bordering the lot. The police would find it, of course. She wanted them to find it. There was nothing to tie her here but the fact that her husband had once owned the building. There was nothing to tie her to some nasty little man who'd made his living breaking arms. There were no records of employment, no tax forms, no witnesses to their dealings, except for Jasper. She didn't think he'd run to the police when he heard his associate had been shot. No, she had a feeling Marvin Jasper would become a sterling employee. Nothing like a little incentive to inspire loyalty and hard work. She walked back to her car and inside smoothed her hair, freshened her lipstick. She drove away thinking that it was absolutely true if you wanted something done right, you did it yourself. Jack awoke to church bells. The pretty peal of them brought him out of a sound sleep on top of the bedspread and made him aware of the steady flow of the breeze through the window he'd left wide open. He liked the smell of it, the hint of sea it carried. He lay as he was a moment, letting it wash over him until the bells faded to echoes. He'd arrived in Cove too early to do anything more productive than admire the harbor and get the general lay of the land. What had once been a port that had given so many of the country's immigrants their last look at their homeland was now more of a resort town, and pretty as a postcard. He had a strong view of the low street, the square, and the water from his windows. On another trip, he would have taken his time absorbing the place, acquainting himself with the rhythms of it, with the locals. He enjoyed that aspect of traveling and traveling alone. But in this case, there was only one local he had any interest in, Malachi Sullivan. He intended to find out what he needed to know, make his second stop, and be back in New York within three days. Anita Gay needed watching, and he'd do a better job of it in New York. When he was finished here, he intended to contact Tia Marsh again as well. The woman might know more than she realized, or more than she'd let on. Business aside, he'd make time for a pilgrimage before he left Cove. He checked his watch and decided to order up coffee and a light breakfast before he showered. The room service waiter had a face full of freckles. And isn't it a fine fresh day? He said as he set up the meal. You can't do better for sightseeing. If you'd be needing any arrangements made for touring, Mr. Burdett, sir, the hotel's happy to see to it for you. We might have rain tomorrow, so you might want to take advantage of the weather while we have it. Now, is there anything else I can do for you? Jack took the little folder holding the bill. Do you know a Malachi Sullivan? Ah, it's a bow tour you're wanting, then. Sorry? You want to tour around to the head of Kinsale where the Lusitania was sunk. Fine views, even if it's a sad place, all in all. Tours run three times daily this time of year. You've missed the first boat, but the second leaves at noon, so you've plenty of time for that. Would you like us to book that for you? Thanks. Jack added a generous tip. Does Sullivan run the tour himself? One Sullivan or the other, the boy said cheerfully. Gideon's away just now, that's the second son. So it's likely to be Mal or Becca, or one of the Curry crew, who are in the way of being cousins to the Sullivans. It's a family enterprise and a fine value for the money. We'll see to the booking for you, and you've only to be down the dock by a quarter to noon. So he had time to wander a bit, after all. He picked up his tour voucher at the front desk, pocketed it while he headed out. He walked down the steeply sloped street to the square where the Angel of Peace stood over the statues of the weeping fishermen who mourned the Lusitania's dead. It was a powerful choice in memorials, he thought, the rough-clad men, the shattered faces, men who'd made their living from the sea and had cried for strangers taken by it. He supposed it was very Irish, and he found it very apt. A block over was a monument to the doomed Titanic and her Irish dead. Around them were shops, and the shops were decked with barrels and baskets of flourishing flowers that turned the sad into the picturesque. That, he thought, was probably Irish as well. Along the streets, in and out of shops, people strolled or moved briskly about their business. The side streets climbed up very impressive hills and were lined with painted houses, whose doors opened straight onto the narrow sidewalks or into tiny, tidy front gardens. Overhead the sky was a deep and pure blue with the waters of Cork Harbor mirroring it. Boats were being serviced at the quay, the same quay, his pamphlet told him, 
as had been in service during the era that White Star and Cunard ran their grand ships. He walked down to the dock and took his first study of Sullivan's tour boat. It looked to seat about twenty, and resembled a party boat with its bold red canopy stretched over the deck to protect passengers from the sun. Or around here, he assumed, the rain. The seats were red as well, and a cheerful contrast to the shiny white of the hull. The red script on the side identified it as the Maid of Cove. There was a woman already on board, and Jack watched as she checked the number of life jackets, seat cushions, ticking items off on a clipboard as she worked. She wore jeans faded to nearly white at the stress points, and a bright blue sweater with the sleeves shoved up to her elbows. In them she appeared slim and slight. There was a shoulder-length tumble of curls spilling out of her blue cap, the hair color his mother would have called strawberry blonde. A pair of dark glasses and a cap's brim shielded most of her face, but what he could see, a full, unpainted mouth, a strong curve of jawline, was a nice addition to the view. She moved forward, her steps quick and confident, as the boat swayed in its slip and continued her checklist on the bridge. She sure as hell wasn't Malachy Sullivan, Jack surmised, but she had to be a link to him. Ahoy, the maid! He called out and waited on the dock while she turned, head cocked, and spotted him. Ahoy, the dock! Can I help you with something? I'm going out. He took the voucher out of his pocket, held it up where the frisky wind whipped at it. Is it okay to come aboard now? You can, sure, if you like. We won't be leaving for another twenty minutes. She tucked the clipboard under her arm and walked over, prepared to offer him a hand on the long step from dock to deck. She realized he wouldn't need it. He moved well and was fit enough, she concluded. Quite fit enough, she thought, as she admired the strong build. She admired the leather bomber jacket he wore as well, the fact that it was soft and battered. She had a weakness for good texture. Do I give this to you? He asked. You do indeed. She accepted the voucher, then turned over her clipboard, flipping a page to the passenger list. Mr. Burdett, is it? It is, and you're... She glanced up, then shifted the clipboard again to take the hand he offered. I'm Rebecca. I'll be your captain and tour guide today. I've yet to start the tea, but I'll have it going shortly. Just make yourself comfortable. It's a fine day for a sail, and I'll see you have a good ride. I bet you will, he thought. Rebecca. Becca for short. Sullivan. She'd had a tough little hand and a good firm grip and a voice like a siren. After she tucked the clipboard in a bracket, she headed back to stern, turned into a tiny galley. When he followed, she sent him a friendly smile over her shoulder. Would this be your first visit to Cove, then? Yes, it's beautiful. It is, yes. She set a kettle on the single burner, then got out the makings for tea. One of the jewels of Ireland, we like to think. You'll get some of the history during the tour. There's but twelve passengers on this trip, so I'll have plenty of time to answer any questions you might have. You're from America, then? Yes, New York. Her mouth turned down in a sulk. Seems everybody's going or coming from New York these days. Sorry. Oh, it's nothing. She gave a little shrug. My brother just left for New York this morning. Well, hell, Jack thought, but kept his expression neutral. He's having a holiday? It's business, but he'll see it all, won't he? Again, and I've never. She pulled off her sunglasses, hooked them on her sweater, while she measured the tea. Now he got a good, close look at her face. It was better, he decided, even better than he'd anticipated. Her eyes were a cool and misty green against skin as white and pure as marble. And she smelled, since he was close enough to catch her scent, like peaches and honey. It's very exciting, isn't it, New York City? All the people in the buildings, shops and restaurants and theatres and just everything and more all jammed into one place. I'd like to look at it myself. Excuse me, the others are starting to queue up on the dock. I need to check them in. He stayed back at the stern, but he turned slowly to watch her. She felt him watching her as she checked in the passengers, made them welcome. When they were settled, she introduced herself, made the standard safety announcements. Just as the cathedral bells began to ring the noon hour, she cast off. Thanks, Jimmy! She waved to the dockhand, who secured her line, 
then eased the boat out of the slip and into Cork Harbor. Piloting one-handed, she took up a microphone. It's my mother, Eileen, who's going to be entertaining you for the next little while. She was born here in Cove, though we're forbidden to discuss the year of that happy event. Her parents were born here as well, as theirs before them. So she's in the way of knowing the area and the history. It happens I know a bit about it all myself. So if you've any questions when she's finished talking to you, just shout them out. We've a good clear day, so your trip should be smooth and pleasant. I hope you enjoy it. She reached up, flipped on the lecture her mother had recorded, then settled in to enjoy the trip herself. With her mother's voice speaking of Cove's fine natural harbour, or its long vitality as a port that had once been the assembly point for ships during the Napoleonic Wars, as well as a major departure point in the country for its immigrants, she piloted the boat so its passengers could have the pleasure of seeing the town from the water and appreciate the charm of it, the way it was held in its cup of land its streets rising sharply to the great Neo-Gothic cathedral that cast its shadow over all. It was a clever, even a slick operation, Jack decided, all the while with the charm of simplicity. The daughter knew how to handle the boat, and the mother knew how to deliver a lecture and make it seem like storytelling. He wasn't learning anything he didn't already know. He'd studied the area carefully, but the friendly voice over the mic made it all seem more intimate. That was a gift. The ride was smooth, as promised, and there was no faulting the scenery. As Eileen Sullivan began to speak of May 7th, he could almost see it. A shimmering spring day, the great liner plowing majestically through the sea with many of its passengers standing at the rail, looking, as he was, at the Irish coast. Then that thin stream of white foam from the torpedo streaking toward the starboard bow. The first explosion under the bridge. The shock, the confusion, the terror and fast on its heels, the second explosion in the forward. The wreckage that had rained down on the innocent, the tumble of the helpless as the ship listed. And, in the twenty horrible minutes that followed, the cowardice and heroism, the miracles and the tragedies. Some of his fellow passengers snapped cameras or ran video recorders. He noted that a few of the women blinked at tears. Jack studied the smooth plate of the sea. Out of death and tragedy. Eileen continued, came life and hope. My own great-grandfather was on the Lusitania and by the grace of God survived. He was taken to Cove and nursed back to health by a pretty young girl who became his wife. He never returned to America or went on to England as he had planned. Instead, he settled in Cove, which was then Queenstown. Because of that terrible day, I'm here to tell you of it. While we grieve for the dead, we learn to celebrate the living and to respect the hand of fate. Interesting, Jack thought, and gave his attention to Rebecca for the rest of the tour. She answered questions, joked with the passengers, invited the children to come up and help steer the boat. It had to be a routine for her, Jack reflected, even monotonous. But she made it all seem fresh and fun. Another gift, he decided. It seemed the Sullivans were full of them. He asked a question or two himself because he wanted to keep her aware of him. When she maneuvered the boat into its slip again, he calculated he'd gotten his money's worth. He waited while she talked to disembarking passengers, posed for pictures with them. He made sure he was the last off. That was a great tour, he told her. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Your mother has a way of bringing it all into focus. She does. Pleased, Rebecca tipped back the brim of her cap. Ma writes the copy for the brochures and the ads and such. She's a gift with words. Are you going out again today? No, I'm done with it till tomorrow. I was planning to head up to the cemetery. It seems the way to round out the tour. I could use a guide. Her brows went up. You don't need a guide for that, Mr. Burdett. It's signposted, and there are markers giving the history as well. You'd know more than the markers. I'd like the company. She pursed her lips as she studied him. Tell me, do you want a guide or do you want a girl? If I get you, I get both. She laughed and went with impulse. All right, then, I'll go with you. But I'll need to make a stop first. She bought flowers, enough that he felt obliged to offer to carry at least some of them. As they walked, she'd call out a greeting or answer one. She might have looked slight in the oversized sweater, but she strode up the steep hills effortlessly, and during the two-mile hike, 
kept up a running conversation without any hitches and breaths. Since you're flirting with me, Mr. Burdett. Jack. Since you're flirting with me, Jack, I'm going to assume you're not a married man. I'm not married. Since you ask, I'm going to assume that matters to you. It does, of course. I don't have flirtations with married men. She cocked her head as she studied his face. I don't generally have them with strange men either, but I'm making an exception because I like the look of you. I like the look of you too. I thought you must, as you stared at me more than the scenery during the tour. I can't say I mind it. How'd you happen by the scar here? She asked and tapped a finger to the side of her own mouth. A disagreement. And do you have many? Scars or disagreements? She laughed up at him. Disagreements that lead to scars. Not so far. What is it you do back in America? I run my own security company. Do you? Like bodyguards? That's an aspect. We're primarily electronic security. I love electronics. She narrowed her eyes when he glanced down at her. Don't give me that indulgent look. Being a woman doesn't mean I don't understand gadgetry. Do you do private homes or places like banks and museums? Both, all, were worldwide. He didn't brag about his company as a rule, but he wanted to tell her. The way he realized, with some chagrin, a high school quarterback wanted to impress the head cheerleader. And we're the best. In twelve years, we've expanded from one branch in New York to twenty internationally. Give me another five, and when people think security, they'll think Burdett. The way they think Kleenex for tissues. She didn't consider it bragging. She considered it pride, and she was one to appreciate and respect a person's pride for his own accomplishments. It's a good feeling to make your own. We've done that as well on a smaller scale, of course, but it suits us. Your family? He asked, reminding himself to stick to the point. Yes, we've always made our living from the water, but it was fishing only. Then we tinkered our way into a tour boat, one to start. We lost my dad a few years back, and that was hard. But as my mother's fond of saying, you have to find the right and the wrong. So I started thinking. We had the insurance money. We had strong backs and good brains. Tourism helped turn Ireland around, economically speaking. So what could we do to cash in on that? Harbour tours. Exactly. The one boat we ran was doing a reasonable business. But if we used the money and bought two more, well then. I ran the figures and calculated the potential outlay and income and such. So now Sullivan Tours runs the three for touring and the fishing boat as well. And I'm thinking it's time to add another package that would include just what we're doing now: a guided walk along the funeral route and to the cemetery where the Lusitania dead are buried. You run the business end of it. Well, Mal, he does the people part, the promotion and glad handing as he's best at it. Gideon keeps the books because we make him, but he prefers overseeing the maintenance and repairs, as he's the organized sort and can't stand anything not being perfectly shipshape, so to speak. My mother handles the copy and correspondence and keeps us all from killing each other. As for me, I have the ideas. She paused, nodded toward the stones and high grass of the graveyard. Do you want to wander a bit on your own? Most do. The mass graves are up ahead, with those yew trees. There were elms there first, but the yews replaced them. The graves are marked with three limestone rocks and bronze plaques, and there are others, twenty-eight others, individual graves for those who died. Some are empty as they never recovered the bodies. Are these for them? These, she said, and took the flowers from him, are for my own dead. Thirteen. The cemetery stood on a hill surrounded by green valleys. Gravestones were stained with lichen, and some were so old that wind and rain had blurred their carvings. Some stood straight as soldiers, and others tipped like drunks. The fact that they did both—that there was no static order to it all—Jack thought, made the hill all the more poignant, all the more powerful. The grass, still thick with summer, rose in wild hillocks and lifted the scent of living. Growing things as it waved in the breeze, and on countless graves, flowers grew or were laid. Some wreaths were sheltered in clear plastic boxes, and others held little vials of holy water taken from some shrine. He found the sentiment oddly touching, even as it puzzled him. What possible help could holy water offer to the occupants of a graveyard? 
He saw fresh flowers spread beneath stones that had stood for ninety years and more. Who, he wondered, brought daisies to the old, old dead? Because there was no way he could reasonably refuse Rebecca's obvious desire for some time alone, he walked through the cemetery to the brilliant green carpet of smooth and tended grass, sheltered by the yews. He saw the stones with their brass plaques, read the words. A heart would have had to be stone not to be moved. While his was, he believed, contained, it wasn't hard. There was a connection here, even for him, and he wondered why he'd waited so long to come to this place, to stand on this ground. Fate, he thought. He supposed it was fate once again that had chosen his time. He looked back over the stones, over the grass, and saw Rebecca laying another bouquet on another grave. Her cap was off now, out of respect, he assumed, and stuffed in her back pocket. Her hair, that delicate reddish gold, danced in the breeze that stirred the grass at her feet. Her lips were curved in a quiet and private smile as she looked down at a headstone. And looking at her across the waving grass, the somber stones, he felt his contained heart give a single hard lurch. Though he was shaken by it, he wasn't a man to ignore trouble, whatever its form. He walked toward her. Her head came up, and though her mouth stayed gently curved, he sensed a watchfulness in her now. Did she feel it too, he wondered. This strange tug and pull, almost, if he believed in such things, a kind of recognition. When he reached her, she shifted the last two bouquets to her other hand. Holy ground is powerful ground. He nodded. Yes, he realized. She'd felt it, too. Hard to disagree with that right now. She studied his face as she spoke, the hard, strong lines of it that fit together made something less than handsome and something more. And his eyes, his smoky, secret eyes. He knew things, she was sure of it, and some of them were marvels. Do you believe in power, Jack? Not the kind that comes from muscle or position— the kind that comes from somewhere outside a person, and inside him as well. I guess I do. This time she nodded. And so do I. My father's there. She gestured to a black granite marker bearing the name Patrick Sullivan. His parents are living yet, and in Cove, as are my mother's. And there are my great-grandparents, John and Margaret Sullivan, Declan and Catherine Curry. And their parents are here as well. A ways over there, from my father's side. You bring them all flowers? When I walk this way, yes, I stop here last. My great-great-grandparents on my mother's side. She crouched to lay the flowers at the base of each stone. Jack looked over her head, read the names. Fate, he thought again. Sneaky bitch. Felix Greenfield? Don't see many names like Greenfield in Irish graveyards, do you? She laughed a little as she straightened. He was the one my mother spoke about on the tour who survived the Lusitania and settled here. So I stop here last, as if he hadn't lived through that day I wouldn't be here to bring him flowers. Have you seen what you wanted to see? So far? Well then, you'd best come home with me and have some tea. Rebecca. He touched her arm as she turned. I came here looking for you. For me? She scooped back her hair and schooled her voice to say smooth, despite the sudden trip of her heart. That's a fine romantic sort of thing to say, Jack. I should have said I came looking for Malachy Sullivan. The laughter in her eyes vanished. For Mal? Why is that? Fate. He saw the flash of fear run across her face. Then with admiration he watched it harden and chill. You can go back to New York City and tell Anita Gay she can kiss my ass on the way to hell. I'd be happy to, but I'm not here because of Anita. I'm a collector, and I have a personal interest in the fates. I'll match whatever Anita's paying your family and add ten percent. Paying us? Paying? Her cheeks went hot with fury. Oh, when she thought of how everything inside her body had softened and hummed just with looking at him. That thieving bitch. Now look. Look, you've got me standing over my own dead ancestor and swearing. Since I am, I'll finish by telling you to go to hell as well. He sighed a bit as she loped around graves and toward the road. You're a businesswoman, he reminded her when he caught up. 
So let's try to have a discussion. Failing that, I'll point out I'm bigger and stronger than you are. Don't make me prove it. So that's the way of it. She whipped around on him. You're going to threaten and bully me. Well, try it and see if you don't end up with another scar or two for your trouble. I just asked you not to make me bully you, he pointed out. Why did your brother go back to New York this morning? That's none of your flaming business. Since I just traveled 3,000 miles to see him, it is my flaming business. Rather than fight fire with fire, he kept his tone quiet and reasonable. And I can tell you, if he's gone to see Tia Marsh, he's not going to get a very warm reception. A lot you know about it, as she's paying his fare. As alone, she added with a sniff. We're not leeches or money grubbers. And he's been half sick since Gideon called to tell him about the murder. What? This time his hand clamped like steel on her arm. What murder? She was mad as a hornet, and because of it wanted to spit and kick at him. The bastard had stirred up something in her, had started stirring it from that first careless ahoy. But she saw something else in him now, something cold and determined. And that something else was hearing of murder for the first time. I'm not telling you a bloody thing until I know who you are and what you're about. I'm Jack Burdett. He took out his wallet, flipped out his driver's license. New York City, Burdett Security and Electronics. You got a computer, you can do a net search. She took the wallet, studied the identification. I'm a collector, just like I said. I've done some security work for Morningside Antiquities, and I've been a client. Anita dangled the three fates in front of me like bait because she knows it's the sort of thing I'm interested in and that I have a tendency to find things out. As she continued to flip through his wallet, he struggled for patience, then just nipped it out of her fingers, shoved it back in his pocket. Anita's mistake was in assuming I'd find them for her or that she could break through my own security measures and keep track of my movements. Who the hell is dead? That's not enough. I'll do that web search. Let me tell you something, Jack. I have a tendency to find things out as well. Tia Marsh. He fell into step beside Rebecca as she strode down the hill. You said she paid for your brother's flight to New York. She's okay, then? Rebecca slanted him a look. She's fine and well as far as I can tell. You know her, do you? Only met her once, but I liked her. Did anything happen to her parents? No. It has something to do with someone else altogether. And I'm not giving you names until I'm sure you've no part in it. I want the fates, but not enough to murder. If Anita's behind that, it changes the complexion of things. You don't sound as if you'd put such a thing past her. She's a spider, Jack said simply. I liked her husband. Did some work for him. I've done work for her, too. I don't have to like all my clients. How did your brother get tangled up with her? Because she... She broke off, scowled. I'm not saying. How did you get Malachi's name unless she gave it to you? Tia mentioned him. He walked in silence for a while. Listen, you and your family seem to have a nice business going here, he continued. You should think about letting this go. You're out of your league with Anita. You don't know me or my league. We'll have the three fates before it's done, that's a promise. And if you're such an interested collector, you can prepare yourself to ante up for them. And I thought you weren't a money grubber. Because she heard the humor in his voice, it didn't ruffle her feathers. I'm a businesswoman, Jack, as you pointed out yourself. And I can wheel and deal as well as anyone. Better than most. I've done my research on the fates. The complete set at auction at a place like Wiley's or Sotheby's could go for upwards of 20 million American dollars. More if the right publicity spins put on it. An incomplete set, even two-thirds of the three, would only net a fraction of that, and only from an interested collector. We'll have the three we were meant to. He let it go and kept pace with her brisk march up a long hill at the very edge of town. At the top was a pretty house with a pretty garden and a pretty woman tending it. She straightened, shielded her eyes with the flat of her hand. When she smiled in greeting, Jack caught the resemblance around the mouth. Well, Becca, darling, what have you brought home with you? Jack Burdett. I invited him home for tea before I knew he was a liar and a sneak. Is that so? Eileen's smile didn't dim in the slightest. 
Well, an invitation's an invitation after all. I'm Eileen Sullivan. She extended her hand over the garden gate. Mother to this rude creature. It's nice to meet you. I enjoyed your talk during the tour. It's kind of you to say so. You're from America, she added as she opened the gate. New York. I'm in Cove as I was hoping to talk to your son Malachi regarding the three fates. Sure, you have no trouble spilling it all out to her in a lump, Rebecca scolded. With me, it's all flirtation and pretense. I said I like the look of you, and since you don't strike me as a stupid woman, you'd know if a man looks at you and doesn't like what he sees, he's got a serious problem. Boiled down, that means there was flirtation, but no pretense. I've annoyed your daughter, Mrs. Sullivan. Amused, intrigued, Eileen nodded. That's easily done. Maybe we should talk inside before the neighbors start wagging about it. Kate Curry's already peeking out the window. So you've come from New York, she continued as she started up the short walk to the door. Have your family there? Not anymore. My parents moved to Arizona several years ago. They like the weather. Hot, I suppose. No wife then? Not anymore. I'm divorced. Ah. Eileen led the way into the company parlor. That's a pity. The marriage was a pity. The divorce was a lot easier on both of us. You have a good home, Mrs. Sullivan. She liked the way he put it. Yes, I do. And you make yourself comfortable in it. I'll see about that tea, then we'll talk. Rebecca, entertain our guest. Ma. With a withering glance at Jack, Rebecca hustled after Eileen. He could hear the whispers from the hallway where they stood. Argued, he decided with a grin. He couldn't make out the words until the last of them. That was clear. Rebecca Ann Margaret Sullivan, you get in the company parlor and show some manners this minute, or I'll know the reason why. Rebecca stomped back in, flung herself in the chair across from Jack's. Her face was full of storms and her voice full of ice. Don't think you'll get around me because you got around my mother. Wouldn't dream of it, Rebecca Ann Margaret. Oh, stop it! Tell me why your brother went back to New York. Tell me why you think Anita's involved in a murder. I'll tell you nothing at all until I've had a whack at my computer and see how much of what you've told me is the truth. Go ahead, do it now. He waved a hand. I'll cover for you with your mother. Rebecca weighed her mother's wrath against the burn of her own curiosity, knowing she'd pay for it dearly. She got to her feet. If one single thing you've said doesn't match, I'll boot you out personally. She walked to the doorway, and Jack saw her send an uneasy glance down the hall where her mother had gone before she charged up the stairs. Because he sympathized with the child's healthy fear of her mother, he rose and wandered back to the kitchen. I hope you don't mind. He stepped in while Eileen cut cake into neat squares. I wanted to see the house. I heard that girl go upstairs, and after I told her not to, my fault. I told her to go ahead and run a check on me. You both feel more comfortable once she does. If I didn't feel comfortable now, you wouldn't be in my home. She tapped a long bladed knife against the side of the cake plate, smiling a little, when his gaze dropped to it. I know how to judge a man when I look him in the eye, and I know how to take care of my own. I believe you. Good. Now I know why I went and baked this cake this morning, though the boys aren't about to eat it. She turned to the stove to finish the tea. For company, it's the parlor. For business, it's the kitchen. Then I guess it's the kitchen. Have a seat and have some cake. When the girl gets going on that computer, there's no telling when she'll show her face again. He couldn't remember the last time he'd had homemade cake or eaten in a kitchen that wasn't his own. It relaxed him. And made the time he normally would have marked pass easily. It was thirty minutes or more before Rebecca sailed in and pulled up a chair. He's who he says he is, she said to her mother. So that's something. When she reached for a piece of cake, Eileen slapped her hand away. You don't deserve any sweets. Oh, ma! Whatever your age, Rebecca, you don't disobey your mother without consequences. Her brows drew together, but she left the cake alone. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. She shifted her gaze and the darts in it to Jack. I wonder what you'll be needing with a flat in New York and another in Los Angeles, and still a third in London.
Though she surprised him, he sipped the tea. It had taken more than average computer skills to dig that deep. I travel a lot and prefer my own place to hotels when I can manage it. And what does the man's personal business have to do with this, Becca? At her mother's censorious tone, she bristled. I've got to know the nature of him, don't I? He shows up here this way just after Mal's left, and after that horrible business in New York where he admits he's just come from. I'd have done the same, he told her with a nod, and more. I intend to do more, but more takes time. What I did find was that you checked into your hotel here early this morning driving a rental car, and you'd booked your room two days ago. That's before the trouble in New York, so I can't see what one has to do with the other. He leaned forward now. Tell me who was murdered. It was a young man named Michael Hicks, Eileen told him. God rest him. Was he working with you? He was not. Rebecca huffed out a breath, then added, It's a complicated business. I'm good at complications. Rebecca looked at her mother. Darling, someone has died. Eileen laid a hand on her daughter's. An innocent young man by all accounts. Everything changes because of it. All this has to be put right again. If there's a chance Jack can help do that, we have to take it. Rebecca sat back, studied Jack's face. Will you help see she pays for what she's done? If Anita had anything to do with murder, I'll see she pays. You have my word on it. Rebecca nodded and, because she still wanted cake, folded her hands on the table. You tell it, Ma. You're better at telling. Eileen was good at telling, and, Rebecca discovered, Jack Burdett was good at listening. He asked no questions, made no comments, only sipped his tea and kept his attention on Eileen while she spoke. And so, she finished. Malachy's gone back to New York City to do what needs to be done. Jack nodded and wondered if this nice, cozy family had any conception of what they'd gotten themselves into. So this Cleo Tolliver has the second fate. It wasn't perfectly clear if she had it or knew where it was. The boy who died was a dear friend of hers, and she's blaming herself over it. And Anita knows who she is, but not where, at the moment. As it stands, Eileen confirmed. It'd be wise to keep it that way. If she's killed once, it'll be easy to kill again. Mrs. Sullivan, is it worth it to you to risk your family? Nothing's worth my family. But they won't be stopped now. I'd be disappointed in them if they did. There's a young man dead, and that has to be accounted for. This woman can't steal and murder without an accounting. How did she get the first fade away from you? How do you know she did? Rebecca demanded. Unless she told you herself. You told me, he said mildly. You called her a thief, and you put flowers on the grave of your great-great-grandfather, one Felix Greenfield, who'd been aboard the Lusitania. Up until recently, I believed the first fate to have been lost along with Henry W. Wiley. The way this plays out, the fate and your ancestor were spared. How did he manage it? Did he work for Wiley? Felix wasn't the only one who survived, Rebecca began. Oh, Becca, for pity's sake. The man's got a brain in his head, and he's used it. I'm afraid Felix stole the statue. He was a bit of a thief, but he reformed. He slipped the little thing in his pocket just as the torpedo hit. Though it might seem self-serving, I like to think it was meant. He stole it. A grin spread over Jack's face. That's perfect. Then Anita steals it from you. That's different, Rebecca insisted. She knew what it was, and Felix didn't. She used her dead husband's business reputation when Mal took it to her for appraisal. Then she used her body to dull his common sense, and him being a man, it was easily done. She made a fool out of all of us, and that, well, we'll have an accounting for that as well. If this is a matter of pride, you'd better rethink. She'll eat a tasty morsel like you alive. She can try, and she'll choke. Pride isn't a luxury, Eileen said quietly. And not always a kind of vanity. Surviving when others died changed Felix. It, you could say, made a man out of him. The fate was a symbol of that change, and it stood for it in our family for five generations. 
Now we know what it is beyond that symbol, and we believe the three should be brought back together. That was meant as well. Maybe there's profit in it, and we won't turn from that. But it's not for greed; it's for family. Anita has the first and knows, or thinks she knows, how to get the second. You're in her way, and the Sullivans aren't so easily pushed aside as she might think. Eileen said. Felix floated freezing on a broken crate, while one of the grandest ships ever built sank behind him. He survived while it didn't, while more than a thousand others didn't, and he had that little silver figure in his pocket. He brought it here, and we'll have it back. If I help you do that, help you put the three together, will you sell it to me? If you meet the asking price, Rebecca began, but her mother cut her off with one sharp look. If you help us, we'll sell it to you. You have my word on it, she said, and extended her hand over the table. He wanted time to think it through, so stayed over in Cove another day. It gave him the opportunity to make a number of calls. Begin a number of background checks on the players and what Jack was finding a very interesting game. He trusted Eileen Sullivan. While he was attracted to Rebecca, he didn't have the same instinctive faith in the daughter as he did in the mother. Because he wanted a second run at her, Jack bought another ticket for the tour and strolled down to the dock. She didn't look pleased to see him. The cheerful expression she wore while chatting with passengers went cold and hard when her gaze shifted, landed on him. She snatched the voucher out of his hand. What are you doing back here? Maybe I can't keep away from you. Bollocks! But it's your money. I'll give you ten pounds more for a seat on the bridge and some conversation. Twenty. She held out a hand. In advance. Distrusting and mercenary. He dug out twenty pounds. Careful, I could fall in love with you. Then I'd have the pleasure of grinding your heart into dust. For that, I refund your twenty. Take your seat then, and don't touch anything. I've got to get started. He waited, let her wonder and stew as she maneuvered into the harbor and set her mother's recording. Looks like rain, he commented. We've a couple of hours yet. You don't strike me as a man who makes the same trip twice without good reason. What do you want? Another invitation to tea? You won't get it. Now that's cold. Other than me, have you noticed anyone hanging around, taking this tour, walking by your house, maybe showing up along your daily routine? You think we're being watched? Rebecca shook her head. She doesn't do it that way. She's not worried about what we're doing here in Cove. She's concerned with what one of us might be doing when we're not at home. She tracked my brothers when they went off, and I think she did that through the airline tickets, the credit card, you know. It's not that difficult to get such information if you're clever with a computer. It's not that simple either. If I can do it, she or someone she pays can as well. And can you? I can do damn near anything with a computer. I know, for instance, that you were divorced five years ago, after one year and three months of marriage. Not such a long time. Long enough, apparently. I know your address in New York City. Should I want to pay a call sometime in the future? I know you went to Oxford University and graduated in the top ten percent of your class. That's not too bad," she added, considering. "Thanks. I know you have no criminal record, at least none that shows on a surface look, and that your company, which you started twelve years ago, has a strong international reputation and has given you an estimated net, net, mind you, worth of twenty-six million American dollars, and that," she said with the first hint of laughter in her eyes, "isn't so very bad either." He stretched out his legs. That's a lot of digging, and very impressive work. He thought. Oh, not so very much. She waved it, and the six hours she'd spent at her keyboard off. And I was curious. Curious enough to take a trip to Dublin? Why would I want to go to Dublin? Because I'm going tonight. Is that a proposition, Jack? And why my mother's voice is coming through the speaker? It is, but whether it's personal or business is up to you. There's someone in Dublin I need to see. I think it'll be worth your while to tag along. Who would this be? You want to find out? Have a bag packed and be ready by five thirty. I'll come by for you. I'll think about it, she replied, but was mentally packing her bag. Fourteen.
I know I'm leaving you short-handed, Ma. That's not what concerns me. Eileen frowned as Rebecca rolled up a sweater like a sausage and stuffed it into her bag. I said I had a good feeling about Jack Burdett and that I trusted him to be an honest man, but that doesn't mean I feel easy about my daughter going off with him after one day's acquaintance. It's business. Rebecca debated between jeans and trousers. And if it were Mal or Gideon heading out like this, you wouldn't think twice. I think twice, as they're as precious to me as you. But as you're a daughter instead of a son, I'm thinking three or four times. That's the nature of things, Rebecca. And there's no point in getting sulky over it. I know how to take care of myself. Eileen laid a hand on Rebecca's tumbled curls. You do, yes. And I know how to handle men. Eileen lifted her eyebrows. Those you've had dealings with up to now, but you haven't dealt with the likes of this one before. A man's a man, Rebecca said dismissively, and ignored her mother's hearty sigh. Mal and Gideon have been traipsing all over the world, while I stay here at the wheel or the keyboard. It's time I had some part of the adventure of it, Ma. Now I've a chance to, if only to go as far as Dublin for it. She's always fought to stand toe to toe with her brothers, Eileen thought, and had worked for it, earned it. Take an umbrella; it's raining. She was packed and walking out the front door when Jack pulled up. She wore a light jacket against the steady rain and carried a single duffel. He appreciated both promptness and efficiency in a woman, and the independence that had her tossing the bag in the back seat before he could walk around to take it from her. She kissed her mother. Then ended up exchanging a hard, swaying hug before climbing into the car. It's my only girl. I'm trusting you with Jack. Eileen stood in the rain, laid a hand on his arm. If I come to regret it, I'll hunt you down like a dog. I'll take care of her. She can take care of herself, or she wouldn't be going with you. But she's my only daughter and my youngest child, so I'm putting the weight of it on you. I'll have her back tomorrow. Telling herself to be content with that, Eileen stepped back and watched them drive away in the rain. She'd expected they'd drive all the way to Dublin and had prepared herself for the tedium of it. Instead, he drove to Cork Airport and turned in the rental car, and she prepared instead for the short flight. She wasn't prepared for the little private jet or for Jack himself to take the controls. Is it yours? She ordered her nerves to quiet. As she took her seat in the cockpit beside him, the company's simplifies things. She cleared her throat as he went over his checklist. And you're a good pilot, are you? So far, he replied absently, then shot her a glance. You've flown before, of course. She blew out a breath. Once and on a big plane where I wasn't required to sit beside the pilot. There's a parachute in the back. I'm trying to think if that's funny or not. She kept her hands folded as he was given clearance and began the taxi to his assigned runway. When he picked up speed and she watched the gauges, when the nose of the plane lifted, her stomach gave one quick shudder, then smoothed out. Oh, it's something, isn't it? She strained forward, watching the ground fall away. Not like a big plane at all. It's better. How long does it take to get a pilot's license? Can I have a go at the wheel? Maybe on the way back if we have clear weather. If I can pilot a boat in a storm, I ought to be able to fly a little plane in a shower of rain. It must be grand being rich. It has its advantages. When we have the fates and sell them to you, I'm taking my mother on a holiday. It was interesting, he thought, that that would be her first priority. Not that she would buy a fancy car or fly to Milan to shop. But that she would take her mother on vacation. Where to? Oh, I don't know. Relaxed now, despite the turbulence, she eased back to peer at the stacks of clouds. Some place exotic, I think, an island like Tahiti or Bimini, where she can stretch out under an umbrella on the beach and see blue water while she drinks some silly thing out of a coconut shell. What's in those things anyway? The road to perdition. Is it now? Well then, that'll be good for her as well. She works so hard and she never complains about it. Now we've been throwing money around right and left, when by rights it should be in the bank so she can feel secure. She paused, then shifted to look at him. 
What she said to you yesterday, that it wasn't about greed, that's the truth for her. I might be greedy, though I prefer to think of it as practical, but she's not. Greedy, he thought. No, a greedy woman didn't fantasize about taking her mother to a tropical island and getting her plastered on coconut drinks. Is that your way of telling me when you get the statue back you'll skin me over the purchase price? She only smiled. Let me have a go at the wheel there, Jack. No. Why haven't you asked me why we're going to Dublin? Because you wouldn't tell me, and I'd be wasting my breath. That's refreshing. I'll tell you this instead. I did background checks on you and your brothers and on Cleo Tolliver. Is that so? Her voice cooled. You ran me, Irish. So let's call it tit for tat. Tolliver had some light smears on her juvenile record. Underage drinking, shoplifting, disorderly conduct. Basic teenage rebellion type stuff. She got plugged into the system because her parents didn't rush to get her out again. What do you mean? A combination of shock and outrage warred inside her. That they let her go to jail. Their own child. Juvie's not jail, but it's close enough. Her parents divorced and her mother likes to remarry. She bounced between the two of them, then took off when she hit 18. No dings on her adult record, so she either cleaned up her act or got better at avoiding the cops. You're telling me this because you think with her background, her record, she might be a problem for us. If Gideon thought that, he'd have said so. I don't know, Gideon, and I prefer drawing my own conclusions. Speaking of your brothers, they're both clear as far as legal difficulties. And you... You're as pure as your skin. She jerked her head back when he reached over to brush a fingertip down her cheek. Mind your hands. What is it about Irish women and their skin? He said as if to himself. Makes a man want to lap it up, especially when it smells like yours. I don't mix flirtations and business, she said stiffly. I do, as often as possible. Being a practical woman, I'd think you'd appreciate the efficiency of multitasking. She had to laugh. Well, now, I'll admit that's a unique line, Jack. But if you think the sophisticated world traveler can lure the naive village girl with clever lines, you've mistaken the matter. I don't think you're naive. He turned his head, met her eyes. I think you're fascinating. And more. I'm curious about what I felt run through me when I looked over the high grass and old stones of a cemetery and watched you lay flowers on a grave. I'm very curious about that, Rebecca, and I always satisfy my curiosity. I felt something, too. That's as much why I've come with you as wanting to know what's in Dublin. But don't think you can maneuver me, Jack, because you can't. I have a goal to meet for myself, for my family. Nothing can get in the way of it. I didn't think you'd admit it. He gave his attention to his instruments. That you'd felt something. You're a straightforward woman, Rebecca. A straightforward woman who knows computers, who can pack for a last-minute trip in a single bag and be on time. Where have you been all my life? We're about to start our approach, he said before she could answer. There was another rental car waiting at Dublin Airport, and this time Jack hauled up Rebecca's bag before she could grab it herself. She didn't comment on it, nor on the conversation they'd had in the plane. She wasn't sure either would be safe topics at the moment. She didn't speak at all until he headed away from the city and set up toward it. Dublin's the other way, she pointed out. We're not actually going into the city. Then why did you say we were? Her suspicious nature was just one more thing he found appealing. We flew into Dublin, and now we're driving a few miles south. When we're done, we'll drive back and fly out of Dublin. And where might we be spending the night? At a place I haven't been to for a couple of years. You'll have your own room, he added, with the option of sharing mine. I'll take my own. Who's paying for it? He grinned, lightning fast, in a way that engaged his whole face and made her want to trace a finger over that faint, crescent scar. That won't be a problem. It's pretty country he commented, gesturing at the rising green hills that shimmered through the thinning rain. Easy to see why he decided to retire here. Who? The man we're going to see. Tell me, do you share your mother's belief that the fates are a kind of symbol? I suppose I do. 
and that they belong together for reasons more than their monetary, even artistic value? Yes. Why? One more. Do you agree that what goes around comes around? She blew out an impatient breath. If you're meaning there are cycles and circles to things, I do. Then you're going to appreciate this. He took the car up a hill, then around to a pretty road lined with dripping hedgerows and painted bungalows with thriving gardens. The road climbed again, turned again, and he swung into a short drive beside a lovely stone house where the chimney was smoking and the gardens were a small sea of beauty. Your friend lives here. Yeah. Even as Jack stepped out of the car, the door of the house opened. An old man stood in the doorway, leaning on a cane and grinning. He had a monk's fringe of snowy hair topping a wide face lined with deep creases. Silver frame glasses slid down his nose. Mary. His voice croaked like a frog. They're here. He shouted and came forward even as Jack hurried to him. Don't come out in the rain. Hell, boy, little rain doesn't hurt. Everything else does at my age, but not a bit of wet. He caught Jack in a one-armed embrace. Rebecca saw now the old man was quite tall, but bent a bit with age. His big hand reached up to lie across Jack's cheek and looked, despite its size, fragile there and somehow sweet. I've missed you, Jack said, and leaned down in an easy, unselfconscious gesture. Rebecca admired and kissed the old man lightly on the lips. This is Rebecca Sullivan. He shifted his body. And again, she noted the gentleness in him when he slid a hand under the man's arm. Well, you said she was a beauty, and so she is. He reached out and took her hand, simply held it, and she saw with puzzled embarrassment the sparkle of tears come into his eyes. Rebecca, this is my great grandfather. Oh. At sea, she managed to smile. It's nice to meet you, sir. My great grandfather, he repeated, Stephen Edward Cunningham the third. Cunningham. Her throat snapped closed. Stephen Cunningham, sweet Jesus. It's a great pleasure to welcome you into my house. Stephen stepped back, blinking at tears. Mary, he shouted again. Deaf as a post, he stated. And she's forever turning her bloody hearing aid off. Run up and get her, Jack. I'll take Rebecca into the parlor. She's fussing with your room, he said as he led Rebecca away. Been fussing since Jack called to say you were coming. Mister Cunningham. Off balance, she walked blindly into a neat parlor where everything gleamed, and sank at his urging into the deep cushions of a wing-backed chair. You're the same Stephen Cunningham who, who was on the Lusitania. The same as who owes his life to Felix Greenfield. And you're Jack's great grandfather. His mother's my granddaughter. And here we are. Here we are. He repeated, and pulled a handkerchief from his pocket. I'm sentimental in my old age. I don't know what to say to you. My head's spinning. She lifted a hand to her temple as if to hold it in place. I've heard of you all my life, and somehow always thought of you as a little boy. I was just three when my parents made that crossing. He sighed deeply, then tucked the handkerchief away. I can't be sure how much I actually remember, or how much I think I remember, because my mother told me the story so often. He walked over to a polished gate-leg table crowded with framed photographs and lifted one, brought it to Rebecca. My parents, it's their wedding photo. She saw a handsome young man with a dashing mustache and a woman, hardly more than a girl, glorious in silk and lace, and her bridal glow. They're beautiful. Tears threatened to spill. Oh, Mister Cunningham. My mother lived another sixty-three years, thanks to Felix Greenfield. Stephen took his handkerchief out again and gently pressed it into Rebecca's hand. She never remarried. For some, there's only one love in a lifetime. But she was content and she was productive and she was grateful. The story's true, then. 
composing herself, she handed him the photograph. I'm proof of that. He turned at the sound of footsteps on the stairs. Here comes Jack with my Mary. When she's done fussing over you, we'll talk about it. Mary Cunningham was indeed deaf as a post, but in honor of the occasion, she turned her hearing aid on. Rebecca was given a lovely room with fresh flowers and china vases, and invited to rest or freshen up before supper. She did neither, but simply sat on the side of the bed, hoping her mind would settle. It was Jack who knocked on her door fifteen minutes later. Rebecca stayed where she was and studied him. Why didn't you tell me? I thought it would mean more this way. It did to him, and that matters to me. She nodded. I think in my heart, I always believed it happened just as I'd been told, but in my head I wasn't so sure. I want to thank you for bringing me here, for giving me this. He crossed over, crouched in front of her. Do you believe in connections, Rebecca? In the power of them? Even the inevitability of them? I'd have to, wouldn't I? I'm not a sentimental man, he began, but she laughed and shook her head. I saw you with Steve and then with Mary, so don't tell me you're not sentimental. About people who matter to me, but not about things. I don't romanticize. He took her hand, felt her brace. I looked at you. That's really all it took. It's confusing. She managed to keep her voice steady, though her heart was humming in her throat. This maze of circumstances that links our families. It's more than that. I'd like to keep things simple. Not a chance, he told her, as he drew her to her feet. Besides, I like complications. Life's bland without them. You're a hell of a complication. Don't. She pressed a hand to his chest as he pulled her closer and felt like an idiot. I'm not being coy. I'm being careful. You're trembling. Oh, you enjoy that, don't you? Getting me all stirred up and confused. Damn right. He gave her one hard tug. It brought her to her toes, had her sucking in a breath for an oath. Then his mouth was on hers, hard and hot and hungry enough to blur the curse into a small sound of shock. He kissed like a man accustomed to taking, with a ruthless skill that had her pulse pumping fast and her belly quivering with need. Though the reaction stupefied her, she felt her own bones go liquid. And so did he. His hands dived into her hair, used it to draw her head back. The first time I saw you, he said. That's never happened to me before. I don't know you. But her lips were warm with the taste of his, her body primed for the weight of him. I don't sleep with men I don't know. He lowered his head, skimmed his teeth lightly over her throat. Is that a firm policy? It used to be. He nipped his way along her jaw. We're going to get to know each other very quickly. All right, that's all right. Don't kiss me again now. It isn't proper. Not with them downstairs this way, Jack. They're waiting. Supper for us. Then we'll go down. They settled in the small dining room made charming with china figures and antique glass. The walls were decorated with a collection of old, floral pattern plates. You have such a lovely home, Rebecca complimented Mary. It's so nice of you to let me come. It's a treat for us. Mary beamed and helpfully cocked her ear in Rebecca's direction. Jack never brings his girls to see us. Doesn't he? No, indeed. She had the soft music of Ireland in her voice. We only met the one he married twice, and once was at the wedding. We didn't like her very much, did we, Stephen? Now, Mary. Well, we didn't. She had a cold streak, if you ask me, and... The roast beef's perfect, Graham. Distracted. Mary sent Jack a twinkling look. You always favored my pot roast. I married you for it, Stephen said with a wink. Like a lot of young men, I did the grand tour when I was done with university, he told Rebecca. Outside of Dublin, I stayed at a small inn and met my Mary, whose parents ran it. 
I fell in love with her over roast beef and ended my tour then and there. It took me two weeks to convince her to marry me and move back to Bath. You exaggerate. It took you only ten days. And we've been married now sixty-eight years. We lived in America for a time in New York. My father's family had fallen on very hard times. They'd never recovered from the crash of twenty-nine. One of my daughters married an American and settled there. It's her daughter who's Jack's mother. He reached over to lay his hand over Mary's. We've had four children, two sons, and two daughters. They gave us eleven grandchildren, and they six great grandchildren and counting. Every one of them owes their life to Felix Greenfield. That one unselfish and courageous act set the rest in motion. He didn't intend it. The way it's been told in my family, Rebecca explained. He only wanted to live to survive. He was panicked when he found the life jacket. He thought only of saving himself. Then he saw your mother and you trapped in the debris. He said she was so calm, so beautiful in the midst of all the horror, and she held you close to comfort you and you her, without even crying for all you were just a little thing. And he couldn't turn away. I remember his face, Stephen said. Dark eyes, white skin already smeared with smoke or soot. My father was gone. I didn't see it happen, or don't remember. That she'd never speak of. But we fell when the ship lurched. She was carrying me, and we fell. She twisted herself to keep me from hitting the deck. She always had a limp when she tired after that. She was a brave and wonderful woman, Rebecca said. Oh, she was. And I think her courage met Felix Greenfield's that day. The ship was sinking and the deck tilting higher and higher. He pulled her up it, trying to get us to one of the lifeboats. But the boat lurched again, and though he tried to reach us, I see his face even now as he called out and tried to get to her. We fell into the water. Without the life jacket he'd given us, we wouldn't have had a prayer. Even with it, it's a miracle. He said she was hurt. She broke her arm, shielding me as we went into the water. And as I said, she had already badly twisted her leg. She wouldn't let me go. I had barely a scratch. The miracle, he said, was my mother and Felix Greenfield. Because of them, you could say the thread of my life has been long and productive. When Rebecca stared, Jack lifted his water glass. Which brings us to the fates. Did I tell you my great great grandfather had a small antique shop in Bath? A chill ran over Rebecca's skin. You didn't mention it, no. Yes, indeed. Stephen polished off his roast beef. Inherited from my grandfather. We were going to visit my mother's parents there. My grandmother wasn't well. After my father was lost, we stayed in Bath rather than returning to New York. Because of that, I developed quite an interest in antiques and made my own living through them. In the same shop my grandfather had, another twist of fate that owes its run to Felix. He crossed his knife and fork tidily over his plate. I can't tell you how fascinated I was when Jack told me Felix stole one of the three fates from Henry Wiley's stateroom just before he saved my life. Mary dear, are we going to have that apple pie in the parlor? Never can wait for his pie. Go on and settle in, then. I'll bring it along shortly. Questions were tripping over her tongue, but her mother had drummed manners into her. I'll help you clear, Mrs. Cunningham. Oh, there's no need. Please, I'd like to help. Mary shot Jack an arch look as everyone got to their feet. The one you married never offered to clear a dish, to my recollection. While the dishes were seen to, Rebecca was treated to a full rundown of Jack's ex-wife. She'd been beautiful, brainy and blonde, an American lawyer who, according to Mary, worried more about her career than hearth and home. They'd taken their time marrying and had divorced, in her opinion, in a finger snap and without even the heart for battling over it. Rebecca made appropriate noises and filed the information away. She was interested. In fact, she was dying to know everything. But she couldn't juggle the matter in her brain with thoughts of the fates. 
She wheeled in the dessert tray herself and held back the barrage of questions that raced through her mind. This one's been raised right, Mary said with approval. Your mother must be a fine woman. She is, thank you. Now, if the two of you don't finish what you've started and give the poor child the rest of it, I'll do it myself. Connections, Jack said. We've talked about them, haven't we, Rebecca? We have. The little shop in Bath was called Brown's. It was established in the early 1800s and catered for a number of years to the gentry who came to Bath for the waters. Often its clientele were those who needed to liquidate possessions into cash discreetly. So its stock was varied and often unique. While discreet, it was a carefully run business and records were meticulously kept. According to them, in the summer of 1883, a certain Lord Barlow sold a number of trinkets and artifacts to Browns. Among them was a small silver statue, Grecian style, of a woman holding a pair of scissors. Holy Mary, Mother of God! My grandfather was proprietor of Browns when Wiley made his last crossing. Stephen continued. I have no way of knowing if he'd been in touch with my grandfather regarding the fate. I first learned of them when I was a young man, enthusiastically studying my trade. I was interested in the legend of the statue and whether or not the one Browns had purchased so long before had been authentic. When I heard that Wiley had owned one of the set and had, by all accounts, taken it with him on the ship, I was more fascinated. But even if the statue Browns had bought was authentic, Jack put in. Its value was diminished, as the first fate was, by all accounts, lost along with Wiley. So what was left was an intriguing connection to another Lusitania passenger and a piece of a legend. Was it real? Where is it now? Rebecca demanded. My mother never tires of family history. Rather than answering, Jack rose to put another log on the parlor fire. I was raised on it, and the sinking of the Lusitania... The legend of the fates were part of all that. And I came by my own interest in antiques, naturally, he added, laying a hand on Stephen's shoulder. When Anita mentioned the fates, it stirred my interest in them again, enough that I phoned my mother and asked her to confirm the story she'd told me. Enough for me to arrange an overdue visit here with a stop in Cove to check out Sullivan and pay my respects to Felix Greenfield. He crossed to a satinwood display cabinet, opened it. Imagine my surprise when I discovered the Sullivans were just one more connection to this. He turned and held up the third fate. It's here. Though her legs felt like rubber, Rebecca rose. It's been here all along. Where it's been, he said as he held it out for her. Since Grandad closed the doors of Brown's twenty-six years ago. She held it in her cupped hand testing the weight, studying the cool, almost sorrowful silver face. Gently she ran her thumb over the shallow notch in the left corner of the base, where, Rebecca knew, Atropus would link with Lachesis. Another thread, another circle. What will you do now? Now I take it with me back to New York, negotiate with Cleo Tolliver for hers, then figure out how to get yours back from Anita. It's good you remember the first is mine. She gave the statue back to him. I'll be going to New York as well. You'll be going back to Cove, he corrected, and staying an ocean away from Anita. She angled her head. I'll be going to New York with you, or on my own, for I'm damned if you or my brothers will finish this off without me. You'd best resign yourself, Jack, that I won't be tucked in a corner to wait while the men do the work. I pull my own weight. There now. Mary cut her husband a second slice of pie. What did I tell you? I like this one much better than the one you married, Jack. Sit down and finish your pie, Rebecca. Of course you're going with him to New York. Her expression was smug as Rebecca turned away and sat. She forked up a bite of pie. Thank you, Mrs. Cunningham. I wonder if I should stop in Dublin and buy some clothes for the trip, or wait and buy some things in New York. I've only packed one change of clothes. Oh, I'd wait if you can. You'll have such a fine time shopping New York, won't you? It's not a damn vacation. 
Jack snapped. Don't interrupt your gram, Rebecca said mildly. Let it go, boy. Stephen waved a hand. You're outnumbered. Fifteen. Malachi knew exactly how he would handle Tia, from his initial greeting to his overall tone of approach. He would apologize again, of course. There was no question about that. And he would use all the charm and persuasion at his disposal to soften her stance toward him. He owed her. There was no question of that either. For the financial backing, but more, much more, for the help she'd given his brother. That he could repay by keeping their association completely professional. Friendly but reserved, he thought he understood her well enough to know that was the way she'd prefer it. Once they were on the proper footing again, they would get down to business. He and Gideon would move into a hotel. Naturally, they couldn't continue to impose on her privacy, but he hoped he could convince her to allow the Tolliver woman to stay. In that way, he'd be assured they were both safe, and almost as important that they were out of his way. A bit worn from the trip, he knocked briskly on her apartment door, and hoped her sense of hospitality would run to a cold beer. Then she opened the door, and he forgot the beer in his carefully outlined approach. You've cut your hair. Without thinking, he reached out to dance his fingers over the short ends of it. Just look at you. She didn't jerk back. That was the willpower she'd been working on for hours, but she stepped back stiffly. Come in, Malachi. Set your bags down. She invited. I hope your flight went well. It was fine. It suits you, you know, the hair. You look wonderful. I miss seeing you, Tia. Do you want a drink? I would, please. I'm sorry I haven't even thanked you for fronting me the means to fly over. It's business. She turned and walked into the kitchen. You've changed more than your hair. Maybe, assuming he'd prefer a beer as his brother did, she pulled one out of the refrigerator, shifted to get a glass from the cupboard. Maybe I've had to. I'm sorry, Tia, for the way I handled things. Proud of herself, she popped the top of the beer and poured it into the glass without the slightest tremor in her hand. The way you handled me, you mean? Yes, I could make excuses for it. He took the glass she held out to him, waited for her gaze to meet and hold his. I could even make you accept them, but I won't bother. I regret lying to you more than I can tell you. There's no point in hashing it over at this stage. She started to walk back into the living room and stopped when he stepped over to block her. It wasn't all a lie. Though her color came up, her voice was cool and brisk. There's no point in discussing that either. We have a mutual interest and a mutual claim on a particular piece of art. I intend to use my resources and yours to get it back. That's all there is to discuss. You're making it easier on me. Oh, she cocked her head to what she hoped was a sarcastic angle. How? By not being vulnerable. I don't have to worry so much about bruising you. I had thin skin once. That doesn't seem to be one of my problems anymore. Now, house rules. This time she skirted quickly around him and began to breathe easier as soon as she had some distance. No smoking in the apartment. You can use the terrace, or as Gideon is just now, the roof. He and Cleo had a good case of cabin fever working up, so I suggested they use the roof for a while. It's not as confining as the terrace, and it's safe. He started to tell her he and his brother would go to a hotel, then changed his mind. If she wasn't bothered, why should he be? I quit smoking two years ago, so it's not a problem for me. Good, you'll live longer. You clean up after yourself, and that includes dishes, laundry, papers, whatever. I like a tidy place. You'll have to sleep on the couch as Gideon and Cleo have the spare bed. That means you'll have to be prepared to get up at a reasonable hour in the morning. Because she was starting to sound more like Tia, he began to enjoy himself and sat on the arm of the couch. What's reasonable? Seven. Ouch. You and Gideon will have to work out a shower schedule. You'll have use of the small bathroom. Cleo can share mine, but it and my bedroom are off limits to you and your brother. Clear enough, Crystal, darling. I'm keeping a record of expenses. 
the flight, of course, and food, any other transportation. You will pay me back. That irritated him enough to have him push to his feet. We fully intend to pay you back. We're not leeches. I can get a bank loan and clear it up straight away. Feeling small, she turned away. That's not necessary. I'm angry with you. I can't help it. Tia, don't. Alerted by the gentle tone, she whirled back. Don't soothe me. I can be angry with you and do what needs to be done. I'm very good at working around unstable emotions. Now, do you cook? He raked a hand through his hair. After a fashion. Good. Cleo doesn't. That leaves you, Giddy, and me, and take out. Now we can. She broke off, glancing over as she heard the key in the lock. Cleo came in first, looking a bit sweaty, outrageously sexy and suspiciously rumpled. Her smile was slow and considering as she sized up Malachi. So this must be Big Brother. Mal. Gideon strode in behind her, and the two men caught each other in a hard, unselfconscious hug. It's good to see you. We've got a fucking mess on our hands. It took thirty minutes and another beer to bring him up to date. I don't see what business this Burdette has sticking his nose in it. Malachi brooded into his second beer, then got up to pace. It just adds another complication. If he hadn't stuck his nose in, I wouldn't know my phones are tapped, would I? Tia rose, picked up the glass Malachi had set down, and put a coaster under it. He says they're tapped. Why would he make it up? In any case, I went to see my father this morning and asked him about Jack. My father confirms who he is and that he's a serious collector, and the police detective vouched for him. You're just pissed off because there's another guy in the mix. Cleo fluttered her lashes and took a sip of Gideon's beer when Malachi turned to scowl at her. It's the testosterone thing, and nobody blames you for it. Tia, you got any cookies in here? Um, I think I have some sugarless wafers. Honey, we really need to talk. Life should never be about sugarless wafers. Now, before you climb up my ass, she said to Malachi, remember we've had a little more time to think about Burdett and his place in all this. He knows Anita, she continued, taking off the points on her fingers. He knows security, and he's interested in the fates. We hope to sell mine in the third when we get it. The way I see it, you've got two potential buyers now instead of one. We can have our own private auction. I might not like having another player in the game, Gideon put in, but it makes sense, Mal. Anita's been tracking us right along. Could be this Burdette helps us with that end. And he, his father, says how he's got money, so we sell to him. I'd rather that than have any more dealings with that bitch Anita. Besides all this, I called Ma from the payphone down the street to check in, and she's met him. She trusts him, and that's enough for me. I'll decide that for myself. You said he left your business card here. Malachi drummed his fingers on his thigh as he worked out the details in his mind. I'll ring him up and have a meeting with him face to face. And if he's such a bloody security expert, he can fix these damn phones so we're not running down to a phone box every time we turn around. You need some carbs, Cleo decided. You got carbs around here, right? Uh, Tia glanced nervously toward her kitchen. Yes, I... Don't worry, I'll root around. I get pissy when my carbs are low, she said sympathetically to Malachi. I'm not being pissy. She unfolded herself and walked over to Pinch's cheeks. Since we're the ones you're pissing on, handsome, we should know. You Sullivans don't travel very well. Slick there was ragged out when we got here, too. You're pretty, aren't you? She cocked her head. You guys have some superior DNA. She teased a laugh out of him. You're quite the package, aren't you? Damn right. Hey, Tia, let's just order some pizza. Couple large with the works ought to do it. I don't really eat. She broke off when Cleo turned and gaped at her. If you're about to tell me you don't eat pizza, I'm getting a gun and putting you out of your misery. It didn't seem the time to discuss fat grams or the fact that she suspected she might be allergic to tomato sauce. If the phones are tapped and I order two large pizzas, isn't that going to seem strange to whoever's listening since I'm supposed to be here alone? So they'll think you're a greedy pig. Let's live dangerously. And besides, I have a two o'clock lunch appointment, which I should be leaving for right now. Who are you meeting? Malachi asked as she walked into the bedroom. Tia. 
Bedroom's off limits, Gideon muttered before his brother could follow. She's very strict about it. She's not acting like herself. He jammed his hands in his pockets and frowned at the bedroom door. I don't know as I like it. Figuring on what's been going around here the past couple of days, you could cut her a break. She took us in, Cleo reminded him. She sure as hell didn't have to. You messed with her head. Hold on. She held up a hand when he spun around and snarled. I'm not saying I wouldn't have played it the same way, but when you've already got low self-esteem issues, having a guy fuck with you can really screw you up. That's quite an analysis in a short order. You dance naked for a few months, you learn a lot about people. She shrugged. We're going to like each other fine after we get to know each other better, sweetheart. I already like your baby brother and your taste in women, she added, nodding toward the bedroom door. Later you can explain to me how dancing naked turns you into a psychologist. But for now... Malachi banged a fist on the bedroom door. Tia, where the devil are you going? The door opened, and she hurried out. He caught the drift of the perfume she'd just sprayed on. She'd painted her lips as well and slipped into a streamlined black blazer. A small and unwelcome curl of jealousy formed in his gut. Who are you meeting for lunch? Anita Gay. She opened her purse to check the contents. I can call the pizza in from a phone booth on the way. Cool, thanks. Great jacket, Cleo commented. Really? It's new. I wasn't sure if... Well, it doesn't matter. I should be back by four or four-thirty. Just one bloody minute. Malachi beat her to the door, slammed a hand on it. If you think I'm having you walk out of here and have lunch with a woman we know hires killers, you've lost your fucking mind. Don't swear at me, and don't tell me what you'll have me do. Nerves hopped in her stomach and urged her to shrink back, but she held her ground. You're not in charge of me, or of this consortium, she decided. Now move aside, I'm going to be late. Tia. Since anger didn't work, he switched smoothly to charm. I'd be worried about you as all. She's a dangerous woman. We all know how dangerous now. And I'm weak and foolish and out of my league. Yes, no, oh, Christ. He held up a hand, though he was tempted to strangle her or himself with it. Just tell me what you're trying to do here. Have lunch, she called and asked me. I agreed. I assume she thinks she can pump some information out of me regarding the fates in Henry Wiley, and you. I'm perfectly aware of her agenda, as she's never spoken above twenty words to me before in her life. However, she isn't and won't be aware of mine. I'm not the moron you think I am, Malachi. I don't think that of you, Tia. He bit back an oath when he noted neither Cleo nor his brother had the courtesy to pretend they weren't listening. Let's go up on the roof and talk about this. No. Now, unless you plan to wrestle me to the ground and tie me in a closet, I'm going out to have lunch. At a girl, Tia, Cleo said under her breath, and earned an elbow in the ribs from Gideon. Mal, Gideon said quietly, ease back now. When he did, Tia wrenched open the door. Don't forget the pizza, Cleo called out just before Tia slammed it in Malachi's face. If that woman hurts her, what's she gonna do? Cleo demanded. Stab Tia with her salad fork? Cool your jets a minute and think. This is smart. Odds are Anita thinks Tia's a dork when she's the one who'll be out of her league. Smart money says Tia comes back with a lot of information, while Anita slinks off with nothing. She's bloody brilliant, Mal, Gideon confirmed. And we need her. You should relax. Right. But he knew he wouldn't, until Tia came back. Even with her active fantasy life, Tia had never imagined herself as a kind of spy, sort of a double agent, she decided, as she arrived exactly on time for lunch. And all she had to do was be herself to pull it off, shy, jittery, anal, and boring, she thought, as she was shown to her table. Some secret agent. Naturally, Anita was late because in Tia's experience, women who weren't shy, jittery, anal, and boring were most often late for appointments because they had a life, she supposed. Well, she sure as hell had a life now and still managed to be prompt. She ordered mineral water and tried not to look conspicuous and, well, jittery, as she sat alone in the quiet elegance of Café Pierre for the next ten minutes. 
Anita swept in. There was really no other word for that stylish and urbanely rushed entrance. Wearing a gorgeous suit the color of ripe eggplant and a spectacular necklace fashioned from complicatedly braided gold and chunks of amethyst. I'm so sorry I'm late. I hope you haven't been waiting long. She leaned down and air kissed Tia's cheek before sliding into her chair and setting her cell phone beside her plate. No, I trapped with a client and couldn't shake loose. Anita interrupted. Vodka martini, she told the waiter. Stoli, straight up, dry as dust, two olives. Then she sat back, let out the long breath of a woman about to decompress. I'm so glad we could do this. I so rarely have the chance to have a non-business lunch these days. You look well, Tia. Thank you.、Uh, you, you've done something different, haven't you? Anita pursed her lips, tapped her crimson fingertips on the table as she tried to put a clearer picture of Tia in her mind. You've changed your hair. Very flattering. Men make such a to-do about long hair on a woman. I can't think why. She added, tossing back her own luxurious locks. Now tell me all about your travels. It must have been fascinating, lecturing all over Europe. Tiring though. You look just exhausted, but you'll bounce back. You're really a champion bitch, aren't you? Tia thought and sipped her water as Anita's martini was served. It was a difficult and fascinating experience. You don't see as much of the world as you might think. You're in airports and hotels and the lecture venues. But still, there are benefits. Did you meet that gorgeous Irishman you were dining with while you were traveling? Actually, I did. He attended one of my lectures in Europe, then looked me up when he had business here in New York. He was awfully handsome, wasn't he? Extremely. And he was interested in mythology. Hmm. Tia picked up her menu, scanned her choices. Yes, very much, particularly in the groupings, the sirens, the muses, the fates. Do you suppose I could get this grilled chicken salad without the pine nuts? I'm sure. Are you still in touch with him? With who? Tia tipped down her menu, tipped down her reading glasses, smiled vaguely. Oh, with Malachi? No, he had to go back to Ireland. I, I thought he might call, but I suppose. It is three thousand miles after all. Men don't generally call me after a date when they live in Brooklyn. Men are such pigs. The Amazons had the right idea: use them for sex and propagation, then kill them. She laughed, then turned to the waiter when he stepped up to the table. I'll have the Caesar salad, a mineral water, and another martini. Um, do you use free-range chicken? Tia began and deliberately turned the ordering of a simple salad into a major event. She caught Anita's smirk out of the corner of her eye and considered it a job well done. It's interesting you talking about the fates, Anita said. Was I? Tia slipped off her glasses, put them carefully in their case. I thought it was Amazons, though of course they weren't gods or Greek. Still, they were a fascinating female culture, and I've always. The fates. Anita managed to polish off her first martini through clenched teeth. Oh yes, female power again. Women, sisters who determine the length and quality of life for gods and for men. With your interest and your family background, you'd have heard of the statues. I've heard of a lot of statues. Oh, Tia exclaimed innocently and swore she could hear Anita's teeth grinding. The three fates, yes, of course. In fact, one of my ancestors was reputed to have owned one. I think it was Clotho, the first fate. But he died on the Lusitania, and by all accounts, had it with him. It's very sad if it's true. Lachesis and Atropis have nothing to measure and cut without Clotho to spin the thread. Then again, I know more about the myths than antiques. Do you think the statues exist? The other two, I mean. I suppose I'm romantic enough to hope they do. I thought someone with your knowledge and your connections might have some ideas. Gosh, Tia bit her lip. I hardly ever paid any attention to that sort of thing, which is what I told Malachi when we talked about it. He talked to you about the statues then. He was interested. Gingerly, Tia picked through the basket of warm bread and rolls. He collects mythological art, 
something he started doing on one of his business trips to Greece some years ago. He's in shipping. Is that so? A handsome, wealthy Irishman with an interest in your field, and you haven't called him? Oh, I couldn't. As if flustered, Tia stared down at the tablecloth and fiddled with the collar of her jacket. I wouldn't feel comfortable calling a man. I never know what to say, anyway. Besides, I think he was disappointed I couldn't give him any help with the fates, the statues, that is. I was very helpful with the myths, if I do say so myself. And with one of them at the bottom of the Atlantic, they'd never be complete, would they? No. I suppose if they were complete, that is, they'd be quite valuable. Quite. If Henry Wiley hadn't taken that trip at that time on that ship, who knows? But then again, that's fate. Maybe you could find one of them, if they still exist or ever did. You must have all kinds of sources. I do, and I happen to have an interested client. I always hate to disappoint a client, so I'm doing what I can to verify their existence and to track them down. Anita nibbled delicately on a roll as she watched Tia. I hope you won't mention that to... Was it Malachy? If he calls you again. I wouldn't like him to scoop me on this. I won't, but I don't think it'll be an issue. Tia put a lot of wind into her sigh. I did tell him I'd heard, oh, some time ago, that someone in Athens claimed to have Atropus. That's the third fate. With her heart pounding at her own improvisation, Tia carefully studied her salad for flaws. In Athens? Yeah, I think someone spoke about it last fall. Or maybe it was last spring. I can't quite remember. I was doing some research on the muses. Those are the nine daughters of Zeus and Mnemosyne. They each have their own specialty, such as Clio, who... What about the fates? Anita demanded. What about the what? Oh. Tia laughed a little and sipped her water. Sorry, I suppose I tend to run off on tangents. It's so irritating to people. Not at all. Anita imagined herself just leaning over and choking the boring twit to death over her salad. But you were saying? Uh, yes, it must have been in the spring of last year. Face intent, she dribbled a stingy amount of dressing on her salad. I really wasn't looking for information on the fates, certainly not on the art pieces. I only paid attention to be polite. This source I contacted, what was his name? Well, it doesn't matter, as he wasn't nearly as much help as I'd hoped. With the muses, that is. But during the conversation, he mentioned that he'd heard this person in Athens had Atropus. The statue, not the mythological figure. I don't suppose you remember the name of the person in Athens? Oh, my, I'm not good with names. With an apologetic glance at Anita, Tia forked up salad. In fact, I don't think it came up at all, as it was just something mentioned in passing, and it was so long ago. I remember it was Athens, only because I've always wanted to go there. Plus, it seemed logical that one of the statues would be there, in Greece. Have you ever been? No. Anita shrugged. Not yet. Neither have I. I don't think the food would agree with me. Did you mention this to Malachy? About... Athens? No, I don't think I did. It didn't occur to me. Oh, my. Do you suppose I should have? Maybe if I'd thought of it, he'd have called me again. He really was terribly handsome. Idiot, Anita thought. Imbecile. Anything's possible. Tia felt giddy. The way she imagined a woman might feel after committing adultery in a sleazy motel with a younger, unemployed artist while her stuffy, dependable husband presided over a board meeting. But no, she decided, as she quick-footed it into her apartment building, that sort of giddiness would come before the actual adultery, on the way to the sleazy rent-by-the-hour motel. After, you'd feel guilty and ashamed and in need of a long shower. Or so she imagined. Still, she'd lied, deceived and figuratively screwed someone, and she didn't feel guilty in the least. She felt powerful, and she liked it. Anita detested her. Did people think she couldn't tell when they found her boring and annoying and basically stupid? Well, it didn't matter, she assured herself as she rode on a cloud of triumph to her floor.
It didn't matter in the least what a woman like Anita thought of her, because she, Tia Marsh, had won the round. She sailed into the apartment, prepared to crow, and found only Cleo sprawled on the sofa watching MTV. Hey, how'd it go? It went well. Where is everyone? They went to call their mother. Irish guys have a real thing for their mothers, don't they? Then they're going to pick up some stuff, ice cream. They just took off a couple minutes ago. Cleo glanced at the television screen before switching it off. So, what went down with Anita? Cleo questioned. She thinks I'm a brainless neurotic who's grateful for any scrap of attention a real person tosses my way. Cleo rolled off the couch, a fluid grace Tia admired hopelessly. I don't. Not that it matters, but I think you're a smart, classy ass-kicker who just hasn't tried out her boots yet. Want a drink? The description had Tia gaping, so that she didn't register being invited to drink in her own apartment. Maybe. I don't really drink. I do, and this seems like the time for it. We'll chug down a glass of wine, and you can fill me in. Cleo opened a bottle of Puy Fumé, poured two glasses, and listened. Somewhere during that first glass, Tia realized the only person who listened to her with the same focused interest was Carrie. Maybe she thought that's why they were friends. You sent her to Athens. Cleo let out a hoot of laughter. That's fucking brilliant. It just seemed, I guess it was. Damn right. Cleo shot up a hand, so fast and close, Tia's head jerked back as if to avoid a slap. High five. Oh, well. With a giggle, Tia slapped palms. You're going to have to go through all this again with the boys. Cleo continued. So since we've got this girl moment before they get back, give me the dish on Malachi. The dish? Yeah. I know you're pissed at him, and personally, if I were you, I'd want to boil his balls for breakfast, but he's quite gorgeous. How are you going to play him? I'm not. I wouldn't know how, so I'm not. This is business. He's got a good case of the guilts over you. You could use that. Cleo dipped a finger into her wine, licked it off. But it's not just guilt. He's got the hots for you, too. Guilty hots. That gives you some major power. He's not attracted to me that way. It's just pretense, so I'll help. You're wrong. Listen to you. There's one thing I know. Men. I know how they look at a woman, how they move around a woman, and what's going on in their sex-obsessed brains when they do. That guy wants to slurp you up like soda pop, and since he's guilty for fucking with you, that makes him edgy, frustrated, and stupid. You could have him sitting up and begging like a Labrador. You play your cards right. I don't have any cards, Tia began, and I don't want to humiliate him. Then she thought of how she'd felt when she'd realized he'd lied to her, used her. She took another sip of her wine. Well, maybe I do, a little. But I don't think it's relevant. Men don't have the same urges about me as they do for women like you. She stopped, appalled, and set down her glass. She should not drink. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I meant that as a compliment. Relax. I got it. You've got more going on than you think. Brains, goofiness, repression. None of those sound very sexy. They're working just fine on Big Brother. Then you've got that dreamy wood nymph look going for you. Wood nymph? Me? Honey, you ought to look in the mirror more often. You're really hot. No, I'm really very comfortable. She trailed off when Cleo collapsed in wild laughter. Oh, hot! Laughing herself now, she peered closely at Cleo's face. Are you drunk? Nope, but I might work on that later. She leaned back. She didn't make friends easily, at least not with other women. But there was something about Tia. I always wanted to look like you, Tia blurted out. Me? Tall and sultry and exotic. And built. We all work with what we got. And what you've got is making Big Brother's glands go loop-de-loop. -loop. Take my word. Listen. Cleo leaned closer. When they get back, I'm going to drop a little bombshell. Slick's not going to like it, and Big Brother's already looking at me sideways. I could use some help. Support, a uh, distraction, whatever you got. What is it? Cleo started to speak, then heard the key in the lock. Tia saw something move over her face that might have been grief, might have been regret. 
Then she tossed back the last of her wine. Countdown, she mumbled. Athens! Gideon broke into a delighted, almost demented grin. Athens! He repeated and plucked Tia out of her chair, kissed her enthusiastically on the mouth. You're a bloody genius! I, uh, well... Her ears buzzed. Thanks. A bloody genius, he said again, and swung her in a quick circle before he shot that grin at his brother. And you were worried Anita would gobble her down like lunch. We've a certified mastermind here. Set her down, Gideon, before you bruise her. That was clever, Malachi said to Tia. Clever and quick. It was logical, she corrected, and with her head spinning just a bit, and rather pleasantly, sat again. I don't know if she'll actually go to Greece, but she'll certainly look there. It gives us some breathing space, Malachi agreed. Now what do we do with it? Rebecca's doing what she does to get background information on this Jack Burdett. We'll leave that and him to her for now. Seems the first thing, logically speaking, is to figure out how Cleo's to get the White Smith fate. We'll want to do that quietly, without putting an eat on the scent. Then get it into a safe, secure place. That's not a problem. Cleo didn't take a deep breath, but she did brace herself, did shift her gaze until she met Gideon's directly. I've already got it, and it's already in one. Sixteen. You had it all along. Shell-shocked, and with temper just starting to bubble beneath, Gideon stared at Cleo. From the beginning. My grandmother gave it to me when I was a kid. She felt the bats beating wings in her stomach. She started to get pretty spacey, so I guess she didn't think of it as more than a kind of doll. It's been like my good luck piece. It went where I went. You had it in Prague. Yeah, I had it. Because the steady, quiet tone of his voice made her feel a little sick, she poured another glass of wine. I never heard the story, the Three Fates deal. If that part of it ever came down through my mother's family, it didn't get as far as me. I didn't know what it was until you told me about it. And wasn't it lucky for you I came along and educated you? She decided the bitter edge of the words, delivered with just the perfect dip of contempt, was as effective as a jab in the gut. Looks slick. Some guy chases me down at work, starts asking about my good luck charm, gives me the song and dance about big money and Greek legends. I'm not handing it over to him on a platter. I didn't know you. Got to know me, didn't you? He leaned over, clamping his hands on the arms of her chair, caging her in with his body. Or do you make a habit of rolling around on a hotel floor with strangers? Get in. This isn't for you. He whipped his head around. Flick the keen edge of his fury over his brother to silence any interference, then snapped it back to Cleo. You knew me well enough for that. You knew me well enough, didn't you, when we shared the bed Mikey gave us hours before he died? That's enough. Though her hands were ice cold with fear, Tia used them to pull on Gideon's arm. It was, she realized, like trying to pry open a steel wall with her fingers. He was her friend. She loved him. However angry you are, you know that, and you know you haven't the right to use him to hurt her. She used him, and me. You're right. Cleo lifted her chin, not in defiance, but in a kind of invitation. Punch me, she seemed to say. I'd prefer it. You couldn't be more right. I overestimated myself, underestimated Anita, and Mikey's dead. However much disgust and rage you've got working in you for me right now, it doesn't touch what I've got for myself. It might come closer than you think. He shoved himself away from her. Okay. Something inside her broke. Something she hadn't realized was there to be damaged. Okay, I screwed up with you. I figured I'd cut a deal with Anita, take the money, and hand you your share. Everybody's happy. I, I figured, well, he'll be a little pissed I did it behind his back, but when he's got all that green in his hands, how can he complain? When he turned back... Violence shimmering almost visibly around him, Tia stepped between them. Stop, think. What she did made sense. If she'd been dealing with a normal businesswoman, even a dishonest one, it made sense. None of us could have predicted how far Anita would go. What she did was lie. He ignored Tia's tugging hand. To all of us. It started with lies. 
Tia's voice had just enough punch behind it to have Gideon glancing at her. Trust and full disclosure's been the main problem here all along. We're all splintered in different directions, with different goals, different agendas. And as long as we stay that way, Anita has the advantage. She has one direction and one goal. Unless we agree on ours, she's going to win. That's right. Malachi laid a hand on Tia's shoulder, and though she stiffened, she didn't pull away. I'm no more pleased about how we got to this point than any of the rest of us. We all, well, all but Tia here, have reasons for regrets. We can stew about them. Or we can punch a few walls, Gid. His voice gentled, and he waited until his brother turned those angry eyes on him. Remember the punching bag Das set up at the boatyard? We called it Nigel, he said to the women. And we beat hell out of it instead of each other, most of the time. We're not boys now. We're not, no. So instead of sulking off or finding a handy Nigel, why don't we start from here? The good news is we have the second fate. And where might this bank be, Cleo? Over on 7th. She dug into her jeans pocket for the key she'd put there that morning. I have to get it. I have to sign and show ID to get into the box. I can do it in the morning. We'll do it in the morning, Gideon corrected. Right now I want some air. I'm going up to the roof. Cleo sat where she was when the door slammed behind him. Then, as the shards of what had broken inside her stabbed, she got to her feet. That went really well. Appalled that her voice broke, she bore down. I'm going to take a nap. When the office door shut behind her, Tia pushed her hands through her hair. Oh, boy, I never know what to do. I never know what to say. You did and said exactly right. Stop shoving yourself down, Tia. It's irritating. Well, pardon me. I'm going to go see if I can help Cleo. No, that's the easy way. With a small sigh, he touched her shoulder again. I'll go talk to Cleo. You try Gideon. Let's see if we can make this mess we've created into some sort of unit. He started for the office door, then turned. You were brilliant with Anita, he said then knocked briskly and opened the door without waiting for an invitation. Cleo lay on her back, on the unmade pull-out. She wasn't crying, but she knew she was working up to a good explosive jag. Look, I've had enough of the Sullivan brothers for this act. Let's consider this intermission. That's too bad, because the show's not over. He lifted her feet, sat, then dropped them into his lap. And because this Sullivan brother is willing to admit he might have done exactly as you did... I wouldn't be proud of it, would look back from here and see all the places where I went wrong, when I should have turned right instead of left. But that wouldn't change a fucking thing, would it? Are you being nice to me so I'll cooperate? Go, team, go. That'd be a nice benefit, but the fact is, you've had a hell of a time. And I'm part of the reason why. Gideon now, he's not as devious natured as you and me. Not that he's a doormat or a fool, but he's more inclined to say what he thinks and is often annoyed everyone doesn't do the same. He has a refined sense of fair play, our boy. Knowing it, hearing Malachi say it, didn't go far toward mollifying her. People who play fair mostly lose. Don't they just? He laughed a little and began to rub her feet in a friendly way. But when they win, they win clean. That matters to him. You matter to him. Maybe did matter. Matter still, darling. I know my brother, so I know that. But not knowing you so well, I have to ask, does he matter to you? She tried to tug her foot out of his hand, but he held it firmly, kept on rubbing. I wasn't trying to screw him out of the money. That wasn't my question, does he matter to you? Yeah, I guess he does. Then I'll give you a piece of advice. Fight back. Use shouts and oaths until you've burnt him out temper-wise. Or use tears and drown it. Either works with him. She shoved a second pillow under her head. That's going back to devious, isn't it? Well, he patted her foot. Do you want to win or lose? The crying jag had backed off, enough for her to sit up, sniffle once, and study him. I wasn't sure I'd like you. It's handy, all things considered, that I do. That's mutual. So tell me, as it's the subject that's been preying on my mind... Do most of the women who work as strippers have the body God gave them, or what medical science can provide? Tia wasn't having as much luck with Gideon. 
For a time, she just sat quietly in one of the little iron chairs in the roof garden. She rarely came up here as she didn't trust the air or the height, which was a pity, she thought, as she so loved the view of the river. As she was a woman accustomed to being ignored, she sat while Gideon stood at the stone rail, smoking and brooding in silence. We spent days and nights together running all over goddamn Europe, and she had it in that fucking purse of hers all along. Okay, Tia mused. He speaks. That was a start. It belongs to her, Gideon. That's not the point. He spun around, ridiculously handsome, Tia thought, wrapped in his fury. Did she think I'd cosh her on the head and steal it from her? Sneak out with it in the night after making love with her and leave her in some ugly room alone? I can't answer that. I wouldn't have had the nerve to go with you in the first place or the presence of mind to protect myself, which is what she did. I... This is going to sound sexist, but it's different for a man to go running around Europe with a woman than it is for that woman to go running around with a man. It's riskier and it's scarier. It just is. I won't argue that, but we weren't together a week when things changed between us. Sex is, in some ways, another scary risk. She felt heat string her cheeks as he frowned at her now. If it had been a matter of using you, which is what you're thinking, she'd have been the one to sneak out with Lachesis in the night. Instead, she brought you here. Then when, behind my back and... Made a mistake, Tia finished. One that cost her more than it cost you. You and I know what shape she was in when you brought her here. We're the only ones who know that. And maybe I'm the only one who could see how you were with her. How gentle and kind. How loving. He made a short, rude sound and crushed the cigarette under his heel. She was drunk and sick because I made her that way. What was I supposed to do? Shove her about? You took care of her. And when I heard her wake up crying in the middle of the night, you took care of her again. She was probably too tangled up in her own grief to know that. I've never been in love, she said, taking a few cautious steps toward him and the wall and the drop. So I could be wrong thinking that you're in love with her. But I know what it is to have feelings for someone stirred up, then be hurt by them. Mal's sick over that, Tia. He took her hand not realizing her instinctive resistance was for the height and not for the gesture. I promise you, this isn't about that. I'm just saying that when you're not so mad or so hurt, you should try to look at it from her side, or if you can't, at least resolve yourself enough so we can work together. We'll work together, he promised. I'll deal with the rest of it. Good. Good. Why was it people nervous about heights couldn't resist looking down from tall buildings? She wondered. Compelled, she stared down at the street until her head spun. She managed a shaky step back, then another. Phew! Vertigo! Steady now! He took her arm when she swayed. You're fine. I guess I will be. More or less. Cleo didn't have a chance to try out Malachy's advice. It was hard to fight, words or tears, with someone who avoided you as if you carried the plague. It was hard to have a showdown with a man who'd rather spend the night sleeping on the roof of an apartment building in New York than share a corner of the bed with you. It hurt in parts of her she hadn't known she had to hurt. And was worse because she was afraid she deserved it. Go there, get it, come back, Malachy repeated, as a gritty-eyed Gideon gulped down a second cup of morning coffee. So you've said already. Best not to take a straight route either way. The bank's near enough. The other flat, Malachy decided, with a glance at Cleo. She might have people watching that general area yet. We've kept these guys off our asses all over Europe. Gideon set his empty cup on the counter, then, at Tia's meaningful clearing of the throat, picked it up again and rinsed it out in the sink. We can handle this. Just watch your back and the rest of you as well. Gideon nodded. Ready, he asked Cleo. Sure. Tia linked her fingers together, barely resisting wringing them when Gideon and Cleo walked out her door. You don't need to worry about them, she said as much to herself as Malachy. No, they can handle themselves all right. But he stuck his hands in his pockets and wished, passionately, he hadn't given up smoking. It'll be good to see it, have a good look at it, be sure it's authentic. Yes, 
Meanwhile, I have a lot of work to catch up on. This is the first time we've been alone, really. There are things I'd like to say. You've said them. Not all of them. Not things I thought of after you'd given me the boot. They're not applicable now. I haven't been able to work on my book for days. I'm behind schedule. You can watch television, listen to the radio, read a book, or go up and jump off the roof. It's all the same to me. I appreciate the ability to hold a grudge. He moved smoothly into her path as she started toward her office. I've told you I'm sorry. I've told you I was wrong, and that hasn't budged you a bit. So why not listen to the rest of it? Let's see. Could it be that I'm not interested? Yes, that could be it. She enjoyed hearing the sarcasm in her own voice. It made her feel in charge. The personal portion of this relationship is over. I disagree with that. He took a step toward her. She took one back, and the retreat, however slight, made her feel vulnerable all over again. You want to argue about it? She shrugged, trying to put a little Cleo into it. I'm not very good at arguing, but in the interest of putting this aside once and for all, I'll do my best. You treated me like a fool, and worse than that, you made sure I believed you found me attractive, even desirable, and that Malachi is contemptible. It would be right enough if it were true. The fact is, I did find you attractive and desirable, and that was a major dilemma for me. He watched irritation cross her face, irritation he knew was rooted in disbelief, so he ignored it. And so I made my first of several mistakes. Do you know what started me on that series of mistakes where you're concerned? No, and I don't care. I'm getting a headache. You're not. You're hoping you get a headache, so you'll have something else to think about. It was your voice. I beg your pardon. Your voice. When I was sitting in that auditorium, and your voice was so pretty, just a little nervous around the edges at first, then it got stronger. Such a nice, flowing voice. I admit I was bored witless about what you were saying, but I liked hearing you say it nonetheless. I don't see what that. And there were your legs. He wasn't stopping now. Not when he could see the nerves tangling up with her temper. I passed the time listening to your voice and admiring your legs. That's ridiculous. Ah, he considered. Now she was flustered, and flustered was better than irritated, better than nervous, because a flustered Tia wouldn't be able to stop him from saying things he so much needed to say. But that wasn't the main thing. I liked how shy and tired and confused you seemed when I came up to you with my book. Oh, so polite you were. He stepped toward her again, and this time she eased herself around so the couch was between them. You weren't thinking I was tired. You were thinking how you'd pump me about the fates. He nodded. True enough, I was focused on the fates, but I had room for both in my head. Then when I lured you away from the hotel and into a walk, I liked seeing how dazzled you were when you started to look around, when you really saw where you were. You like thinking I was dazzled by you. I did. I admit it. It was flattering, but still, that wasn't the moment things started to shift around. So I'd finish off the first of the mistakes. He moved to the end of the couch, and she backed into the coffee table, flushed, then nearly skipped backward to the far end. It was when we got back to your room, my trashed room. Yes. He caught a whiff of her scent. That lingered in the air where she'd been standing, so soft, so quiet. I was angry over that and furious with myself as well, knowing I'd had a part in bringing that on you. There you were, all frazzled and upset, digging for some pill or other, and that thing you suck on like a lolly. An inhaler is a medical whatever. He was smiling now, pacing her around the sofa. Do you know what did it for me, Tia? Which just slipped right through my defenses and had me starting to moon over you. She snorted, "Moon, my butt." It was when I looked in the bathroom, that wonderful finished bath, and I saw all those bottles and packages, energy this, stress relief that, special soap, and God knows. Of course, you were attracted to my allergies and phobias. I've always found them ruthless sexual tools. He found the prim, damn near prissy tone like music. 
I was fascinated that a woman who believed she needed all that to get through the day would have taken herself off alone on such a journey. What a brave soul you are, darling, under it all. I am not. Will you stop stalking me? My plan had been to see if I could get some solid information from you, in hopes you'd lead me to the other statues. Very simple and no harm done. But there was harm, because I couldn't stop thinking about you. There was a tickle at the back of her throat, a pressure settling on her chest. I don't want to discuss this any more. I kept seeing you sitting there, with all your things jumbled around you, and how you talked so calmly to the police, even though you were pale and shaken. Now there was heat, or outrage. You left me there, left me, until you thought I might be of use again. You're right. But it wasn't just the fates I thought of when I came to New York. It wasn't only them I wanted. Do you remember how I kissed you outside your door? Do you remember how that was? Stop it. I made you go inside alone and close the door between us myself. If you hadn't mattered, I'd have come inside. I knew you'd let me, but I couldn't, couldn't touch you that way while I was lying to you. You'd have come in, and you'd have taken me to bed if you could have stomached making love to someone like me. He stopped in his tracks, like a man who'd come up sharp against a thick glass wall. What the hell does that mean? Someone like you. It pisses me off to hear you say that. He moved fast, nearly had her by the arm before she scampered back and away. And I'm damned if I'll have you believe it. I wanted you that night too much for my own good or yours. And I've had the taste of you inside me ever since. The way I see it now, there's only one way to solve all this. I'm having you. Having me what? When he stopped his forward motion, laughed like a loon, it clicked. The blood rushed to her face, then fell away again. You can't just say something like that. You can't just assume. I'm not assuming, and I'm not just saying. I've been trying to say since I got here, and I'm giving up on words. I want my hands on you. Stop gulping air before you need that sucking thing. I'm not gulping air. But she was, even as she raced around to the back of the couch again. And I'm not going to bed with you. It doesn't have to be the bed, though I think you'd enjoy it more if it was. He fainted left, dodged right, and grabbed for her arm. He deliberately shortened his reach to let her escape as he was enjoying himself. Her color was back now, prettily pink in her cheeks. You're not very good at this, he commented when she nearly tripped over her own feet. I'll wager you haven't had many men chase you around your sofa. As I don't date twelve-year-olds, no, I haven't. If she'd hoped to insult him, his chuckle told her she'd missed the mark. I want you to stop it right now. She shot a look toward her office, measuring the distance. Go ahead and try for it. In the interest of fair play, I'll give you a head start. I want to kiss the back of your neck. Just run my lips over that elegant curve. He dived for her. With a squeal, she pinwheeled her arms and, overbalancing, flipped onto the couch. More out of luck than design, she kept rolling so he landed flat on the cushions when she hit the floor, but first. With a nervous giggle that surprised her more than him, she leaped up and made a dash for her office. He caught her a step outside the door, spun her around, and pressed her back hard against the wall. Words rushed into her throat— babbling words that stuck there as she stared into his hot and glittering eyes. This is how unattractive, how undesirable I find you. He crushed her mouth with his, ravaged it, without any of the warm and stirring tenderness he'd shown her before. His body pressed unrelentingly against hers so that the pounding of his heart seemed to ram inside her. She brought her hands up with some idea of with no idea at all. And they fell limply to her sides again. He lifted his head, an inch only so his face blurred in her vision. Are we clear on that now? he demanded. When she could do no more than shake her head, he captured her mouth again. It was like being shot out of a cannon, or torn out of a roller coaster in mid-dive. At least... She imagined both those events would whip a rush of color and sound into the brain and bounce the pulse rate screaming high. 
turn the limbs to water, and cause the system to be trapped somewhere between iced terror and molten exhilaration. Her ears began to ring, reminding her she was holding her breath. But when she let it out, it sounded like a moan. That helpless response had him chewing restlessly on her bottom lip before he ended the kiss. How about now? I... I forgot the question. Then I'll rephrase it. He swept her into his arms. Really, she could think of no other way to describe how he plucked her off her feet. Oh, God! Was the best she could manage when he carried her into the bedroom, kicked the door shut behind them. Hold that thought. You know, of course, I'm only doing this so you won't be angry anymore. Oh! He laid her on the bed. Okay. I've no personal interest whatsoever in getting you naked and sinking my teeth into you. He straddled her, watching her face as he unbuttoned her blouse. But sometimes a man has to make sacrifices for the greater good. He skimmed his thumbs, whisper light, over the swell of her breasts, and she began to tremble. Wouldn't you agree? I, yes, no, I don't know what I'm doing here. I've lost my mind. I was hoping you would. Tia, he eased her up so he could slip the blouse away. You're such a pretty little thing. I'm not wearing the right underwear. He'd distracted himself by running a fingertip up and down her torso. Her skin, he thought, was like warm rose petals. What's that? If I'd known we'd... I'm not wearing the right kind of underwear for this. Really? He studied the simple, serviceable white cotton bra. Well, then... We'd best get rid of it right away. I didn't mean... She gulped audibly when he slid his hand under her and undid the bra's catch with two fingers. You've done that before. I confess I have. I'm a cad. He bent down to rub his lips over hers as he tugged the bra aside. I'm going to take terrible advantage of you now. He used his thumbs again, running them over her nipples until heat balled in her belly. You should probably call for help. I don't think you need any. With that, he scooped her up into a fierce hug. Christ, you're one in a million. Kiss me back. He brushed his lips over hers. Kiss me back now. I need you. In all her life, no one had said those three words to her. The thrill of them spurted through her, flooded her heart, and gushed into the kiss. She threw her arms around him shifting her body so it pressed against his, with an abandon neither of them had expected. Rocked, he dug his fingers into her flesh, struggled for about two seconds to maintain some reasonable control. Then he tumbled her back and did just as he had threatened. He sank his teeth into her. She rose under him like a woman riding a wave, and with no thought but the taking, tugged at his shirt. I want... I want... So do I... He was breathless now, with muscles quivering. There was the taste of her skin, warm and sweet in his mouth, the feel of it silky smooth under his hands, and the surprising, delightful enthusiasm of her as she ran those small, nervous hands over him. She was so delicately built, and the curves of her so wonderfully subtle. Her scent was a quiet, very female drift that slowly hazed the senses until it seemed as though he could simply breathe her in. Eager to explore, he let his lips rush down her body, back up to those small and lovely breasts, back to her warm, willing mouth. When he did no more than press his hand against the heat, and she came with a quick, shocked cry, he felt like a god. He was murmuring something, or perhaps he was shouting it. There was such a roaring in her head she couldn't tell. Her system was barraged by a series of long, liquid pulls— of quick slapping jolts, with each sensation wrapping so hard into the next it wasn't possible to separate them. And her body absorbed them greedily, then called for more. And his, his was so firm and smooth and hot. Was it any wonder her hands were in such a rush to touch? When she did, she could feel the quiver of a muscle, the wild leap of a pulse. Need. It was need for her. Then she forgot his need for her own, when his fingers slid slickly over her, into her. She could do nothing more than fist her hands in the rumpled bedspread, 
holding on even as she flew. His mouth came back to hers, and she opened, opened everything, so that when he thrust inside her, he entered both heart and body. He said her name again. It seemed to echo endlessly in his head as he sank into her, into that wet heat. She rose to him, fell away, rose again, until the rhythm was like music. He lost himself in it, in her, as the beat became more urgent, and urgency became desperation, and desperation a brilliant pleasure that swallowed them both whole. Weak and wrecked, she lay under him. In some dim area of consciousness, she was aware of his weight, of the galloping race of his heart, even of the shallow breaths he took. But she was much more aware of the lovely limp stretch of her own body, of the hot river of her own blood that swam under her skin. A part of her mind continued to huddle in a corner and gape with shock and stingy disapproval. She'd made frantic, reckless love with a man she had no business trusting. And at nine o'clock in the morning, a Thursday morning, those same basic facts brought on a wave of smugness she knew she should be ashamed of. Stop thinking so hard, Malachi said lazily. You'll hurt yourself. I miss the nape of your neck. He turned his head so he could nibble a bit on her shoulder. I'll have to make up for that oversight when I can move again. She closed her eyes and ordered herself to listen to that scolding voice. It's nine in the morning. He turned his head, focused on her bedside clock. Actually, it's not. It's ten o six. It can't be. They left it just before nine. It was so nice to be able to run her fingers through his hair, through all that rich dark chestnut. I looked at the clock so I'd know when to start worrying if they weren't back. She tried to shift to see the clock for herself, but he stopped the movement with his mouth on hers. And when are you scheduled to start worrying? At ten. You're running behind then, darling. It takes a bit of time to make love if you put any effort into it. Ten? It's after ten? She wiggled, shoved, squirmed. They could be back any minute. So they could. Her movements were perfect. He decided. So what? They, we can't be in here like this. Doors closed and the bedrooms off limits, as I recall. They'll certainly know what we've been doing, and we shouldn't have. They will, I imagine. Oh, it's shocking. He snuck a hand up to stroke her breast. Don't tease me. I can't help it any more than I can help wanting you again. I like you out of bed, Tia, but I have to tell you. He bit her earlobe and made her shiver. I surely like you in it as well. I'm just going to take a few more minutes here and show you. We have to get up right now, she began, but his tongue slid down to her breasts. Well, well, I guess a few more minutes won't make any difference. Mm -hmm. 